the clerk please call roll. Present. Brown? Here. Yes. Here. Meyer? Watson? Mayor Brunner. Present. Thank you. Our first item of Today's afternoon agenda is a small business development center presentation. And I'd like to invite Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. Uh, hi, there you are. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome. There, um, good afternoon, um, Mayor and uh, members of the council. I'm Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Brandon Napoli, who is the head of uh, the Small Business. Development Center, um, and they have been a long -term partner. I will say we've actually had a contract with Small Business Development Center at Rio College since 2008. So we're in our 14th year of partnering um, with SD. And um, I'll just say the great work of SD for our business community, for business starting up in Santa Cruz, really can't be understood. From over uh, our contract at DC has a minimum. 500 hours of service to assisting businesses. That's the minimum. I will say on average, and you'll see that in Brandon's presentation today, they average well over 5,000 service hours. So it is very leveraged funding. It's a great partnership um, from businesses and developing business plans and evaluating whether their business can succeed and helping them take that next step, even help them apply for loans. During the pandemic, um, uh, help was critical um, for businesses being able to stay alive and survive and grow um, over the last year. So um, I could go on and on, but I won't because Brandon has a great presentation. So I will now, uh, with great pleasure, turn it over to Brandon now. Well, thank you, Bonnie, for that um, wonderful presentation. I wonder if that cuts into my 10 minutes or I get to start now. But uh, regardless, I'm, I'm very Grateful to be here, Mayor, Council members. Thank you for your time. I know it's precious. I'd like to, to share my screen um, and jump into the presentation really quickly. As Bonnie mentioned, we do, um, I think, really incredible work. We have an amazing small business community uh, here in, in Santa Cruz. Um, and we've been around for over about 37 years. So um, we're definitely people. We're not. Um, uh, you know, not a needle on a haystack in Santa Cruz County. And that's um, how we want to continue to operate. So we, we are hosted by Rio College that provides a wonderful back off support, what we do. And just to get into you know, what we do for those that are not as familiar, uh, the Small Business Development Center is focused on uh, bringing in experts in different aspects of small business, uh, from Main Street, Tech Street, and agriculture, uh, to focus on um, advising and training of small business. Our services are free. Uh, our, our training sometimes comes with a nominal fee, five, $5 will show up, but overall service to business owners, whether they're looking to start a business, uh, grow a business, or even you know, move out of business and give it to someone else. We focus on several different metrics. All our metrics are captured by uh, the reporting that we do um, that the business owners have to and say, hey, you helped us actually do this. And then we're audited internally to make sure that our notes um, in our system match up with that support. So we're very heavily uh, regulated to make sure that numbers that I present are in fact, verified by the business owners as well as um, who we report to on a, on a lead center of overall in the region to make sure we do help start the same businesses, increase their sales, their jobs, their access to capital as well. So getting into the overall mission of the SBDC and why I'm uh, so excited to be a part of Santa Cruz. I grew up in San Luis Obispo, go back to me, went to San Diego for school, uh, Peace Corps in Guatemala, always served 
um, underserved business owners overseas and also in Los Angeles, New York, and then finally had an opportunity to make my way back to the Central Coast and just take a skill set with the passion and understanding of who our neighbors are to really try to help and create an ecosystem here. So uh, the small businesses need a lot of support. Um, that comes with encouraging that we have the capital access they need, the coaching and training we provide, connection to other resources, um, a culture overall that encourages people to take risks and get into business, stay in business, and overall a positive pro, uh, small business climate uh, in the county and in the city. So the services, we, the trainings that we offer in particular, this is anything from e-commerce to changing the way things used to be, the way that things are moving, new up and coming ways of social media. We were just actually awarded uh, the iHub grant by the state of California. We're the only SBDC in Northern California uh, awarded this. Um, there are only 10 of them given out statewide to any organization. We were one of them to create an e-commerce uh, incubator. We call it Clicks the Bricks. There's several businesses in the city of Santa Cruz that we're working with uh, to move them into this e-commerce um, marketplace. We also do advising. We help people love uh, HR. It's um, a real heavy lift, even for myself, but it's possible in some marketing strategy and, and financial planning. Overall, these different ways that we meet businesses where they are with the needs that they have. I mentioned relationships. We connect businesses to banks. We help to advocate for them, help to understand what their numbers really mean to the banker and cut down the, the cost or the unnecessary declines that happen, as well as if there's any saving on software programs that we can get by being a part of the network, we provide those to the business owners as well. So getting into the actual economic impact of Santa Cruz, uh, this is overall in 2021 what we were able to collect, and I want to get into the success story here, but again, this is reported back to business owners, 248 jobs that were created, uh, 14 businesses as well created, 18 million in new capital secured, that's uh, debt and equity, 30 million additional uh, sales that were generated. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, we go above on the amount of hours that we spend with these business owners. We love what we do and we feel like there's a, a, a huge ROI and not just with the numbers here, but also what's behind the number. Um, we throw a lot of events as well. I'm gonna get into the Santa Cruz County Small Business Summit event that we're having in downtown Santa Cruz April 29th, uh, right after this. Overall, one of our clients, Ocean Table, that we were able to work with. If anyone's best picture, Coda, um, in a way, this what this story means to me. All those gentlemen are fully able. They don't have to uh, sign language to get by. We have a, a, an amazing story that we're able to, tell, to be able to tell. And that Ian and Charlie wanted to, to change the way that the fishing industry worked for them and the economics. And so they wanted to go direct to consumer. And so they came to us with needing a business plan, needing to get a loan, uh, needing to figure out how to actually connect their consumer to this new model. That's what we were able to do with them, really help them overall stay, stay in business and create uh, additional jobs. So we love to tell these stories. If you ever get an opportunity to come to my office at Rio, keep walking to your loss and take a left, and that's where I'm at right next to HR. But anyways, if you get inside the building, you can see that we have uh, no shortage of these types of success stories that we'd love to tell encourage more people to get in the business uh, in the city and to, and to stay in the business, do it uh, in a smart way. So to break down uh, the number, and I can provide this to the council afterwards, but we want to break it down. Overall, we were able to fund 100, over 100 businesses this last year, help them with the assistance. Uh, a big portion of that were the one-off programs the SBA was dealing with their idle uh, and the PPP. Um, I believe our, our efforts here were so we're unfortunately still dealing with businesses that did not apply first time and dealing with uh, sadly someone in the federal government that's just not getting the fact that they need to change something in their application. We're talking about months, months, months later. So we try to get in front of that process and make sure that it's committed correctly the first time. We also have very strong relationships with local banks as well and credit unions and with PDFI here locally, Cal Postal. I sit on their loan, loan board. Overall, we want to make sure that businesses are getting the money they, they deserve and they need. At the same time, we make sure that it's not always a money problem that people really focus on, but sometimes it's an idea problem. We need to be able to separate the two and figure out how they connect with each other. 
uh, overall or demographic, we're practically um, close to half and half male to women. There's a there's a, a portion that uh, choose not to respond to our surveys. It is um, their choice whether they want to state uh, on the demographic side. Uh, the majority are white Asian, but there's a huge percent that did choose not to respond there as well. You can see down the, the breakup of our business type, the majority of service uh, um, establishment, uh, followed by accommodation and, and retail. So the, the slide I want to end with this moving forward, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we are relaunching what was uh, pre-pandemic called the 80 percent Micro Business Summit. Some of you might have attended. It was at Rio College campus. Uh, we are relaunching that as a Santa Cruz County Small Business Summit. It will be downtown, starting at the MA, April 29th at 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We'll be utilizing a couple different businesses because we don't have a large conference center in downtown. So we're getting, uh, so I call it creative. We're actually going to have maybe a session in an art gallery, another session at a retail shop, another session uh, at one of the restaurants. But we're, we're going to make it work. Super excited and partnering with Event Santa Cruz to make this happen. Um, and overall, we want to encourage people to get out of what I call the pandemic paralysis, back in, engaged, moving forward in commerce, in downtown, um, just getting that energy going again and realizing why Santa Cruz City is such a destination. Thank you again for your time and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Brandon, for that information. Uh, you said you would send us a copy of that, those slides. Yeah, and I could, yes, I could do that. Uh, yes. I have one more question on April 29th, Small Business Summit at the Museum of Art and History. Um, is that eight, eight, eight to five or nine to four? So we, we're having it at nine to four right now as the program side, uh, an hour earlier. Doors open for registration. An hour later, stand around and you know need to mingle. But uh, nine to four is where the program is. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Council Member Myers. Yeah, uh, Brandon, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation and also just for the work that does. Um, you are a mighty force in this town. I've known countless people who serve. Provides to them. So, um, you're exactly right in that small businesses have who we are. And so I just really appreciate the amount of work you've done and the value that you've done. So, especially thank you. Meet you and see you again. At Thanks again. Council member coming. Just wanted to say <clears throat> thanks for that presentation. Um, no number of people who are trying to start small businesses use some help and guidance. And so being able to, to send them your way, I think will be really helpful. I just had a quick question about the Small Business Summit. I'm just wondering um, if people want to know more about that, should we send them to the website? And then the other question is, um, are there any kind of like costs for registration and, and and what's the business summit going to really be targeting? Like the information on loans, is it networking? Like what, what can people expect? Yeah, so the, the latest information is going to be on the website, the small business uh, summit .org. Um, So that, that would have the latest. We're starting to populate the speakers and we'll start to populate the agenda. We're going to finalize that this Wednesday. Um, you know, uh, overall, um, we're going to have a pretty breadth of information. Um, Krista Schilling from the EO and County Bank is going to be the keynote speaker in the morning. Uh, we're going to have like a, a lenders panel. So yes, finance. We'll have um, someone from a, a bank, credit union, the EDFI, and a local angel investor all in one panel. And there will be a round. Uh, we're talking about strategies to start start business, especially in this, I like to call it post-pandemic, but whatever it's going to be termed. Um, so we get into strategy and marketing aspect. Uh, we're bringing in a new financial advisor for the <laughs> restaurant. 
like Michelin star level uh, um, restaurant um, executive chefs or, or have someone talk about the restaurants in particular that have been really hard hit. What that model looks like moving forward is some people just don't come in the restaurants like they used to. Um, there will be a portion of the tech communicated as well. I think, you know, everything involves around tech these days. But, um, yeah, that, it's going to be pretty broad. We're going to have over 20 speakers. I mean, is there a cost? Oh, on? thank you. Yeah. So right now, early bird is twenty five dollars. We purposely reduced it pre pandemic. We were looking at more like seventy five eighty. Um, we just want people to show up, right? We have limited speed, uh, spot. We're trying to get at least like one hundred and fifty. We're about uh, halfway there right now, so I feel pretty good that we're going to make that number. Um, so, uh, but up to two hundred people, and also. Any other? Okay. Thank you so much for joining us and, in, and for sharing that information from it as well. Thank you, Bonnie Lipscomb. Uh, so I think we're ready for our next presentation. And that would be a presentation. Uh, we have our director of parks and recreation, Tony Elliott, who will be presenting a service award of excellence. Uh, no. Welcome, Tony. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Um, on behalf of the Parks and Rec, I'm excited to continue our celebration and acknowledgement. Uh, of Jane Mio, uh, with last uh, proclaimed Jane Mio Day uh, in the city, and we're excited to continue that celebration today. Um, I'd like to introduce somebody with the California Parks and Recreation Society, uh, our state trade organization uh, that has uh, acknowledged and awarded Jane this award. I'm not sure if we have anybody from CRS on the call uh, at the moment. So if not, I'm not seeing anybody pop up here. So let me um, just give a little bit of background on this board, and I would actually welcome um, our park superintendent, Travis Beck, the work that uh, Jane has been doing with the parks team uh, in particular. But just a little bit of background. Um, again, this award is from our uh, agency, California Parks and Recreation Society. It's a professional and service award called Champion of the Community. Um, and the Champion of the Community Awards uh, or Award honors and recognizes individuals or organizations who have contributed significant effort, influence, and improve the quality of their parks and recreation. This statewide award recognizes the contributions of those who volunteer and provide support and services in their community that furthers the mission and quality delivery of parks and recreation services programs and facilities in the community. And I think that um, really covers the work that Jane has done, um, certainly over the last year and more with the estuary project, with the Benchlands Environmental Search and the FEST. Um, we can go on and, and on, but I'll, um, I'll send it over to Parks and to Travis Beck. Here. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. Of course, good afternoon, Jane. Um, when we learned of this, award. Uh, Jane Mio really sprang to mind as a champion of the community for her ability to engage people in stewardship of the environment. And she's done that for a number of years through the estuary project, uh, doing environmental restoration and planting, stewardship work along the lower portion of the San Lorenzo River. And through that, reaching out various volunteer groups in our community, including AmeriCorps, the downtown street team, uh, various school programs, such as the Earth Stewards Program for the Natural History. So she was a um, an obvious contender when we recognized she had uh, issues slash opportunities at the Benchlands this summer, and we reached out to Jane and she very graciously uh, volunteered to create an entirely new program down at the Benchlands which would engage residents of the camps there in environmental stewardship along the river. And that program has been really successful. The protection of the river banks, 
even the restoration of the riverbanks with native plantings that have been done. But perhaps more importantly than that, really positive engagement with uh, members of the stewardship team, as well as with the larger camp. And I think she's a well-known figure down there. Um, she's devoted every weekend since last summer and many days to uh, engaging campers in that area and making sure that everyone is taking care of the San Lorenzo River. So I just wanted to acknowledge, Jane, all of your work and thank you very much for stewarding the environment, uh, helping people of Santa Cruz and especially our houseless residents engage in that. Thank you very much. Mayor, uh, champion of the community uh, as far as awards. I think Jane may have those with her at, uh, at her home, but there is a, a one-of-a-kind mosaic plaque DRS uh, created and a, um, a number of items. Jane was also recognized at the California Parks and Recreation Society annual, uh, annual meeting um, and uh, will be um, yeah, recognized in video and uh, a number of other manners CRS throughout the year. So the celebration and acknowledgement of Jane goes far beyond Santa Cruz and across the state of California to recognize Jane's work. Jane, thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a special recognition. Very, very special. Uh, share that with you today, Jane. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yes. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much, Tony and Sabbath, for that wonderful recommendation to get this award, which I adore. I look so cute on that. So, <laughs> but I just wanted, yeah, I'm not going to take hours and listing the reasons why I'm so excited to get this honor um, of the championship. Uh, because this reward means a lot to me because it acknowledges the importance of the park and rec department that offers the community residents access to diverse array of services. And they are maintained by hardworking, caring staff who are always, always willing to work, you know, to work for a mile. And so the championship award actually embraced their incredible support from my urban San Lorenzo River endeavors. So my warm, warm, enthusiastic river crew staff thing to all of them. Also, receiving this reward, I'm feel I'm encircled by the best. And that's a group consistent of, you know, the houses and community members yes so for the last eight months 306 participants and 711 hours later we have outstanding results kept over 28 tons of trash out of the river as well as protecting Dylan <laughs> the riparian corridor from environment damage it has been an Incredible experience to work all, uh, in particular, my house, this, the housing challenge member, and witness how they have grown, seasoned, well trained environment, to see their engagement and create community bonds based on caring collaboration. So, my cheers goes to all of this, and I'm so proud of all of them. So I'm extremely grateful and love to see California Park Society for it. You know, as it unites all of them, the banner of Park and Rick, such a rich, rich first benefit of our So please. That's my jubilant thing for the honor. I didn't. <laughs> no joke, by this. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, are you still meeting the best community members can still meet on Sundays at yeah. 10 a.m.? 11 a.m. Uh, under the Dragon Bridge uh, on the bench and by the shipping containers. So everybody is highly welcome you know, to be with us, experience what it is like, and, you know, improve the environment. Feels so good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Director Elliott, and thank you, Travis Beck. And now we will um, continue with our next presentation. Give me a moment while I put that up. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring March 2020 as equal pay day for women. And um, I'd like to read and the, the proclamation. And I'd also like to invite Laura Nolan to turn on um, camera, Santa Cruz County branch of the American Association of University Women. Welcome, Laura. Good afternoon. So, whereas 59 years after the passage of the Equal Pay Act, women, especially minority women, continue to suffer the consequence of unequal pay. And whereas, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women working full-time year-round in 2020 in the United States, she earned 3% of what men earned, indicating insufficient progress pay And whereas, according to graduating to pay gap, a research report by the American Association of University Women, the gender pay gap, is evident one year after college graduation, even after controlling factors known to affect earnings, such as occupation, hours worked, college minor. And whereas nearly four in 10 mothers are primary breadwinners in their household, and nearly third are primary or making pay equity critical to families economic and whereas a lifetime of lower pay means women have less income to save for retirement and less income counted in social security or pension benefit formulas and whereas in 2009 the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was signed into law which gives back to employees their day in court challenge cap. Although the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would have amended the Pay Act by closing loopholes and improving the law's effectiveness, continues to push Congress. And whereas fair pay strengthens the security of families today and eases future retirement costs while enhancing the American economy. And whereas Day, March 15, 2022, symbolizes the time in 2020 when the wages paid to American women catch up wages paid to men from the future. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brenner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim March 2022 as equal payday in the city of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all citizens to join me in this observance. So. Thank you. Um, my name is Laura Nolan, and, and thank you for taking the time with me this afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, my name is Laura Nolan. I am a member of the local AAUW branch. Um, I've been a member for four years. 
The branch here was first founded in 1935, and the AAUW has been advocating for um, primarily economic parity for women and girls for 140 years. Um, the association's been involved with um, lots of different legislation to improve um, pay equity um, among the genders and among the different and among the races. Um, but as you can see, we still have a long ways to go. And I think for me, the most shocking information or the most pivotal information was included in the proclamation, which is that um, women, the pay gap follows women their entire life. It affects families, it affects retired women. Um, and we've come a long ways. We're, we're farther along in California than the federal government is, but the gap persists. And it's significant enough to make a, a difference for women throughout and um, I'm, ha I'm thankful that I have this opportunity to bring um, the community's attention to this um, circumstance. Um, one thing that's that is also tracked is um, March 15th um, pinpoints the point in time when all women compared to all men, the salary they make, but the um, pay discrepancy for um, Black women, Native American women, and Latino women they don't catch up to last year's um, sim uh, similarly uh, rate of ethnic men until late summer and early fall. So that's a, a much bigger gap and one that um, is also being addressed as part of all the other legislation in process. So um, I'd like to thank you for your support. Um, I am a volunteer with the association. I am not um, uh, uh, like a I, I don't advocate typically, so I'm stumbling over my words, but I'm a volunteer. I do have a little more information if anyone has. Any questions, council members? Councilor Ramirez? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, for the proclamation, and thank you, Ms. Laura Nolan, for the work that you do. I just, I want to acknowledge how important this issue is. As, as someone who's from Iran, um, where gender equity and pay equity is a, a huge issue and not acknowledged. It's just important to see you doing the work and AEU doing the work and bringing us to our community. Um, so I just, um, and it goes beyond pay equity. There's issues around childcare, as you know, all of the barriers that are in place to keep women from being able to work in the community and serve in the community. So I really wanna thank you for your work and bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Council member coming. Echo, um, my appreciation, Mayor, for you bringing this forward and Laura for all the work that you do. Um, as someone who's been working, just, Laura, just your knowledge, that background, um, I've been working with, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, workforce development training at the university since 2015. And <clears throat> one question I have that's something that's come up is, you know, as we're Trying to diversify workforces that are predominantly male and predominantly white, um, and we're moving people up into leadership positions. One concern has been that um, advancements in terms of pay uh, that people have experienced in the past, whether or not we're going to see that same rate of pay increases occurring. So, is that something that you've all been tracking? Meaning that, like, when women get into leadership positions, do we still see the same rate of pay increases as we typically saw with men? Or are we seeing that? flatten out because I think that's also of the area of concern team. where we're, you know, okay. moving people up I into these noticed. leadership positions, but then they get to the leadership position the rate of pain kind of flatten out. So I'm wondering if you all track that at all so we can make sure that as we move women and people of color into leadership, they're still seeing that rate of pain um, that men see typically in the past. So it's interesting you bring that up because in my research that was something that did come up and what the data shows that, um, and I'll use women as an example and women of color, but when women enter a field that is male dominated, the pay scale drops. And when men enter a field that is female dominated, the pay scale increases. And so um, I, it just, for me, it begs a larger societal question. I'm not certain how to address it. We certainly have plenty of legislation um, and we still have gaps. Um, and then also another thing that I found interesting was women that are um, highly educated, like with masters and PhDs, they have a gap that is similar to women that are not as highly educated. 
So it's kind of across all ways you look at the data, the gap. Thanks for that. If you can just share any of that data with us, it'd be great as we're continuing to work on these issues so that we can have strong data to back our position. For, but whether it's us creating policy or if we're advocating for counter policies at state and federal level that we really lean on this. So thank you for your work. Appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown, do you have I just wanted to add my appreciation, to Laura, for, for your work for you today to um, help us raise the issue. Um, I want to just say, I so I um, I first met you, Laura, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, Laura um, is a, a um, treasured uh, parish member, uh, city staff member uh, working in finance, and uh, we worked together initially on living wage ordinance uh, development and implementation. And so I know that uh, your uh, commitment to addressing pay equity and livable wages has um, been a long time, <laughs> happening for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge, you mentioned that California, we're doing a little bit better, is a structural and persistent uh, issue uh, in equity. And um, it, it's happening in California and in other places because of the hard work of you and others, um, mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't be otherwise, right? It, it's um, that that's the reality is that we fight um, or or push for uh, policies, you know, programmatic change that that brings us uh, equity hopefully over time. And so, really appreciate your role in all of this. Also, your your uh, thank you. I just a point of. Um, information I retired three years ago so I am doing this um, on my retirement time so yes I, I I did know that but I saw that you were still listed so I thought maybe you were to come back and doing <laughs> yeah. special projects yeah. yeah. but no. you, a no. well-deserved retirement yeah. after your 30 years <laughs> Thank you. Council, member. Council member Myers I just wanted to thank um, mayor for bringing for us work um, in really support, and I just really wanted to touch on it. Sort of the un, kind of the unsaid, which is that later in life, back on retirement, be a growing, growing set of data that's disturbing about women, us or you know, homes as they get into their older years, and largely not not how to plan for retirement. It's a man's job. And it's that part of financial world that often very overlooked. Uh, in my family, you know, we've learned a lot about that just just in the plan understanding and actually working with women very young in their family understand how so important. Uh, especially during the pandemic. Um, so that's the other that puzzle of sustainability. What retirement looks like and the savings of that. Um, the, and because it's common thing. And so I appreciated the not just about wage today, but actually. So thank you again for board. So we hope to see change, and uh, thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. Um, on a related note, um, pensions and Social Security are based on wages. So if your wages are low, then your pension will be proportional, and so women, people of color, others that have, that people have worked part-time, um, their pensions are proportionally lower. And um, we know in today's economy, that can be really public. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today, for all of and for working, uh, bring awareness 
and uh, really appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, so I have a few announcements, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofstanders.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, you may call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using instructions on the screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen to the phone. Please also note there may be a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen while your television or streaming device is on, you may miss your opportunity to When it's your time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine or using raise hand webinar. Public comment is only heard on items council is taking action on and not regular updates for. So the items that will be open for public comment today during the meeting are numbers 9 through 24 and items 27, 30, and 31 on our agenda. We will not be taking public comment on items 25, 26, 28, and 30. Are there uh, any statements of disqualification from council members? Seeing none, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. Fair enough. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on our closed. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the City Council. This morning at 10.30 a.m., the Council met in closed session via Zoom, uh, and the following items were uh, discussed. Item one was a conference with labor, negotiators, uh, labor negotiators involving all bargaining groups, uh, SEIU temp, SEIU service employees, mid managers OE3, supervisors OE3, fire management, fire, IAFF, police management, Police Officers Association and Executive. Item two was a conference uh, with legal counsel concerning liability claims, the claim of Chris and Scott Pinero. Uh, and on that, that item, the council by motion approved a settlement of the liability claim in the amount of $170,770. Item three was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. Uh, I, the first item, of existing litigation was Dervishian versus Mott, Hansen, Geringer, and the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, on that item, the council approved a settlement agreement uh, that has been negotiated through the court process. And the details of the settlement agreement will be available upon request to members of the public when uh, the settlement documents are finalized and executed. Uh, item two was the uh, matter regents of the University of California at all versus the city of Santa Cruz uh, pending in the count Santa Cruz County Superior Court. And item three was city of Santa Cruz versus the regents of the University of California at all also pending in the Superior Court. Uh, there was no reportable action on this. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call on the city manager to see if there are any updates. Manager Matt Hub. Here in council, I have a brief update for you this afternoon. I believe it was the presentation here in a moment. Okay. 
Um, as Elizabeth is pulling up the presentation, I want to also mention that I do have a couple uh, co-presenters this afternoon. Uh, Tiffany Wines West, our Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, is going to provide a brief update on exciting news around our Blue City certification. And she'll be joined by some members of Project O. They've been working with our sustainability team on that effort. And then Rosemary Menard, our water director, is going to close this out this afternoon with a brief update on our uh, water supply forecast. A lot of us have been interested in uh, its current status, and Rosemary will be uh, talking us through that at the end of uh, today's presentation. So with that, I'll jump in. I uh, wanted to start off with uh, talking a little bit about our homeless response work. We continue to put a significant amount of work and effort into implementation of the citywide action plan that the council in March. One significant development is the completion of the contract with the Salvation Army for additional 75 shelter um, at the Armory. That's work that our, our homelessness response team and uh, Larry and Wally have been working on for several months. We decided to finally get that contract over the finish line, 75 additional at that location. As this comes online, uh, we have also said July for the closure of the bench lens. Council will remember that we discussed this as part of the homelessness action plan, one of our major goals for the summer. And we have set the, the timeline for July of the summer full closure of the bench lens as we stand up the shelter. Uh, between now and then, staff will be working with the people who are living there to prepare them for this significant move. Transition will be challenging for those campaign and for the city as a whole, particularly as county shelters COVID funds are in the process. So our, our shelter environment continues to be dynamic. Uh, we of course are putting significant effort into identifying additional sites for county, also identify other locations um, outside of it. We'll continue to provide updates to the Council and the community on our progress. Look forward to sharing the full implementation plan on May 10th. Uh, our homeless response team are working on those details as we speak. More information. I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple upcoming meetings that bring uh, these opportunities to the attention of our community members. Uh, we have two important engagement opportunities. First, open house for the South of Laurel, downtown expansion planning effort. That meeting is happening on Wednesday, 20th, 5 to 8. That's occurring at the Kaiser Permanente Arena. A lot of interest in that. Uh, folks uh, will take the time to turn out, share their opinions on a really important planning effort. Uh, secondly, is a community workshop on the downtown library and affordable housing project It'll be occurring on Thursday, April 21st at 10. Um, we are all very excited about Project Press that we just mentioned uh, to share. As we look out to, uh, to our future council meeting, after nearly two and a half years, hard to believe, of holding our council meetings virtually, and we will finally be reaching council chambers on April 26. Part of this new hybrid structure, members of the committee will still have an opportunity to virtually. Uh, but those that would uh, prefer also come down to the council chambers, participate uh, chambers the, the old fashioned way without having to uh, in you know, We are in the process of that transition and we look forward to seeing some of you in, on April 26th for our next. And with that, I'd like to go ahead now and turn it over to uh, Tiffany Wise West, Project O team, to talk a little bit more about. Thank you so much, City Manager Huffaker. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council and the public. Um, today, Santa Cruz is being recognized as a certified city by the City Network. This is a program of the nonprofit uh, organization Project O. Um, the Blue City Network is a certification system that recognizes cities and counties demonstrating a commitment to healthy oceans and waterways. Um, this really acknowledges the work that all of our departments day in and day out with waste, water quality, our parks and rec folks, our coastal resilience stuff. 
as part of this network, our city will continue to collaborate with other cities, counties, and receive support from the network and its network of nonprofit partners to help us further develop programs to protect the environment. Here to present the honor is Evelina Marchetti, Executive Director, and Allison Omrine, uh, City Liaison. Yep. Um, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you so much. Hello, Mayor Brunner and distinguished members of the City Council. We are excited to be here today to congratulate Santa Cruz as our newest certified city. Our team is very pleased to welcome your beautiful seaside town into our network. Santa Cruz's majestic coastline inspires and enthralls both residents and visitors. It's not a surprise that the city ranks amongst America's best towns. We are so proud to recognize Santa Cruz as a committed community that is dedicated to protecting the marine environment and waterways. Santa Cruz impressively scored 405 out of a possible 500 points on the certification assessment, placing them in the Ocean Hero tier. The certification process involves completing a detailed assessment form that evaluates the city's current and ongoing environmental initiatives and programs. The assessment is divided into four solution areas, which are waste minimization, climate protection and community resilience, water quality and efficiency, and health healthy ecosystems. We use a data-driven approach to assess each city's progress in marine environmental protections. Achieving Blue City certification allows communities to, incredi to credibly and transparently track their progress Towards overall sustainability objectives. And now I will pass it over to Allison, our chief city liaison, who gave personalized support to the city throughout the certification process. She will share more about Santa Cruz's incredible accomplishments. Thank you, Evelina. It is an honor to be here celebrating Santa Cruz's great success in becoming a certified city. I'd like to point out a few of the major accomplishments that assist. Santa Cruz in gaining this Blue City recognition, which include implementing a master recycling volunteer training program that certifies participants and encourages them to educate their community on waste and recycling, developing the very help what goes where guide and an app, helping residents and businesses with proper waste disposal, producing an innovative sea level rise virtual reality explorer app and online bilingual story map to share the future of Santa Cruz's shoreline with the community. Establishing the city as a zero importing municipality in that 95% water of surface water rights and 5% of groundwater collected within the Santa Cruz watershed. Reducing residential per capita water use by an impressive 22% between 2013 and 2020 and also being dedicated to urban tree planting with the ongoing annual planting of 200 trees and spearheading a street trees plan where Santa Cruz offers free trees to residents to plant in front of their home. or As now part of the Blue City Network, Santa Cruz joins a growing community of other certified in California and will continue to receive support from us and our nonprofit partners to further elevate the ocean and the city residents. Through their certification status, Santa Cruz serves as a model for other cities, able to assist other towns and cities looking to advance their environmental initiatives through our program. So as we wrap up, we'd like to give a special shout out to Tiffany Wise West, who served as our contact person for the program and who worked diligently to get their certified. On behalf of myself, Evelina, and the team at Project O, congratulations again. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. City Manager Huffer, City Council members, and the public listening in for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tiffany, and uh, thank you to the project for all the great work. Thrilled to be uh, now part of the, the Blue City family. So thank you for your uh, collective effort. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to, to Roseberry Menard now going to run us through uh, water supply for 
afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, this is kind of a little bit of an annual ritual for us to tell you about where we are about this time of the year, looking forward to our dry season, although the, the use of the term dry season this year is a little bit um, out of whack with some reality. I think the takeaway messages I want to share, and I'm gonna repeat these over and over again in this presentation, not ad nauseum, but at least a few times is, that uh, Santa Cruz has one of the lowest water using uh, communities in the in the state and probably in the nation. Our our uh, water levels are really superior to those that occur in most places. And Loch Lomond is about 90% full at this time. This is a relatively re recent picture, and you don't see any of that you know, um, unpleasant bathtub ring kind of situation like we were looking at last. Next slide, please. Um, I think that all of us know, and this is a really water aware community. So when it stops raining, as it has over the last several months, you hear about it, people talk to you about it when you're on the street or in the supermarket and you know you hear over here conversations, people saying, when is it gonna rain? Um, well, I guess the good news for us is that Loch Lomond is such a small reservoir that even the kind of rain we had in uh, in October and um, in December really helped us fill that reservoir this year. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is the reservoir that size annual depletion and refill based on the assumption that you know we're going to get winter rains every year, which is something we're not seeing in as way as did historically. But nevertheless, we're in good shape here and. As we're so conserving as a community, I don't see any benefit to where we will be going into the next winter from implementing restrictions this year. That is why I'm not recommending it and why the Water Commission is also not recommending to council that we proceed with um, water restrictions here. A little out of touch with what's going on around the rest of the state, but we're, our local situation does not warrant taking that action. Um, next slide, please, uh, Elizabeth. Um, when I talk about where we are and where we're gonna get to, this is a, a process we use every year of looking at, you know, status at the beginning of the of the dry season, and then a projection that's based on stream flow and water supply demand and what we think that uh, is gonna happen over the coming month and all the different factors that influence where we'll be as far as reservoir storage. And we're protecting projecting about a 70% drawdown of the reservoir by Halloween, which is kind of the turning point for us to move back into the wet. Now, at the beginning, at this time last year in 2021, uh, about 74% was where we were as opposed to about 90%. So, you know, the sort of worst case scenario is we'll find ourselves going into next winter roughly in the same place we were going into um, the last that we started um, last year. So I think that that this is a okay place for us to be and I feel comfortable that you know we will be able to um, manage the situation for the winter of um, 22, 23, and then also the following year given this situation. And I want to just end this um, by showing you um, something that was referred to by the Project O team. Next slide, please, um, Elizabeth. Which is, this is our, um, particularly the light blue bars, our, our residential gallons per capita per day. Uh, and you can see that at the 59, 61 level before 2013, 2015, uh, at, the, at the drought of 2014, 15, we really had a significant reduction. We were doing rations at that time, but our community members basically adopted and integrated into their ongoing uh, operations and the way they use water, those measures from that time we were rationing. You can see that at this point, we're at about 45 gallons per person per day. Um, that's indoor and outdoor um, with about 35 gallons per person per day of indoor use. So relatively small uh, outdoor water use here and very consistent uh, commitment to conservation over the last about eight. So with this kind of ongoing um, engagement, our community, uh, I don't see a, 
has basically any real value of you know, restricting our use more than has been adopted over the last five years. With that, I'm happy to take questions. I think there's one more slide that's a, another picture of, um, current picture of. Thank you, Rosemary. Do council members have any questions? Writing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for those updates. Uh, moving on, we have the city council calendar, and I'd like to call on the city clerk to provide updates on the calendar. We have no updates, but just a reminder, there is a special next day at 3.30, which is um, a Zoom only, not hyper -tech. Great. Thank you for that reminder. Okay, before we continue with the consent, uh, uh, consent agenda, I'd just like to read uh, a few items regarding meeting efficiency. We have a very active agenda today with a lot of important business to cover and a number of items practical public input on. I've also heard comments from members of the public who have claimed that council discussions and debate is being too drawn and repetitive, causing some members of the community to tune out during extended debates. I've also noticed that a number of attendees signed in to our Zoom tends to drop significantly during prolonged debates which suggests that our deliberation result in public participation in our meetings. So based on these concerns, in order to more efficiently and effectively manage the meeting and to encourage participation by all members of this council, as well as members of the public, I will be implementing a few changes in the order of One, following staff's presentations, there will be an opportunity for council member questions before we receive public comment. After staff presentations, council members have an opportunity to ask no more than three questions before we move on to questions from the next council member in order. Once a council member has asked their question, they will move to the back of the line all council members have the opportunity to have their questions answered before I recognize a council member who has already had their turn. After all council members have an opportunity to ask questions, then the process will repeat and each council member will have an opportunity to ask two more questions. The cycle will repeat until all Following communications from members of the public and public input, before taking further comments or questions from council members, I will ask the council members prepared to move the recommended action. And if that is made and seconded, a discussion will focus on that recommended. I would also request that motions or motions to amend the main motion be used sparingly. It's perfectly acceptable to vote no on a motion before a separate motion and requests for friendly amendments are encouraged. As with council member questions, after a council member has provided comments, all other council members will have an opportunity before I recognize a council member who has already provided comment. To encourage more participation by the full council and to avoid the race to the first in line, the following will be used as a guide to recognizing council members during discussion and deliberation. When an item has been 
presented by council members. Those who presented the item will have the first opportunity to make a motion and explain the motion and explain the basis for the recommended action. When multiple hands are raised on an item, a council member who has not spoken has a prior claim over one who has already discussed. Similarly, a member who seldom speaks generally be given preference over a council member who frequently. I reserve the right as citing officer to call on any council member who has a hand raised, particularly if a council member was recognized first on a prior agenda. To avoid drawn out and repetitive discussion after all council members have had a fair opportunity to provide their input, I will entertain a motion to call it. I have emailed this information to each council member. Uh, my goal is to really ensure that we all have an opportunity to discuss city business and public um, input in a efficient and constructive way that um, can keep us on track. Another uh, long meeting with a lot of input, and I do see Council Member Brown. I do, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, so I have two questions, actually. Um, I'll use up two of my three. Um, the first question is, um, whether I'd, I'd like to, so first I want to clarify is what I'm hearing that um, the motion in the council agenda packet must be made first before we have to hear those motions for an, another or a variation on that motion. So, so um, intent is to our based on past discussion being so broad is um, starting from a base of discussion on the recommend, recommended motion. And then we can narrow that focus of discussion. So my second question is actually for our Yeah, there you are. Um, has, have these <laughs> procedural rules been, um, I guess, vetted? by your office and is this compliance with our um, rules around Robert's rules of and all the other regulations that govern the conduct of public yes these um, this is the product of discussions that I've been having with the mayor over the course of the past uh, few meetings and um, and and they are based upon a review of our existing meeting rules as well as different sources of parliamentary procedure like Robert's rules or the Alice Sturgis um, handbook on parliamentary procedure or Rosenberg's rules of order which are the Cal City's version um, and and so yes uh, they have been they have been reviewed for um, both conformance with Rules of parliamentary procedure and the requirements of the Brown Act. So, just again to clarify, those rules allow a body to require that only the motion or the recommendation published agenda materials made graded upon prior to trying to for alternative. I don't think that's that's not how I read the rule, Councilmember Brown. Um, just, I read the, I read the rule hearing. as I read the rule as saying that the mayor will entertain a motion from a council member uh, who's prepared to make the the motion on the recommended action. Uh, it certainly doesn't limit the council's ability to discuss and debate uh, alternatives, um, but it's it's designed to. Um, initially provide council members with the opportunity to discuss the recommended action um, and it doesn't limit in any way the council from considering uh, additional modifications to the recommendation recommended action or alternative um, except for we can't make substantive motions 
until after. The I'm sorry, that's what I felt feel like I'm hearing. I'm going to clarify here. Because and again, I read that I read the rule as as request, as a request to limit use of substitute uh, motions, but not a not a prohibition on substitute. I, mean, I, I would just comment that the use of substitute motions and amended motions has been um, has been in the last, I would say, three or four years, come commonplace on the council, and, and I don't recall that as a standard practice over the years until fairly recently. Um, and and so I, I think this is an effort to sort of. Um, not restrict debate, but to, to keep the debate on a, a little less uh, adversarial footing. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, well, not really, but I don't think now's the time to the conference. I'll follow up. Uh, council member coming. I guess I'd just express that um because I guess I'll just express that <clears throat> one of the concerns I have is that you know given that members of the public don't have as much engagement with staff or they have as much and sometimes they'll have engagement with council members on a certain item that when these items come to us, they have concern that that's that making motions to help address those concerns is how we work on behalf of people. Um, oftentimes, staff comes with recommendations that we agree with. Oftentimes, staff comes with recommendations and we hear from the public and they disagree. And I think that by um, just starting off with only being able to move staff's recommendation will actually create more tension and be more of an adversarial process, but I'm just going to keep my comments there um, because I think it's actually going to result in having more substitute and amended motions. Um, but that's just, those are just my comments. And then um, this, I guess if this is, I guess it would also be helpful to understand as we <clears throat> move to hybrid meetings, if this is going to remain the practice and um, just so that we have a clear sense of how um, meetings are going to be managed moving forward, because it's a much different um, being in person is much different than online. And also, if we're hybrid, that means some people will be probably use the hand raise button versus people being in in you know in chambers actually raising their hands. So if we can just have a clear process as well, um, I think that'll be helpful. And also. It would be helpful to know when motions should be made because I know that <clears throat> traditionally we have questions from council, public comment, and then we'll make motions. But sometimes we'll make motions during questions. And so being able to have a clear process for when we're supposed to make motions would also be helpful so that um, you know we don't have more conflicts arising with council as well. Thank you, Council. Um... I did uh, want to take this approach today. Um, we can see how this goes. Effort for me to respond to a request for a more efficient meeting without our opportunity as a body. Our only opportunity to discuss items is in a public in this setting, and it's important that we have those discussions. But it's also important that we um, stay focused and stay um, aligned with, uh, with meetings. And so, like our city interns said, after several uh, meetings and talking over several things about how we structure our meetings, it's my responsibility to um, get uh, moving and keep us as much aligned and time for the members of the public and for city staff, council members, for us all to stay, um, you know, uh, 
with, with the items for us. So going into in-person hybrid, I would hope that uh, council members are in person in the chambers, like occasion where a council member will have um, hybrid uh, joining us via Zoom. But um, there will be members of the public that will also be either in person or Zoom, and we'll have to navigate that process as um, get there. So today, I would like to try this approach. I welcome um, input uh, to see how it goes. And um, I'm not trying to radically um, restrict anything. I'm just trying to structure us moving as a body um, and to be mindful of that makes sense. Council member or Vice Mayor Watkins. Hey, can you hear me okay? I was having some trouble with my Zoom earlier. Yes. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um no, I just wanted to share my my support for your um, and appreciation for your structure that you've laid out for us here today. I've noticed that we've had several items that have been moved or postponed. And I think that's because of the packed agendas that we've had. And having served as mayor, I also know the challenge of trying to really balance process with action and equity of voice and um, also encouraging council members to have questions asked and answered in advance of the meeting um, to have more efficient meetings if possible and to hear from everybody. So I just wanted to offer my support and I know that it's iterative. We're always continually trying to improve our systems. So I'm sure we'll modify or you'll modify as did, but um, appreciate this attempt and, and happy to, to ob oblige in terms of compliance. Oh. Thank you. Council member Perry Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I also just wanted to uh, acknowledge and express my thanks to you for trying this on and to my colleagues for trying this on. Um, of course, I have never been mayor, but I have facilitated many meetings, and it's a challenging thing to do, as Vice Mayor Watkins has said, to um, balance what you have voice, process, and action. So I really appreciate the approach. I've also heard from many community members that they have not been able to participate because um, our process has been lengthy and has excluded community engagement. So thanks for bringing this forward, and I'm happy to try it on as well. Thank you. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to express my support as well. I think that just so many items in honor of the day that. So I think they time out of their days and their nights to try to see us great our business. Reviewers, just lateness of our meeting, lasting the next morning um i really appreciate your direction that you know you know voting on voting no is okay also attempts to try to change language though that is part of our process a lot of that staffs multiple um very supportive. Thank you also for clarifying it, putting it. You're welcome. Um, the lot I read, so I wanted to go with this starting point, and and um, I'm so glad that. Um, the city attorney's office will help me structure some of my uh, ideas into some of these points to help us on track. Um, with that being said, today, as I try, it adds another layer to stay on track as well and to keep track of council member questions and um, you know how many times if. It, it will add another layer for my brain to <laughs> process and track of. So I'll try my best today. And I um, thank you all for 
uh, trying this out today as we move forward. And happy um, yes. back up. Okay. So we will now begin our uh, consent agenda. These are items numbers nine through 22 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you'd like to comment on items 9 through 22. Instructions should be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. Raise your hand either by dialing star 9 on your phone or select raise hand in the webinar controls on your phone. All items will be upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any item? I have hands raised. Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to pull 13 comments from Question on 16, comment on. Can you say that one more time, please, sure. as I write to make yeah. sure I get it correctly? Thank you. Sure. I have a, I'm going to pull 13. Okay. I have a comment on 15. Question on 16. Comment on 17. Question on 18. And a comment, comment on 20, and a question on. Oh. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, I, I have a comment on 17. Okay, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I have a comment on 14, 17. Okay, so we have one item pulled, item number 13. So I will go ahead and call uh, pull this up here. Um, I will go to the comments and questions. And I will go to, um, after that, I will move to public comment on uh, any of the items except for third. So go ahead. Um, I will start with item number 14. Council Member Callan Terry Johnson, you had a comment? Yes, I just wanted to. Um... Thank you, Mayor Bruner and Vice Mayor Watkins for um, your collaboration bringing this anti-Semitism resolution forward. The resolution acknowledges the uptick in anti-Semitism here in our community and our condemnation of these acts. Um, and as Ramadan and Passover converge this year, it's really important that we as a city council and we as a community stand together against religious hate and um, uplift the beauties of these sacred traditions. So, Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, our next item for comment is uh, item number 15, council member. I wanted to express my appreciation for um, Mayor Bruner, Council Member Brown for bringing this forward. This was brought to our attention uh, by County Supervisor Luis Alejo, and this item is the establishment of a new Calvet Veterans Home in Monterey County in order to provide skilled nursing and memory care services for aging, disabled, and homeless veterans living in the Central Coast region of California. As we try to address many of the homeless needs, um, understanding that veterans who make up a population of people who are experiencing homelessness and need care, that our hope is that this letter will support uh, the construction of this facility that can 
provide support and care for um, many of our homeless people. So thank you for working on this for the support of Supervisor Alejo. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll stay with you and move on to your comment on item 17. Yeah, I just wanted to express my appreciation of staff um, for working with the other uh, local jurisdictions to help bring this forward. We know um, statewide moratorium was extended, right? Um, but really trying to ensure that we're getting money into uh, pockets, people who, especially renters, who are struggling is really critical. I wanted to express my appreciation of staff for bringing this item forward and uh, look forward to hearing more about how these funds are spent, how quickly they're spent, and you know what kind of needs there are. Um, Council Member Brown, you also had a comment on item 17. Yeah, I I had a simpler comment, so I won't repeat it. Uh, things, um, but I would just add, uh, in addition to the presentation about how significant for low income uh, working families um, that we know that eviction prevention is our most efficient and effective uh, mechanism for addressing preventing homelessness um, and preventing the challenges that go along with that. So um, this is a really important investment. Uh, I staff following up. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Johnson, you had a comment on item. Yes, and I'll echo my colleague's sentiments. Um, I appreciate this effort. I appreciate that we're moving forward with effective solutions and not working in a silo and in a vacuum and aligning our efforts with county and with other city jurisdictions to help those who are really in need of help. So thank you to the work. Mm -hmm. uh, Council member uh, Cummings, you had a comment on item 20. Yes, Mayor, um, I also wanted to just um, express my support for the staff for all the hard work they've done uh, to really start moving forward with um, you know, further electrifying our fleet. You know, back in 2019, when I got on council, there was a lot of discussion about why we're not investing in electric um, refuse trucks, and we moved the staff has been working diligently to move us in that direction to continue to be a, a carbon neutral city. And, you know, just really wanted to highlight this to the community. This is high voltage portable battery charger for first all electric trucks. And um, I think that many members of the community would appreciate this, um, especially with our dedication to protecting the environment and also trying to just, you know, um, continue moving in this direction. I want to thank everyone for hard work. It hasn't been easy, but it's moving us in a cleaner, more sustainable direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now for the questions. Uh, Council Member Cummings, question on item 16 the loan consolidation and affordability term extension for Sycamore Street Commons and La Playa Residential. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had some. Some community members reaching out um, based on the um, the gender report, the extension of the affordability and the project is seven years. And some community members were asking, you know, what, is there any way that we can get this restricted affordable in perpetuity? So I'm just wondering whether or not we can do that. And um, if not, then what are some of the questions around that? Is Director Bonnie Lipscomb or Jessica DeWitt available? Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, Council. This is Jessica DeWitt. Um, so, Councilmember Cummings, to speak to your question on affordability. So, there's several regulatory agreements on this property. There's also several lenders, uh, one of them being State HGD, so State Housing and Community Development. So, we're working together to consolidate. There are actually several units that are already being regulated in perpetuity. So there's sort of a mix of hybrid um, regulatories going on here. So we're trying to consolidate them all. Um, the developer Mercy Housing is actually on the call today and can 
probably speak to that item. Um, I know this has been a question that has come up as to whether, you know, all these units could be affordable in perpetuity. Um, so that is something we're covering. But, but it's going to require, you know, working with all the other lenders to make that happen if that's a, if that's a possibility. HCD being one of them. Great. So I guess um, I don't know. The housing want to comment? Question. Oh, um, but I do have a follow up question. Bonnie Bush. I'm not sure if you're able to see them out in um, the. Yeah. So Becky Flores with Mercy Housing. Um, go ahead. Hello, Mayor. Members of the council. Hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for taking the time to consider this item today. And um, the discussion around um, preserving affordability and perpetuity has been brought up in discussions with staff, and Mercy Housing would definitely be open to accommodating that request. Our goal is the Comore Street Commons and La Playa Residential affordable for the long term. So we don't see any issue if that's the will of the council and the community at large in, in, in providing for that. Thank you so much. Council member coming. I have a question to the city attorney, ma'am. The attorney. So I'm wondering, given the information that we've heard, um, wondering if you want to provide additional direction. It sounds like um, staff has an opportunity to work with various lenders. There could be the opportunity to bring this back to council um, in order to um, designate housing affordable in perpetuity rather than because right now we're going to approve the 57 years extension. So I'm wondering, would we need to pull this to that language or how we might go about given that this item on? We certainly would want to pull it from consent. However, in terms of potential impediments to making the restrictions permanent versus a 57 year covenant. Um, I have not had an opportunity to research that. And so I'm not really prepared to comment on the viability of doing that at this, at this point. Yeah, and the, the direction wouldn't be to make it, you know, in perpetuity today. The idea would be that we move forward staff recommendation to have staff return um, after they've had an opportunity to Discuss with various stakeholders on whether or not we would be able to make this property affordable in perpetuity. Yeah, I, I I think that would be a motion that should be made separately from just acting on the consent. Looks like um, Becky had her hand up. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, I would just add um, what Mr. Condotti uh, referenced that you know if if we could take action on this item, um, and then if if we make a separate motion, discuss the perpetuity, um, that would be fine as well. That being said, then I'll pull seventeen so we can um, add the additional direction. Uh. Sorry, no, not 17. Um, Item 16? 16, sorry, we'll see. Does that conclude your question, uh, question for 16? It does. Okay, you had a question on uh, 19 and then 22. Correct. Um, so for members of the public, item number 19, is the UV bypass valve repair and notice completion. Um, one of the things that um, stood out was that additional $100,000 was required to work. I'm wondering if staff could just for that a little bit more so clear. The initial bid for this project was 7000 so it ended up um, costing double what it was in. So I'm just wondering if staff can speak to what happened there and why that was the case. Um, just for help clarify yes uh this was a, a emergency project at the wastewater treatment plant it's a 72 inch valve 
our largest valve uh, at the treatment plant. And um, <clears throat> when we, uh, we realized that the valve was not operating, we couldn't <laughs> operate it, and we needed to operate it. And uh, it was not a bid. Uh, it was actually an emergency project. And uh, what we do in an emergency project is basically call qualified contractors and whoever can respond fastest, basically. And, you know, we're, we're comfortable and are fully competent. Anderson Pacific was able to respond very quickly. Uh, and then once they started the project, what happened was uh, it's about a 12, the valve's about 12 to 13 feet deep, something like that. Um, and once they started uh, exploring, uh, we ran into two uh, high voltage duct banks. So those are concrete um, encased um, conduits. One of those um, duct banks has 21,000 uh, volt uh, electricity running through it. Um, and in order, so at that point, you know, it was very special type of uh, excavation and shoring required to actually get down to the valve. So that's what caused basic double increase price in, in the cost. It's all time and material. They're, you know, it's a time and material job. So but we approve their time, basically approving their time that they spend on the job materials and uh, they successfully completed the work and, and that, therefore the notice. Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate it. Sure. No problem. Thank you. Uh, item 20 is the T2 systems parking pay stations. Yeah, and so the question I had on this, um, someone from the public would not be available. Um, the question that came to me from members of the community was along the lines of, um, you know, there's the pay stations that we use at the um, parking garages, and then we have our uh, parking meters, it seems like there's two different software systems that are each. And so people were asking, um, you know, why does we have two separate systems and we don't follow it with one specific kind of system so that it will, you know, for example, if you need to use an app to renew your parking um, phone that rather than having, say, for example, two different apps on one thing to throughout the city. So that's the question that came to me, members of the public wanted to today. Um, okay, Nathan Yuen, are you here to speak on that? Sure, yeah. Thank you. City Engineer, Public Works. Uh, the parking uh, system controls, we do have a couple different systems that are operating in our city. So in our garages, we use the park, has, park access revenue control system, so a park system that's gated. Um, so that is what the, we're instituting now, right now, Ron Riverfront and SoCal Front. Type equipment. The surface lots we are using equipment through T2 systems, which we've been using for almost a month. So, the, what's before you at this point is replacing some of that antiquated equipment. But um, there is a possibility that in the future, as we uh, look to upgrade parks system, that we may look at trying to combine that into you know one vendor so it is one more one system. To Thank you. Council Member Myers, uh, you have your hand raised. You're muted. Thank you. I do have a question, I guess, now on item. I'm sorry, I didn't split. But I do have a question on number three now that to visit. Just kind of understanding the relationship language. To me, item 23, I was wondering if I could just ask the staff. Item 23. Oh, uh, excuse me, that's on. Sorry, yeah. I'll ask it later. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that concludes comments and questions from council. We have two items pulled 13 and 16.
At this time, there are members of the public that would like to see any of our items that are not pulled on our consent agenda. Now is the time to do so. Raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in your webinar control. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and the timer will be set. So our first hand, let's go to attendees. We have the name, I am watching you. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, hi, um, I'll be very brief. On item number 17, you're not actually saying exactly who the money will go to. Uh, surely not CAB or tenant sanctuary bank accounts, I hope. Uh, the state homeless money is questionably spent on people who still live in homes. Shouldn't it be spent on homeless people? Anyway, I hope it all goes to the landlords to pay back rent. Uh, note this agreement is not included, therefore it's vague. And uh, finally, this perpetual rent moratorium needs to end, and I'm not sure there's any end to it in your mind. The state says it's over. Uh, forget the item number, but the, the cost of that electric garbage truck is now approaching a million dollars. Wowie. Okay, thanks. Here, our next uh, name is Brian Shields, Carpenters Local. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Hi. Hi. For today. Not the night yet. Um, I uh, I was I had a question about eighteen, um, and so this is for the city lease a space from twelve hundred Pacific LLC. This is public comment time, so go ahead. You have three minutes to make your comment. Sure. So, uh, but this is for the city it's a space, correct? From, uh, I have number 18, amend lease 1200 Avenue, Pacific LLC conference. There's a full title. I don't want to take up the full minute. Sure. Uh, I would just ask that responsible contract be used on this project. It'll be city money that'll be renovating the space and uh, a responsible contractor that has a uh, health healthcare, livable wage. Uh, and has been doing that for longer than just uh, that project's duration. Anyways, that, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next hand raise is the name Reggie Meisler. Welcome, Reggie. Go ahead and press star nine to mute. Hey, you guys can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I just wanted to comment on item nine and um, and honestly, just like how it just kind of plays into the continuation of the ever continuing um, authorization of executive power to the city manager, you know, not having meetings in person. Now we're talking about having a rule that can't make alternative motions to what city staff wants to do. You know, you guys can't even meet and decide on things before the meeting because that's a Brown Act violation. I mean, the, the power grab by the executive branch right now is just so extreme, and it doesn't even make sense uh, for you guys. I mean, you must see that the rubber stamp for city staff and the city manager. Like they don't want you to talk about what they decided for you ahead of the meeting. They want you to ask them questions. They want everyone to be on Zoom so we can't have any sort of, we're tightly controlled in our communications. I mean, this is just like, this isn't how democracy is supposed to be. So I just want you guys to sort of reflect on that a little bit. Thank you. Okay, the next phrase already spoke. Are there any other attendees 
Is there with public comment for consent items 9 through 20 with the exception of item 13 and Okay, I see none. I will bring it back. Looking for a motion on items 9 through 22 with the exception of that and I council member Myers yeah, I'll move the exceptions item 13 thank you uh, vice mayor watch I'm Sorry. happy to see. yeah I'm happy to see. Uh, so we have uh, first by Councilmember Myers, a second for Watkins, and, and items. I'd like to ask the clerk, roll call vote. Mayor, Councilmember Kellenberry Johnson. Aye. Mayor is up. Coming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with one absence. Aye. We will now come back to our pulled item. The first one being item number 13. This was pulled by council member Kings. Item number 13 is a resolution declaring the city council's intent regarding possible proceeds from measure F, a sales tax and use tax, a sales and use tax ballot item on the June 2020 California statewide primary. Council member coming. Mayor, and it's just so members of the public are aware, this is a non-binding resolution that expresses um, the intent of how uh, the money could be used should the uh, measure pass. Um, and again, it's not um, holding the city to using this in any specific way. However, it is an expression of our values and what we want to support and what we've heard from the community. And I've heard from a number of members of the community regarding the resolution and wanting to have a few more um, uh, provisions included. And given the language that's before us, um, I went ahead and tried to make some um, amendments or propose some language changes. So what I've done is included that um, into the whereas on this, the last whereas on the last page. And I sent that over to Bonnie. I'm happy to do that um, once. You on this going right into a motion right now or public not not to a motion just putting the language up because um i actually called the city attorney and just well that there's gonna be changes made to, to, to let the public see it um before public comments they can uh, see what the new language is um, <clears throat> so in the, the last whereas the resolution really outlines um, how the revenue would, what it could help with. And so just added in, whereas the revenue generated by this measure may help with mitigating the impacts of homelessness, I added including, but not limited to supporting services and programs that address mental and behavioral health, substance abuse prevention, safe sleeping, and safe parking programs, et cetera. The need for more affordable housing, affordable and workforce housing, downtown and business support, added workforce development, actions to help address the high cost of housing in Santa Cruz, added creating and supporting programs and services, reduce carbon emissions, meet our climate action plan goals, mitigate the impacts of climate change and make our city more resilient to climate change impacts, but not limited to reduction of wildfire risk, maintenance of city facilities and essential infrastructure, such as streets, transit, parking, recreation facilities, and added for all residents, including but not limited seniors, and prevention 
of reduction of important city services and added along with supporting and expanding services to increase efficiency and promote sustainability of services and service providers. That the language that um, that came before, that those that language attempt to try to capture some of the concerns that were raised by community members. So um, after this goes out public, how we're going to manage this as it relates to the uh, the new guidance for us, but um, we can determine how we can move forward after the public. Okay, thank you. Um, so are there any questions before I go out to the public? No. Um, and the city attorney just answer um, or clarify the resolution of intent regarding this uh, revenue measure F. Um, we can't, uh, as council member Cummings stated, it's a non-binding agreement, correct? Yes, um, the measure that's on the June ballot is uh, proposing a, a sales tax uh, increase as a general tax, meaning uh, it will uh, provide funding that will be put in the general fund and available for uh, for uses uh, and priorities identified by the city council. And the resolution is an expression of the city council's intention with regard to the use of the funds, but it's not binding because if it were, that would uh, that would be a special tax, not a general tax, and it would require a two-thirds majority vote uh, voter. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, at this time then, I, I will get uh, hands raised. And so, up to Council Member Meyer. Um, I question, um, but I feeling original. She try to add additional clarity, but I like and. Really, of trying to, you know, in a sense, um, outlining uh, potential uses um, and potential proceeds, but not getting quite in trouble. Proposed revised language. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we have a motion. Mayor, we haven't gone out to public comment yet. I know. It's, this is kind of what we were talking about earlier in the process. One point that out. Thank you for pointing that out. So at this time, um, I see other hands raised. Are there questions from council members before I go out to public comment? Council member, Vice Mayor Watson. Well, I had, I don't, I don't necessarily, I have a comment. I'll just wait. Okay. Until. Council member Kalantari Johnson. I was wondering if um, city staff, if a manager of her could comment on um, the implications of the added language to this resolution of intent in terms of, yeah, the implication. Here, so Councilmember uh, Kalantari Johnson, but it meant, council really does have a question of all what happened. Non binding. Um, I will say that current proposal reflects revenue, budget ad hoc, recommended. Uh, but the council certainly has discretion. In uh, 
Council Member Brown. Do you have a question? No, sorry, my question was about procedure, but I, I got it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go out to public comment at this time for item number 13 on our consent agenda. And I do see some hands raised. So the first hand is a phone number ending in 5542. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Press star six or press unmute option. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Mayor. Me? Yes. Hi. Ron Pomerantz, um, a previous council act starting tax declared a special emergency in order to sales tax increase as Measure F invalid. The current ongoing situation is not an emergency. The fiscal emergency started years ago, or don't last year. Staff said pension fund costs severely harm the budget. Little was done in the intervening years. Correct this situation. There's nothing in this resolution that can't then address the pension issue. This crying wolf, the United Pension address this financial problem. <clears throat> this agenda item, yet in the ploy, by the full voters, that half sales tax increase will be used for the delineated purposes based on a poll you commissioned. The council truly wanted to specify and lock up sales tax to be used. We would have clearly and honestly spelled it out in the ballot. Staff report says the problem with this approach state law requires sales tax with these specifics. We needed a two thirds vote of the election to be zone polling so the two thirds vote would not pass. Then that seems to say you're worried that getting a simple majority may be a problem. Sales tax dominantly harm poor students, low wage workers. Struggling families because of the stress of tax. These folks receive minimal benefits that pay a disproportionate part of their income for their sales tax, as opposed to higher income and wealthier. The sales tax goes hand in hand with the highest inflation rate in 40 years, further compounding harm to their well being. A clear violation, Council Member Watkins, of the health and all policy values and requires equity as a cornerstone. This agenda item was not even placed on the agenda as a general business item, rather it's on the consent. This is an attempt to slide it through without public scrutiny. To quote your staff for resolution and intent and not find it. Why the people? Your time and consideration. Thank you for your comment. Our next hand raised the name uh, oh, Reggie Meisler. Welcome, Reggie. Hi. Yeah. You know, I'm just wondering why are we even discussing this, right? Like, you guys all could have talked to staff before the meeting and just figured it out. And then city staff could just get what they wanted and, you know, it can just fly through consent. Your meeting can end early. Like, no problem, you know. Just chug it along, let the sort of business interests get whatever they need to get. You know, whatever people are lobbying you on the back end, they can get what they want. Nobody has to speak. Nobody has to like wait around for anything. So, you know, I guess it's just, that's my question. All right. We are taking public comment on item number three. I see phone number ending in 0575. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Bear. I am the city of, I'm a city of Santa Cruz worker, the president of the city of Santa Cruz chapter of SEIU 521, a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz. I would appreciate it if the city council would recognize the importance of the services that city workers provide by including us in this resolution for the tax sales, the sales tax measure. Throughout the pandemic, city workers worked hard to the city running and at the same time taking a furlough and suffering layoffs. 
now that we're on the road to recovery, the sales tax keep the city running and pay the workers a fair wage. That will attract new workers to provide services and the residents of Santa Cruz need and want. Thank you for your attention. Your comment next hand raised is the name David Tanachi. Yes, thank you, Dustin and City Council for including city workers and the services that we provide to the community and the resolution and for the sales tax measure. I'm very proud to be a member of our water department. I live within the city just down the street off of the street. And I know that both myself and my coworkers provide the essential services that this community has felt needed through the pandemic. And we're facing a very severe retention and recruitment crisis due to being underpaid and overworked. We hope that the language involved in this will prioritize Typically, as Ken stated, our SEIU membership as an investment in the services that the work provide, both for the city staff and the recipients of this uh, sales tax initiative. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Our next hand raised is I am watching you. Hey, yeah. Uh, hi again. I'll, I'll also be brief again. I. I don't think that uh, government workers suffered more than the private sector in the uh, pandemic. Uh, I, I don't know what the ratio would be, but I, I would guess it's a hundred to one that the private sector suffered more. Um, you know, really, uh, this item is just uh, fluff. I mean, it's uh, an attempt to gain support for the for the uh, initiative, uh, but it's really a simple choice for voters. Do they want to allow the government to take a bigger chunk of the economy uh, from them to spend as they please. And, you know, they have to make that choice. That's a, it's, a, a, it's a simple choice for me. Um, I'm going to vote no. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. No other hands raised, no other public comment for item number 13 on our consent agenda. We'll bring it back to council. And we have a motion uh, that is uh, council member Myers. Um, Yeah, the mayor, I'm happy um, to move a resolution on the resolu resolution declaring the city council's intent regarding the use of Okay, and um, is there a second of discussion? I'm happy to. Okay. We have a first by Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Watkins, and um, Council Member Brown, have a comment? Yeah, I do have a couple of comments, actually. Um, it is comment time, and I am following the rules and not comment question time. I am making comment, comment period. Um, I um, I actually support, I am on the revenue committee, and um, this resolution, while not directly crafted by the members of the committee, was uh, based upon a discussion that uh, suggested that we wanted to uh, follow result of the voter poll and the, the priorities of uh, the from those responses and so I think it is uh, an appropriate um, full <laughs> exercise uh, for us to engage in it puts us on record and it gives us some look uh, forward and also uh, look 
do once this measure, uh, this ballot measure passes. Um, and so, so I support that. Um, I, I so uh, also support the uh, additions that Councilmember Cummings suggested would like uh, included. And I think that um, and this is an example of uh, a council member who was not on that um, looked at the recommendation, was not talk with us or talk with staff about that prior to meeting, and therefore is bringing this. And I think they're thoughtful additions, while perhaps a little bit more concrete. Um, I think they reflect uh, very, very important and urgent issues that are. So that's one comment. And the other comment I want to make is uh, that we have uh, received some written communications from a couple of workers who were able to attend the meeting today. I know many workers do that. Um, and uh, the, you know, the concern about where our workforce fits is not explicit in that uh, draft resolution. Um, so on this issue of um, you know, the city's, uh, the city council's view of you know, how to address or been asked to include something uh, to suggest that city workers be fairly compensated at wages that are competitive with other agencies across our And I believe that 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 we all ought to be and I believe that uh, while well, I've heard council members talk about this kind of general concept as something that we all, um, most part, agree upon, um, I think that, that we're getting these uh, communications is workers are very concerned and they're, they haven't seen that. They haven't seen that act. They have heard it in words that they do our council meetings. Um, but they ha or talk with individual council members, but they have not had an action. So I want to be um, very clear that that is an absolute priority of mine. I'm going to fight for that in um, the conversation, the ongoing conversation about the you know, workforce issues, our discussion, our bargaining unit. So I just want to be really clear about that up front. That's my position. Um, I hope. That is a position that is shared by my colleagues. Action, not just. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings, and then Vice Mayor Watson. I did have a question because I brought this up when, and I know this is probably not related, but it is a matter of process. Um, because my understanding earlier was that we set out some guidelines for the process. And a motion was made during the question before this got before we got the different comment. And I'm just trying to understand how we're going to move forward because we just had a conversation about process. Everybody said they were supportive of that process, part of which my understanding to make motions after we public. But motion was made during question honored. So I'd like to have some clarification because we have a lot of items that we're going to be hearing today, and some of which are very controversial. And I think that it's going to lead to further conflict. Don't get that under wraps. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, right now, we I would like to keep this discussion uh, focused to the motion that have a first and a second, and then um, discussion on the motion, and then we can have a vote, and then we can um, uh, ask a question of process. I will, I'm prepared to make a substitute motion. And that motion will be to um, adopt the resolution declaring the city council's intent regarding the use of potential revenues generated by Measure F, sales tax, tax ballot item on the June 2022 California statewide primary election with the following language included that was submitted to the county clerk for the city clerk. I will go ahead and second that motion. We have a substitute motion on the floor by Council Member Cummings. That's 
still wanted to make some comments. Say that again? I wanted to still make some comments. And a second by council member. Okay, and um, before I move on, hands raised, saying you want to make comments. Okay, go ahead, council member coming. Yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, again, when members of subcommittees, and I guess more, more importantly, the Brown Act really restricts us from being able to speak with one another, be able to incorporate all the um, things that council members want to see, depending on what items for us. And at the last meeting, um, when it was clear that um, when the subcommittee would be taking this up, I think there were a few comments that were made, but it was also made clear that when this item came before council, we would be able to provide other uh, resolutions. And, um, when the members of the public had an opportunity to see this after it was posted on Thursday, members of the public began reaching out. And that's also the only opportunity that the public has to see what was conducted um, by the subcommittee, private meeting. And as a result, we'll have what they want to have. In addition to that, some of the conversations I had had with members of the public were that there was a lot of a lot of what was stated was very vague, and people wanted to see examples of you know when the city said, council says mitigating the impacts of homelessness. What does that actually mean? Because we've been trying to mitigate the impacts of homelessness for a decade or more, and a lot of people see that money is being spent or in the situation is getting worse. So part of this was really give examples of when we're saying. How this is spent, we can have clear examples of what we mean by that. And um, you know, many of these additions actually fit really well with you know, what we want to see in our community: workforce development, mitigating our impacts to climate, not just fire, climate change in general. Um, that we're creating, maintaining facilities for all of our residents, and that we're supporting services that our city provides. Uh, service. So. I don't think this is a very far departure from what has been proposed, but I think it also does reflect more of what we've been hearing from the community on what the community and again, non-binding. Um, it's really uh, symbolic of where we are as a city and where we stand. And so that is the intent of um, this motion and this language. Vice Mayor Watson. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor. I I was just going to say I think that what I read in terms of the potential proposed substitute motion is pretty duplicative of what's written in the resolution. And given what Councilmember Cummings just said, and that we have a lot of items that are big items for us, and we're already a half hour later than usual um, in terms of the planned time for the consent. I didn't think it was the best use of time, given that we were kind of using the opportunity to really reconcile a lot of the same statements. Um, therefore, I, I'm prepared to just move forward with the recommendation as opposed to trying to wordsmith kind of what I see as overlap, significant overlap in terms of the language. Um, so I, I guess I'll just, I'll leave it there um, in the interest of time. Council Member Myers. I would just like to apologize to my colleagues. I'm again learning the, the new process here. Um, I should not have made the um, and but Jen, I'm able, happy to look at amendments offered, but I do talk at the end of the description really is quite um, broad. Risk, uh, you know, moving into uh, a different type of measure if we get too specific. Um, so, just keeping that in mind. But I do apologize to my colleague. Reading, reading your procedures and shape. So, just wanted to. Not my. 
also was trying to continue items. Of Ms. Mayor Watkins? Yeah, I just had a quick question in terms of the um, statement that Councilmember Myers brought up in terms of the specificity. And I know, uh, Tony, you shared that you hadn't had a chance to, I think if I remember correctly, you shared you didn't have a chance to fully look at all of the language, if that's correct. I mean, I, I don't, I wanted to know if you wanted to weigh in on that in terms of the legality and the specificity component, or if it matters. I think I was referring to the other item, the oh. uh, the, the 57 year uh, oh. term versus um, in perpetuity for the affordability covenant. Okay. Did you um, have, did I did you review. That's the next item. I did review the language uh, proposed by Council Member Cummings uh, from a legal perspective. It, you know, it's it's not. Um, it doesn't raise any legal concerns. Uh, it's really more of a policy discussion for the. I guess another potential uh, solution could be for the revenue committee to reconcile the recommendations and bring forward a more clear resolution at the next potential agenda. I mean, if we wanted to get it written right, because a lot of it's really duplicative, in my opinion. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we have. Uh, Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thanks. Um, yeah, just what Vice Mayor Watt just um, expressed, I would be interested in that because uh, the language that Council member Cummings brought forward um, on the surface looks good. I don't want to, that was my question earlier is what are the implications? I just want to make sure that we're not um, doing anything that would harm this measure or our resolution intent. So if, it, if the subcommittee were open to reviewing and diving deep, making sure it's clean and clear and there's nothing duplicative and nothing that would impact negatively the sales tax measure, I, I would really be in support of that because I'd like to um, integrate what Council Member Cummings has brought forward. But I just, you guys have done a lot of work. I haven't. It's an item that I've um, gone in depth as much as you have. So I would be in favor of that if that were... Um, acceptable by council members Cummings and Brown. Okay, everyone's had a chance to speak and we have a motion on the floor. We can go ahead and vote. So may I have a roll call okay. vote? Yeah, we have a... yes? I, I'm just hearing that in another way this so but if vote on it and we're going to go down that road of voting and dragging this out or if there's agreement to try to work this out and back that the, I'm trying to the council member Brown uh, is there a staff recommendation I, I think the question, Mayor, would be whether the maker of the substitute motion and the maker of the second would accept the suggestion made by Council Member Watkins as a friendly amendment. I'm going to also clarify here. Mayor. I can't hear you. Hear me? Now I can. But I just wanted to clarify, uh, Mr. Bruner, and I think as well. The action in front of you right now is substitute motion. And Councilmember Cummings make a, a change in that substitute motion based on what's being suggested. If you want. Great. A roll we'll call vote that and friendly and following that. I, that I, way I, you only. I mean, I, 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 I think. I, I thought I saw Councilmember Cummings nodding in the affirmative as to whether or not he would consider uh, Councilmember Watkins' suggestion a friendly amendment. 
the amendment would be to refer the language proposed by council member Cummings back to the revenue committee to incorporate as appropriate um, based on further analysis and input from council and members of the board. Council member Cummings as the maker of the motion to I'm, well, I'm willing to accept that, but I would like to hear from the subcommittee members or thumbs up if that's what they would want to do. Yeah, that means we're all going to have to meet again and you and back. Um, just wanting to see whether or not the, sub, if they're, the subcommittee is open and willing to do that. I don't see what, what we should hold up. I didn't understand the comment by council member Watkins as as that as that the resolution would come back before the council. So I, I just think clarify. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm flexible here at this point. I think we can either take it back to the revenue that so the language is actually matching and cohesive, or I'm, I'm personally just fine with moving forward with the original language at this point, to be quite honest with you. It could come back. It doesn't necessarily need to. I don't know procedurally what that looks like, Tony. Um, but I think the intention is there broadly in the first one. I think it, there's nuances that are overlapping, so I wouldn't feel comfortable passing one that doesn't necessarily feel like it's written properly, and I don't know if we want to dive into anything at this moment. Therefore, I was suggesting that we could bring it to the revenue committee for, you know, um, reconciliation. But does that then not need to come back, Tony? Is that what you're saying? It would not need to come back if that's the direction. If that's the comfort of the council, then I'm fine with that coming back. We meet anyways as a revenue committee, so we could take care of it at that level. And the revenue committee, I'll just add, is Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Watkins, and myself. So, Council Member Cummings. I just have a follow up question then. Um, if this isn't going to come back to Council, then my question is how will the members of the public know what that final, um, that the final language will be? Because my understanding is that. The language can then be changed by the sub, or is that not? If that's the intent, if that's the direction of the council, then the resolution should be adopted, subject to further refinement by the sub. And I guess my clarification is: what what can then the, the what can the subcommittee, I guess, do then in terms of the language because. I think what concerns I'm hearing is that you know, people want to see included, and if we send it back to the subcommittee, it's not going back to council, then the public really doesn't know what's what has it. And it's not clear whether or not the council full agreement changes will be made. Council. I mean, given that concern, I guess I would just recommend that council move forward with the motion as framed and. It doesn't sound like the suggestion was was recognized as a friendly amendment. I just want to better understand. I just wanted to be clear in the process of what the expectations are. That's all I'm asking. So if the if the language was accepted as a friendly amendment, then the subcommittee could refine and make changes to the language of the resolution or not. And once that's done, then the resolution is a matter of public record, uh, just like any resolution adopted by the city. Right now, the question. Right now, the question, right, the, count, the question before the council is whether to accept the substitute motion. If it is accepted, then we go ahead and vote on the substitute motion. If it's not, um, there's the main motion or the original motion that's on the floor as well. I accept to the main friendly amendments. To the Substitute motion is on the floor right now. Okay. So, I'm happy. Go ahead, Council Member Cumming. I was going to say that. Um, 
I'm happy to accept the friendly amendment. Um, the understanding that the final language was sent to the members of the city council and made public. And we'll see. I mean, I think that heard from members of the public. We understand the intent of the new language. Um, and you know, I think that we'll see what happens, I guess. But I, you know, if it's dramatically different, then I think there's going to be issues that are raised because um, these are things that have come to my attention and uh, by members of the public. They want to have included in what, again, with non binding resolution. And um, should a lot of this not be included, I think that um, it will definitely further mistrust our community with our local government and could negatively impact revenue measure um, if it is seen that um, this goes to a subcommittee and stripped of a lot of the language, which again is non binding, but is really reflective of our intent to support various services. Uh, Mayor, given those comments and kind of um, sort of ambiguity of this process, I'm going to go ahead and withdraw my friendly amendment and we could just take the vote and move. How about that? Thank you. And I just wanted to give the city clerk, uh, I have your hand up and make sure. Give you an opportunity. Thank you. I did, but my question goes away with Vice Mayor Watkins drawing her friendly amendment, so thank you. Okay, so at this point, we have a substitute motion on Council Member Cummings, second Council Member Brown, um, and we'll do a roll call vote to accept the substitution. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Holder is absent coming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. What? Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. No. And Mayor Bruno. No. Okay. So now we uh, have a motion uh, on the floor. The original. Motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. My motion is that since Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Watkins. Yes, okay. My understanding the vice mayor's friendly amendment is to provide the committee to take another look at off. Um, I don't agree with some of the language. I don't, I think it does commit us to certain things that are by the I say that which is um, so I would Except Vice Mayor Watkins, if you get resolution committee to some of the events in that. I mean, I'm not trying to kill any any of the intent of some of the things brought up in that language, I'm trying to understand the process. Maintain similar amendment on this motion, I get revenue back in this. My question is for the city attorney, which is uh, whether those changes would still have back, uh, action being taken. Resolution 10 out of public. Things that possible resolution also have turns up similar conversation in two weeks. So I think uh, the I think the friendly amendment would be to 
refer the resolution back to the revenue committee to for the limited purpose of considering the additional language proposed by council member Cummings. And if that's uh, the direction of the council, uh, once that uh, analysis and, and any revisions are made, then that uh, I heard council member Cummings uh, suggestion be that once that's finalized, that the resolution be distributed to the full council. It would not have to come back for further council action, uh, but it would be distributed to the full council for, uh, as an information item, it would be available to the member of the members of the public and council members could further disseminate resolution to their respective uh, constituents. Mayor, I think the only to have that amendment added and back. I don't think procedurally back and debating this again doesn't have to try to get this resource really explained to our so Vice Mayor otherwise I mean, I, as originally stated, I'm happy to have that conversation and to, to do the reconciliation. What gave me pause was that if it didn't come back to the full council to approve or didn't necessarily meet a criteria that Council Member Cummings wanted it to be met, then he wouldn't be pleased and there would be community upset. So my concern was a process, essentially saying if we don't meet an expectation, then what? So if it's not coming back for the full council to approve, even if it is a reconciliation of, of language, <laughs> then are we setting ourselves up if something that isn't in there or written the way it was wanted to be written that would lead us to a, a challenging situation? So therefore I would prove the amendment and, and that was my rationale. We do have a special meeting next day on, um, that is Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think just to have Venus to pay to proceed and, and get this, okay, go ahead without any. I will say to my colleague, revenue issues, you know, are real. Um, it's very important. They all really pull together. And that staff um this is a really pivotal and question and i'm going to not leveraging thing over the other that we realize this is Source that's really pivotal across any category. Going on. So, if you want to just make that comment, happy. Uh, and so for clarity um motion is maintained as as originally stated and vice mayor watkins the seconder of the motion and uh we're now ready for a roll call vote although i i see a hand up council member coming Just wanted to say to the members of the public that I appreciate them reaching out and um, come to, to address their concerns. And I'm um, going to support the motion because I still, you know, um, agree with the some with the, what's included in the resolution of intent, but I think we should be doing more. Um, that being said, um, I think it's important for members of the public to doubt they have and express their concerns to us. I do feel that um, a lot of city workers watching 
Um, and there's a lot of community members that are watching this, um, maybe feeling let down by um, not including them, especially since we've been saying for these past few years that we're all in this together. So, um, you know, moving forward, hope there ways we continue to support um, our workers, you know, climate action goals, um, support programs that address mental, behavioral health, substance abuse, safe sleeping, safe parking, um, and that we're really, you know, looking out for all our residents. So um, I'm going to still support that recommendation. My, um, what I was trying to do was attempt to include concern, additional concerns raised after the report was released. Um, but look forward to working with the community to see how we can to address some of the major challenges and also support our workers. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, okay, City Clerk, we have a roll call vote. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Sir? Absent. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes unanimous. Uh, we will now continue with the other pulled item from Dan. Item number uh, 16, I believe. Yes, 16. And this was pulled by Council Member Cummings loan consolidation and affordability term extension for Sycamore Street Commons and Ophaya Residential. Yeah, so for members of the public who are just tuning in, um, after our discussion, it appeared that there is potential for discussion between staff, Mercy Housing, and relevant stakeholders to determine whether or not housing um, affordability term can be made in perpetuity. And so um, the additional language, I sent it to Bonnie, and so Bonnie can put it up um, so that members of the public and the council can see this as we move into public, uh, as we move into the public comment period, um, but was to adopt staff's recommendation and then also direct staff to work with Mercy Housing, relevant stakeholders to determine whether the affordability term be extended in perpetuity and second item for council consideration at a meeting. So, you know, I think that one of the things that I've heard since being on the council is that the only way to maintain affordable housing in our community is to make sure that it's restricted. And this is an opportunity where we can um, secure units in perpetuity to be affordable for our community. And there's the opportunity for a conversation around that. I think that it would be great. And in the communities, I think the community would be on board with us having this discussion and um, you know, possibly making sure that those units are restricted uh, in So I'll just stop there. I know that this needs to go out to the public before any motions are made. And thank you for uh, that. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Is, uh, the attorney, did you have a comment on that? Addition. Uh, it, it can wait until the mo uh, okay. council considers motion language. Just have a minor clarification request. Okay, thank you. Um, so, are there questions? I have Jessica DeWitt with staff and Council Member Meyer. Um, and then I will go out to public comment. Hey, council Member Myers? I just had a question for staff, um, and I don't want to bring up. Uh, their item on the, uh, but I the that this was a hundred percent for I see reference to that in materials in the past property. Just want to make sure that not us eating some. Yeah, 
Jessica DeWitt? Yeah, so to confirm, this is 100% deed restricted affordable at, at both of these properties. We're trying, we're working to extend that affordability. And just to respond to Councilmember Cummings' um, motion, so we we are barreling down a tax credit deadline, affordable housing tax credit deadline. Um, and I think uh, Becky is still on the line from Mercy Housing and can speak to this, but I think we prefer to address that affordability now um, to be able to make sure that we don't lose the very uh, majority of funding that we need to be able to make this rehab happen um, and keep these units affordable and in good condition. Um, so I, I don't know if that, Becky's still around, but um, just that is something that we would like to, if, if possible, uh, address now versus in a future meeting, just because of this tax credit. Right. I'll respond really quickly because I don't want there to be any. The idea is that we move forward with the staff recommendation. And so you all can go ahead, get your tax credit, we'll you know, have the 57 year date. But it sounded like from the discussion that was had earlier that um, the time frame right now that is being extended is for 57 years. And it sounded like in the previous conversation it could be the potential for that rather than it being 57 years that it's duty. So the direction here is move forward and let's hear the affordable housing. If there's an opportunity to have that conversation, that staff can have that conversation, see whether or not and forward having that affordable in perpetuity and then bring back. That. Um, so this is in no way trying to stop what you all are doing. It's really trying to give you the support that you need to move forward with the item that's before us, but then also have those conversations if there's a potential that we could make this interesting. That was um, my clarification question as well. Um, Jessica, did, um, did, does that clarify? Yeah, if I'm understanding correctly, move forward with this tax credit funding deadline but continue discussions on making these all 100% of these units affordable in perpetuity. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, council member. I'm good. Yeah. Are the units in the in this both of the properties now currently? They are, right? Alone. Yeah. Seven years has to do with that is a marker on the loan, not restriction of I mean, I'm just trying to understand what I take that question. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so. Councilmember Myers, the affordability period is also concurrent with the loan agreement period. So tax credits, the way the tax credit agreement works is that it's, it's a loan for that period of time, but also a regulatory period for that period of time as well. There are, I can honestly say, I think 37, 38 um, items on title here. So that's those are all agreements that are showing up on title that we are working our way diligently through um, that have several regulatory agreements and conditions. And so we are doing our best to combine everything. And like I said, we are moving towards trying to get to affordability and perpetuity for 100%. Thank you for that. Council Member Cummings, Brown. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to indicate that back far as first housing does have up uh, now so um wanted to add it. thank you uh okay so becky flores first housing go ahead and unmute yourself thank you mayor bruner and council member brown um uh as was brought up uh, by Ms. Witt, we are um, 
having to take into consideration the closing on the tax credit finance for this project. And I uh, just want to be clear then um, that direction is that we could potentially take action today, as was suggested um, by Council Member Cummings, and that the in perpetuity could happen post closing. I know it could happen later, but you're okay with post closing. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to confirm. Appreciate it. Member Kellen Curry Johnson. Thank you. I, I'm not clear how Bo's motion is different from what is happening already with Jesse and with staff. If somebody could clarify, it sounds like this is all, this is the work. So I'm just somebody from staff. Is this happening? I mean, what I heard from Jessica is that that we are working to make the units 100% affordable in perpetuity. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak here. Um, yeah, yes. Go ahead. Please, um, sorry. Thank Jessica, you. please. Jessica, do it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, so we are working with the developer Mercy Housing on, again, it's just trying to um, work to get to this tax credit deadline and also sort through all of these 38 agreements at the same time, just the history of this. This is back into the 90s, I think. Um, so just trying to sort through what, who's on the hook for what and how can we move forward with, you know, 100% affordable and yes, extend the affordability and perpetuity um, if we can get every lender on board with doing that. So essentially this uh, direction motion language is solidifying what you're currently working on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, it looks like we have one more question. Council, no. I'm going to take item 16 out to public comment. At this time, we have item 16 on our consent agenda, which is old. Uh, let's see, any public comment on item 16? Not seeing any. So I will come back. To uh, okay. bring it back. Okay. Um, so we have a, uh, a council member coming. Yeah, so I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. And then in addition to that, um, provide the additional direction, direct staff. We can even say support staff, work with Mercy Housing and relevant stakeholders, determine whether the affordability term can be extended in perpetuity and bring back an item for council consideration. And uh, Council Member Brown. I'll second that and uh, just want to say that while this may be redundant, it some council members, I what what I heard in the discussion, what I heard the housing representative that an indication from the council that that is a commitment we have um, is meaningful, and so I'm very happy to just second this. Cool. Member Brown. And um, uh, clerk, Bonnie Bush. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, Council Member Cummings, are you going with direct or support? You're muted. Um, I mean, it seems like the direction staff's already moving in that direction, so support. Um, and thank you so much, 
uh, Jessica DeWitt, and thank you so much um, to uh, Mercy Becky Flores at Mercy Housing for your comments and for your work. And I do echo uh, Council Member Brown's comment that um, this uh, emphasis from uh, our city council direction and um, it weighs a lot. So thank you. And so we'll go for a roll call vote on this motion. Uh, council member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Member is absent. Council member Cumming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor Bruner. Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Holder absent. Okay, that concludes our consent agenda. Did it. <laughs> and um, before we continue with uh, our next items, I would like to call a uh, short break and we will turn at four o'clock. Ready? Yes, thank you. Okay, so welcome back. Members of the public for joining us are uh, resuming our agenda. We just concluded our agenda and uh, next up is a uh, consent public hearing these items are 23 and 24 on our agenda for members of the public for streaming this meeting if you would like to comment on, on items 23 24 now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is held by a council member session. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any item? For the council members, council member King. Like to pull item number twenty-four. Pull item. Okay. So I will now then uh, call for questions or comments. Um, council item council members on items not pulled. So that would be item number four. Any questions? Sorry, Mayor. Item 23. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Item number 23, we will have uh, comments or questions from Council Members before I go out to public comment. Okay. So at this time, I will go out to public comment for item number 23. And I will put hands raised. Raise your hand, press star nine or select hand on the webinar controls of your not seeing any trees. So we'll come back to the 
Okay. So we're coming back to council. Uh, council member Myers. I was just gonna. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I I meet uh, council member Watkins. I'm just gonna move. Okay, we have a first by Council Member Myers, item 23, and a second. I'll go ahead and second that. By Vice Chair Watkins. Any further discussion by Council Members? Okay, uh, City Clerk, may we have a roll call vote? Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Sir. Honey? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Britt? Aye. Motion passes unanimously with Council Member Holder absent. And now we will move to uh, item 24. This item was pulled by Council Member Cumming. Council Member Cummings. Hey, Mayor, members of the public, um, item is Ordinance of Santa Cruz, uh, repealing Chapter 5.81 Santa Cruz Municipal Code and adding Chapter 5.8 Sidewalk Bending Santa Cruz Municipal Code. Um, this item came to us at the last city council meeting. And since then, uh, I've received um, some letters of concern. Um, Mayor Bruner and I, in our break earlier, actually, we're, we're both um, approached by a member of the public who had some concerns about this item and um, wanting to address those concerns. Um, had a couple questions for staff. I also um, had some legal questions to ask uh, regarding uh, the prohibition of vending in the area. And so, wanted to ask those questions as well because. Um, Part of the intent of uh, last that um, in the motion I made was to provide us some legal coverage well area prohibit explicitly vending in the beach area. There is a potential, I believe, and members of the public also agree, there might be uh, the potential that the city could get sued and then lose in that lawsuit. So um, the first questions, one of what the member of the public who we um, engaged with earlier today brought up was really around the downtown uh, Pacific Avenue uh, street vending. One of the things that that member of the public brought up is that um, one, some of the spaces are really small. Um, and so it would be great to get clarity around spaces and the size of those spaces. Um, what the member of the public expressed was that um, you know, for many of the, for many sidewalk vendors, they need tables Space where they can put their merchandise. Some of these um, areas to then are really small. Not only that, but some of the areas that have been marked with little brass kind of markers, a lot of those markers have been moved. Um, it was not clear where those vending zones are. And so it really expressed you know, frustration around um, making sure that we have a lot of um, issues resolved before um, making any, taking any action on this. So I'm just wondering. As a first step, if staff can maybe um, address those concerns around uh, the Pacific Avenue vending and marking of spaces, sizes of those spaces, there's a map that maybe we could have displayed to show where vending occur. I think that might be helpful for members of the public to see. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I think I will bring your your question regarding um, the markers. Uh, our city staff will. Smith, who has been working on this item, has. Sure. Um, we, uh, I think I've heard from the same uh, individual. And, um, and so uh, we have an implementation team that's working on a number of fronts to, um, to map out an implementation plan for the ordinance. Um, one of those uh, areas is around Pacific Avenue, um, environmental changes writ large. So, Kind of signage to 
to make sure that it's clear what the regulations are. How do we demarcate spaces on Pacific Avenue in a way that is clear and manageable from both the vendor standpoint and also our code client um, staff's perspective, make it easy for them, for everybody to understand what the rules are. And so um, the medallions are on our list to talk about and replace. We have some that we can replace for the ones that were taken, but then also looking at are we numbering spaces? How are we doing the permitting process? And so that's all new. And so it'll, it, it's in development right now. So um, as we go through the planning process, we've got some folks working on the permitting process and how, how that rolls out and really thinking about that, nuts, environmental changes, how are we um, working with our code compliance and CSOs to help uh, vendors um, adhere to the regulations. And then most importantly, all of this will be wrapped up in an engagement and outreach a bilingual um, engagement and outreach um, campaign um, that will occur over the next 30 days should the council pass the ordinance. So, um, so I appreciate the concerns that are coming in about specific ideas. I had a conversation just this week with a member um, who works in the Spanish language area and they really emphasized the digital divide and how we needed to be thinking about equity and the digital divide. And so that's a new element that I'll be bringing back. Um, so the more um, input we get, areas where we need to be paying attention in the implementation plan, that's great. Have, feel free to send them my way. And I guess just a brief follow-up question, maybe this is for the city attorney. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of enforcement, sounds like there's a lot of work still needs to be done in terms of kind of rolling out permitting and all these other provisions that are tied to this ordinance. And I'm just curious, how will the, will the city be able to enforce this without those programs being stood up? Or will the, the programs be stood up before the ordinance be enforced? Because I think that a lot of members of the public, well, the ones that we've heard from have Express their concern with not being ready in this time frame, and then you know we move forward with enforcement before people can actually have access to permit sites and all those other all the other things that are important for being able to make sure that people are compliant. So, I was wondering if you could speak to that. In in general, um, I think that it will take some time for the staff to implement the enforcement uh, and permitting scheme. Um, but I would ask my uh, deputy city attorney, Cassie Johnson, to weigh in as she's been working more closely with the staff on the implementation uh, aspects of the ordinance. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I think that there is no plan to start enforcement. In, like, it's all one package, and I'm, you know, Elizabeth has been doing a really great job in um, you know, getting all of the staff on the same team and make sure that we are doing this way. So, you know, I believe that the plan is, you know, start the enforcement when the whole thing is rolled out, when, when the, you know, all the permitting and all that environmental changes are rolled out. I guess, I guess the follow-up then to that is, what does the timeline kind of look like? I mean, I know that staff have a lot of things that are going on and um, we're just kind of curious what that timeline is looking like, and then what's the plan for kind of outreach um, to let people know, like we have everything in place. We're going to start enforcing on. Sure. Um, we're meeting this Thursday, where folks are bringing me their draft application for each areas that I outlined all of the major categories of work, um, and so we'll be pulling those together, and I can um, give you a more specific answer today. Um, but we are working toward the May 12th timeline, which is if you pass the ordinance today, then it would be in effect, I guess, May 13th. Like, <laughs> technically, 30 days after. 30 days. And so um, so we have a month that we're working toward um, for that. Um, there are a number of systems in place that are being adapted to, um, to manage the so this isn't a wholesale creation 
task. It's a it's a evolution of, of current system. So um, code, code compliance has already been out, uh, letting vendors know about the ordinance, about what's included in the ordinance, and that you all are hearing it as a second reading. Um, they will, if it is passed today, have a flyer that we will be sending out with Friday. Um, and as you recall, um, the what, what you passed when at the last council meeting was um, allowing for some additional hours and additional investment through the code. So they're going to be on the ground, people both out on the street and in on Pacific Avenue um, to make sure that folks know 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 what's going on, and then. Um, all of the channels at our disposal, including text message, which we have heard is an, an integral, particularly with. So, thinking about equity in our communications, thinking about bilingual, um, bilingual communication, and um, and really trying to be comprehensive in how we roll that um, over the next. And as Cassie said, you know, we'll, we'll uh, enforcement will begin when it's equitable. Again, um, the. Thank you. I had um, more questions, but I've asked three. So, Mayor, nobody else has any other questions. That's my last two questions. I'm happy to do so, but I want to acknowledge what's laid out in terms of the process. I've asked questions. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, Elizabeth, the next question I had related to the spacing. Um, is there any update on what the spacing is, is going to be in the downtown? Because I'm not familiar with the current sizes of those spaces, but what the vendor was explaining was that, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes they may need a, a four by six table or they may need two. And some of the spaces that are designated might not be correct size for that. And so it's something for us to consider um, the sizes of the spaces. Um, wondering the size of the spaces that we have and located. Sure. Um, may I share my screen? I'll share with you a, a map of the current of the existing rubric for the space. Um, and as you can see, there are some larger spaces at the top of Pacific Avenue, and then some smaller spaces as you go down. Um, I will be meeting with. Um, uh, council member Cummings, I also sent this to you, so if you'd like to share it with any of your constituents. Um, this is this is the former rubric. I'm going to be meeting with our economic uh, economic development and public works colleagues about what does it look like in the new iteration, um, especially given that we are um, likely going to be implementing or will be implementing a reservation system for the, with the park. And so um, and so it's uh, it's TBD, but this is the basic rubric that we're starting. So um, I think that uh, sidewalk vending by its nature has a smaller footprint than a retail establishment or that a bricks and mortar store. So um, we'll have to keep in mind um, egress, the ability for um, our fire personnel to get in and you know, in the case of an emergency, and also the traffic flows on Pacific Avenue, um, as, because as we know, that is that is a concern that we have to worry about, particularly in our busiest. And the reason behind moving toward reserved spaces is make sure that the health and safety of folks in the downtown is. Just for clarification, in one thing that wasn't answered was the size of those spaces. You know, I don't have an answer for that. I know that there are. As I mentioned, the, by the dots, there are two larger ones. Um, and then what I can do is get back to you once I've had a chance to do um, with my colleague in economic development, the parks who have really been leading this, this in the past. And so we'll be meeting from that. Thanks. Yeah. In case we need to bring this back and um, you know, take into consideration that some of these. Some of these locations are really small and we're meant for more like busking versus you know, actual street vending. We need to reevaluate size spaces. Like, so, take up. 
So I'll definitely take a look at it and would have to, have to follow it up with you all. And then the, the legal question I had was that, um, you know, it, with regards to Beach Street, um, it's not clear that prohibition on Beach Street and the beach areas to elect is directly related to public health and safety. I think what I've been hearing is that the perception is that it's more to support the businesses that are currently there. And I know last time there was mention from some business owners that they understood the issue on equity and potentially having to have some spending in the beach area. But um, I'm really concerned because, you know, when we first moved forward with um, this pending ordinance item, the city had moved eight okay. special area where pending could occur. That area, we created the program, and the biggest issue was um, there was no enforcement. So the city has been able to demonstrate that we are able to actually oh, no. create a that already the beach area and if we're going to prohibit it outright audio. my concern is and that dude, because we've been able to demonstrate we can do it there by prohibiting it outright we're actually not public health and safety and instead prohibiting it area because of um because it's a preference of um, members of the council or it's a preference yeah. i'm wondering if the city attorney could weigh in because you know, if we're moving forward with this you know, prohibit vending or vending in the beach area, we could be putting ourselves in a very um, legally liable position and uh, can end up actually spending more tax dollars trying to defend this or settle this oh, or they even get sued and then lose money and have to allow it anyway. So I'm wondering if the attorney could possibly on our, the direction that we're heading in and potential for. Um, as like being that. legally liable for violating the law. So, um, yes, uh, thank you, Councilmember Cummings, for your question. Uh, I, I think the important thing to keep in mind with regard to the, the statute that resulted in this ordinance being brought forward is that in order to restrict sidewalk vending in a particular area, it is necessary to identify a legitimate public health safety basis upon which to do so. And that's why um, these uh, these restrictions will apply on a very limited basis in areas throughout the city. And Beach Street in particular was identified as having extraordinarily heavy traffic uh, during busy summer and weekend uh, and holiday uh, times. Um, and, and it was a staff judgment that, uh, in fact, uh, a, a flat prohibition um, would be in furtherance of public health and safety. Um, there, there is, with, as with any legislative action that is taken by the council, the risk of litigation, and we're not able to predict the outcome of that with any degree of certainty. Um, so I do think the, the more uh, lax uh, the, the ordinance is with regard to regulations, the less likely it is to be challenged um, based on sidewalk vending. But I think there are also other risks that alternatives raise with respect to potential dangerous condition liability and other potential liabilities. So it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where this spot is with respect to how to appropriately regulate um, these items. I think we've had the experience just in the past week of you know, some health and safety issues that have arisen with respect to beach vending um, in, a, in a rather unfortunate incident that occurred down there last week. And so, um, you know, what, what's the, you know, where, where does a court draw the line? We don't really have enough experience in implementing the, the, the new state law to really have clear guidance on that. Thanks. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, I just wanted to um, also uh, bring up a couple of concern questions. Um, and if Elizabeth Smith is still available. Um, so thank you so much. Um, 
concern from a member of the public um, regarding um, the spaces at, along the avenue and um, uh, concern that there would not be large enough to accommodate two people, six foot people. So it sounds like there's an assessment that will be um, assessing all of those old proper uh, demarcation spaces and um, um, taking into account those concerns to find larger of equitable, equitable access to large schools and um, smaller schools, that there's a possibility perhaps of uh, creating some larger spaces. Right now, it looks like two uh, large, um, seven small spaces. And so, um, would that be part of the assessment of uh, the, the long avenue that the will look at? Um, it is not something that was on our list, before, but based on council member concerns and the look at something that I'll bring. And we'll look at it as a part of the implementation work. Also, you know, just balancing. I want to clear we have to balance the sort of health and safety impacts of large, uh, large um, tabling areas on the traffic flow on Pacific Avenue and the busiest. Of so it's making sure that we're balancing all of those impacts. But absolutely, we will take a look and see if there's the possibility of um, additional large space. Great, thank you. And then the second part to that question was the reservation system. Um, uh, how the, I know it's still in implementation stage, and all of the operations will be forthcoming as we are analyzed and worked through. Um, but turn over fighting over the the larger more vendors and not having type of vendor conflict such as the experience on space. Um, there was that concern that was brought up as well. And so, um, you know, uh, wondering if, if we can look at how that reservation is equitable as as possible, um, and and it's free, right? The reservation, aside, I'm, I'm, and the permit is thirty dollars. Permit is thirty dollars, and then uh, the parks team is working on what what the what the would be for the, which is what would be required for the reservation. Okay, any other questions from council members? At this time, I will take this item out to public comment. This is item number 24 on our public screen. And um, there are any members of the public that would like to speak? Now is the time to go. Raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting and the webinar. It's your turn to speak. You will hear an announcement that has been muted. The timer will then be set. And we did have one request for extra time from a group, uh, Huff, Robert Norse, and um, Let's see if um, phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and unmute yourself. So um, I'm representing Huff. I'm Robert North, and it's Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. We've been concerned about the impact of this law for people who are both patrons of vendors or also maybe vendors themselves. Uh, the city manager can have a negative impact on not just those who spend most of their lives outside and rely on access to public spaces, 
this, I think, comes from the staff management. Uh, and I'm concerned that it's being, well, my concerns, I guess, itemized. Uh, it's mainly the destruction of a vibrant street scene that have negative impacts on the entire community. It will discourage visitors seeking legendary, but increasingly less accurately described, versus used to characterize our downtown our city. Uh, this expands bending your law and display device restrictions to folks moving around so that someone hawking their poetry or other work on a bike would be required to register, pay, and regulate themselves according to unnecessary and burdensome requirements. It will seriously discourage colorful street life to the detriment of the broader community. Visitors who come to the truth experience that brick and mortar business share in the profits generated by the appeal of the ones that are street. street vendors will be boxed in, massively regulated, while merchants send their domain to the public space sidewalks. Yeah. Happening in the COVID era, seeing that seizure of public space. I'm particularly concerned about the exclusionary impact this ordinance have if enforced again on homeless and low-income people whose living space is now undergoing massive shrinkage. Hundreds yeah. illegally ousted survival camps and reportedly given a July eviction date in the bench lands where they've been directed to go, but of course they have nowhere to go after that. So it's going to be the streets served by minority vendors, often cheaper than corporate sellers where homeless folks see. The ordinance also calls for a return to many of the anti-homeless downtown ordinance impressive tax. Uh, it bans vendors, petitioners, anyone with a table asking money for anything with no apparent First Amendment exception, except in the disc outline box, adding the requirement of permits downtown. Half a million was authorized last month for enforcement and 200,000 as part of the budget. Why? 18 pages of ordinance. Why? What's the problem currently? Give the staff, staff juicier job? Get enforcement officers busy? Where are the police stats? indicating substantial problems. We know that city police shut down vending on Bench Street many months ago, siding with a merchant who assaulted a vendor. So it sounds a bit like a racist attack on Latino vendors and a class blow at lower income people. Perhaps a punch in the pusser to a poor person spreading out their books on a blanket and trying to sell trade or give them away. Or a way of sanitizing Pacific Avenue of handicraft vendors who the Robinson Terrazas councils were able to drive out of sight and fictions of this sort. The city's fail failed to adjudicate an issue that was the assault upon a taco vendor's push cart. They didn't, they didn't hold the merchant responsible. Instead, they moved to ban street vendors without permits and uphold this monopoly of brick and mortar stores. This is a strangle the street vendor's ordinance. Clearly limits street vending, reinstitutes stay-in-your-box space restrictions, can, but two on Pacific Avenue, and award special interest legislation for brick and mortar stores. This is a return to the old regime. What can people do about it? Of course, question. Since you won't, you will simply rubber stamp. It. We can object to police enforcement of this law when it happens. We can raise our voices in public forums where we'll actually be heard, rather than sidelined in celluloid void we're in now. And, of course, I should point out to the, as I have already to the city clerk, that half the dialogue on community TV of the Santa Cruz City Council has not been audible. It's jerky and it's cut off. You can't really understand what's being said. So this was primarily a measure to overcome SB 946, which became law in 2019, which allowed for commercial sidewalk vending and limited City Council's abilities to restrict sidewalk vending. This is the City Council striking back on behalf of merchants. And I think it does a detriment to the homeless community and the house vote. And thanks to everybody for listening. For your comment, the next caller with their hand raised has a phone number ending in 177. Hello. Hello, my name is Guillermina Garcia. I'm a street vendor on Beach Street, and uh, 
I'm really nervous right now because first time speaking up by myself. Um, I hope uh, you guys understand me and uh, can hear me well. Okay, my my first comment is that I'm a vendor that went into the rope and, and went one of the spaces that were food. So it took time for me to get the help from me. By 2021, on October, I got my help from me. Uh, also, I have liability insurance. Also, I have a business license and that's an excuse for me. I wear a tag a lot of times for other vendors already. I didn't work 2021 because I I were scared that other other vendors then lend, let me get any uh, really small space to sell. But right now I came on uh, on the second of April, first time, and I see an open space on on by here by Beach Street. I set up my staff. I set up my table so I can bring my car, my fruit car, that already has all the permits. And I set up. This guy came to me and asked me for that space that that belongs to to him. He told me that I need to move my space, my things because that that space belongs to him. And he said, "Are we with me?" That's the time when my husband came and asked him, him what was the problem, and he told. Me that we need to move. I were I were I were pretty scared because we already been in the fight and I don't wanna be no more in the fight. So he started fighting with my husband and all his uh co workers you know, his workers because his name is Dorian Rodriguez. He has less, like twenty spaces, more than working for him. And all those people came to my husband and started attacking him. His mom, his dad started hitting on him. So my my son, one is 17. He, his name is Reyes Cruz. He's about to go to the Navy on June. He already enlisted. He's already to leave. But he came to defend his dad to take him away the other people that were attacking to him. And I don't, I didn't feel good that they went, my kids went to the fence. He's bad. The other kid is 16. He came to take out the other girls that were attacking us. And that's the time that when they started hitting my kids. And right now I feel so very scared of them to start arguing again. So I just moved to the other side of, oh, on another space where, on the palm tree, so I just set up. I make a report of police and everything, but they didn't wear a vest. Also, I wear ro a robe by his mom. His mom take away his uh, backpack of my husband, and my husband had like four thousand in a pocket because we have changed. We are vendors. We didn't deposit the money on the bank, so she took everything. Here. The police just give me the change, only single. That's the that's all she has in the back. And I recommend, my recommendation is to limit the space for the ones where six on the ruffles. And also my recommendation is to cite all the vendors that doesn't have the permit that were on the roof. Also, I, am, I asked him for the parking space for permit. And my small business, can also offer a job to another people that is in uh, struggling for jobs. And that's all my comment. I hope somebody can hear me, my recommendation. And I hope the I uh, I hope the audience doesn't come up to not tell. Thank you very much. Wilhelmina, our next caller, phone number ending 721. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Hi, my name is Dave Jones. I'm a street vendor on 
uh, sidewalk vendor on uh, um, I, I want to thank uh, Council Member Justin Cummings um, and Staff Member Elizabeth uh, Smith, as well as the Mayor, for taking time out and listening to my um, I, I have several concerns. I, I, I would hope that you know everything's straightened out and they find out or they, they work out the, the brass dots before this council passes this ordinance because afterwards it'll be a little bit more difficult and they'll have carte blanche on what they want to do and it's not always in the vendor's interest um the number two um this senate bill 946 was intended to um to decriminalize um street vending or uh, sidewalk vending but on page 14, 24.14, there's a violation of this subdivision is a misdemeanor. That's a criminal offense. And that goes against what Senate Bill 946 is trying to do and decriminalize sidewalk vending. Um, I have a lot of concerns. What I would hope would happen would be for the council to table this and have it straightened out for its past. Um, there's, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, just waiting a little bit longer. I mean, you waited this long, you might as well wait a little bit longer and just work out all the details for this past made into an, uh, an official ordinance. And that's all. And I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and, you know, all the people who've been working on it. I, I know everybody worked hard. Uh, I want to thank everybody involved. For your comment, are there any other uh, members of the public who wish to comment on 24? I see none. We'll bring it back to council at this time. And I have Council Member Kellen Terry Johnson. Great. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, and thank you for the callers. Um, I wanted to just note that I had questions ahead of time that I sent to staff and shared with community members who had questions, so I didn't have questions earlier. Um, I have some comments that I want to make, and I am ready to make a motion to move staff recommendation um, when we get to that point, um, or I make it now, I'm not sure. Um, if you make it now, I will ask for a second. Okay, I'll go ahead and make it now and then make my comments. So I will move to adopt ordinance number 2022-03, repealing Santa Cruz Municipal Code SCMC, chapter 5.1, vending and display devices on city property, adding SCMC chapter 5.8, sidewalk vending. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. Watkins. Okay, now we can have discussion on this. Great. Um, I just want to note um, Ms. Wilhelmina's comments um, that she called in. Heartbreaking story. I watched the video. One of our community members sent the video, um, and it truly brought tears to my eyes. And um, it really further makes the point that what we're doing is not working, and it's impacting um, folks who are trying to vet. And my understanding of this ordinance is that we are going to set parameters and we're going to address the very egregious health and safety impacts that we're seeing out in the community. Um, and then work, that will work, create a framework where we can get these vendors safe spaces for them to do their business. I mean, young children are being impacted. As we heard Ms. Lamina, her for teenagers being impacted. Um, and then of course, other community members trying to access those um, spaces are being impacted. You know, this isn't safe for anyone. This isn't equitable. For uh, so I support this recommendation because I think it sets very clear parameters and I support the work that staff's doing and, and I would love to work with staff. I have been meeting with community members who have some ideas about how we can 
roll out a um, vending permit process and allow those who um, aren't otherwise able to work, work in our Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cumming. Motion seconded. Yes, by Vice Chair Watson. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, um, you know, thank those members of the public calling in. Um, and, you know, with regards to what happened in the area, I think that um, that further um, kind of reinforces the need for there to be some kind of regulation you know, in that area in terms of, because obviously there's fighting over spaces. Um, and, you know, if we're going to be paying someone, to enforce ordinance in that area, it makes sense that we would at least allow for some people and that area. And it also, um, you know, there are legal concerns because we came up with a plan that previously worked, that, that would have worked if we hadn't. Um, and it wasn't clear back then that we, weren't gonna have that we were under the impression that it would be if we went forward with limiting spaces. That was the entire time just putting all that time together into having members of the public work with our staff program. So, um, you know, my concerns are largely around <clears throat> the city being legally liable, preventing people from vending in the beach area. And as I mentioned before, if we're gonna have someone down there enforcing, that could actually provide added security for people like the member of the public heard from. And so, um, and it also would be an equitable approach. We're saying, been in the city just not here that's not actually providing opportunities for people to then where we can promote public safety we identified um such areas in the beach area and it sounds like it could be possible more so i'm gonna um as an amendment to the motion um have two of that i'd like to include um in, in addition to um mr jones's comment you know i don't think that um we're, there would be um Support for tabling this item because I think that uh, there is some desire to help mitigate some impacts that we're seeing. Although, taking into account what Mr. said um, would lead me to the second part of my um, amendment. An amendment would be, and I sent this uh, over to Bonnie, uh, would to direct park direct staff department draft a resolution establishing a limited vending zone and or city demarcated vending displayed zones on the streets and sidewalks of Peach Street between the units 4th and 3rd Street. Also direct staff back and update vendor space size in the downtown and implementation of the sidewalk vending ordinance prior to enforcement. I'll second that. Okay, is this a amendment? This no, is it's an amendment. Not. I mean, I can make it a friendly amendment if it's accepted. Um, I'm not inclined to accept those friendly amendments. I'll make an amendment. And I'm I'll also an amendment. And I do have some comments. That I, I'm um, next. So I want to. I clarify. Sorry. Um, Councilmember Cummings, are you saying to adopt the ordinance in addition to things? Yeah, it's a motion to amend the main motion. And add those. Right. I didn't accept. Yes. Yeah, so it, the um, I, I'm gonna. It's okay, Mayor. I go ahead. Cause I've had my hand up. Yes. Is I uh, just want to make sure Council Member Cummings. So Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, so I I seconded the the um, motion on the amendment. I support this amendment. Um. I, I want to point out here that the very disturbing uh, incident that uh, Mr. Wilhelmina described, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was very disturbing, and it does indicate that um, they're, what we're doing is not working, um, that I think staff has made it very clear to us that enforcement has been <coughs> a problem or, or lack of resources for enforcement. The, Council majority uh, did vote to support an increase in resources for that purpose of 
believe almost half a million dollars. So um, in total, that um, try to address issues. Um, so I have some confidence that that will make it that will ease the burden on staff. Get some extra help there. Um, and I, you know, in the particular case, though, what I'm also quite stressed that um, the solution I'm hearing, um, council member, the council majority, or a couple members who have spoken uh, support, is to um, prohibit this person from even having the right to spend at all, despite the fact that has um, the business license and the permits and has gone through that entire process. So I don't think that's really an acceptable alternative um, for people who um, rely on uh, this as, for their business, for their livelihoods. And um, were the council to support this inclusion of additional language to allow for limited uh, vending for, um, for vendors who are interested and have, have made a extremely good faith effort follow through um, and, and want to apply um, but to then eliminate that possibility for them is I, think I just think appropriate. Um, and a, a more general comment that I have about this ordinance is um, that while I very much appreciate the challenges uh, for city workers, for community members, for us, uh, the vendors themselves, uh, what people have experienced as a result of the lack of regulation in a high demand zone. Um, I really do appreciate all of, of that work and I, I, I would, I'd like to support this, but I, I just can't support something that um, is then closing off possibilities for um, people like Wilhelmina and um, family. And um, that also puts us, uh, what I would, uh, a position of having potential exposure that we wouldn't otherwise have if we we're simply regulating the time, place, and manner uh, rather than a blanket restriction in the beach area. Um, so I, I'll leave it there. I'll, I will support the amend voting, uh, adding the amendment. Um, if that were to occur, I. Okay, thank you, Council Member Brown. And um, I guess I'll insert myself here. Um, this, uh, is, I really appreciate all the comments from uh, our community members. We've received a lot of uh, comments. Last Sunday, I was on at Beach Street and uh, I've been on Fifth Avenue and so uh, as well as the vendor who called in earlier and, and uh, spoke to Cummings and I today um, at Paul. And um, you know it's clear that the, uh, livelihood that um, um some of our uh, community members really depend on and um, are not able to uh, achieve the standard and mortar uh, location. And some of them, um, a couple of the vendors have expressed desire to go in that direction and aspire to a small store of their own and um, you know, uh, had a wonderful presentation earlier from the Small Business Development uh, Center at Rio College. I know that we are course and offer consultations from business plans, lease negotiations and finance, all sorts of support for um, <clears throat> various business sectors and various and um, so my concern is um, definitely keeping this uh, 
these recommended ordinance uh, changes or guidelines, I would say, um, equitable for everybody. And you know, we had our first reading already session, and um, I uh, did vote no on the first reading um, based on concern of uh, vendors, um, the, the recommended for April through September, absolutely no spending. And um, based on Wilhelmina's story and after talking witnesses that day and after going down there on Sunday, it's very clear um, that um, the the recommendation for no vending on that of is necessary, and it is a huge public concern. And um, uh, you know, we have to continue to work to ensure that those vendors uh, have located and understand the locations um, can be their livelihood. And if it's not on that section of, then uh, we're going to work with them on um, clear guidelines of where um, it won't be such a public impact. Um, and, you know, just, just really having the implementation team after um, staff and Elizabeth Smith, um, they're still here. Um, the, the staff really working from the various departments together on implementation and taking all of these. And um, while I will be supporting ordinance um, today as it and um, without the men, um, I um, really um, encourage staff to, to consider all of the concerns, accessibility for the vendors um, who need it. And um, so I would like to um, see if any other council members have any um, further comment. Um, otherwise, we'll. If the amendments, I, I am mean, going to support the original motion, but if the amendments were to pass, does that lead to the first reading again? Maybe that's Tony. Uh, is Tony Kilati? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I, I understood the motion to be to uh, approve the second reading of the ordinance and direct staff to return with a resolution establishing a, a, a program. Uh, for limited vending on the street. So that wouldn't necessarily change anything to the ordinance? It would not change the text of the ordinance as I read okay. the language of the council member's motion. Except, okay, well then, okay, yeah, no problem. I appreciate it. I needed to reread it again. Thank you for that clarification. So the resolution would be a separate um, intention, so to speak, um, to work towards um, demarcated zones on sidewalks of work. Um, I should also add in there that the, um, the deck to F behind because um, that's all that's where we were going to put the safe for the ending previously so the idea is to have you know i i think that's fair um within the language of the existing uh item one that that deck, if that's the direction and council member cummings um on this of I think um yeah that can be removed on the sidewalk. I think what you yeah the sidewalk
the addition, sorry, about the uh, behind ID? The deck. The deck. The deck. The uh, uh, where? Yeah, it's the deck behind ID. So the, the um, city where, property. Where in the link? Oh, um, the on the sidewalks of Peach Street between the Minas 4th and 3rd Street and then comma and on the deck. City owned deck behind the ideal bar and grill. Thank you for uh, clarifying this resolution. This is a resolution of an intent, so to speak, for a resolution. It, the direction <clears throat> is to um, have staff prepare a resolution to bring back for, for council consideration at a Uh, welcome, Council Member Golder. Thank you. I apologize for uh, just now arriving. I was serving on a jury that I've been serving on for this week. And um, so I'm just kind of getting caught up to speed here. It, it, would it be appropriate for me just to ask is this motion, is this the one we're getting ready to vote on with the amendment? No. The item before the Council is whether to accept. Member Cummings uh, substitute motion. Is this the substitute motion or is this this is the substitute motion? Uh, that was an amendment. Amendment. An amendment. 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 Pardon me. Whether to accept the amendment. Correct. Right. Sorry. Okay. That. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah. Um, I wonder if. Tony or Matt, or something. I'm unclear about how these amendments impact implementation of the ordinance. And, and my concern here is that summer is around the corner, and we clearly saw the impacts of not having these parameters in place. So I want to move forward with the ordinance as soon as possible. Um, and I'm concerned that these amendments will delay us. I can speak to that, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, and then Elizabeth may have some comments as well. Um, staff's recommendation right now, um, as set forth in the ordinance, contemplates a total prohibition on uh, the reasoning for that is right now, uh, based on current conditions, there are some significant unsafe conditions and behaviors that are occurring along that stretch. So um, really the spirit behind a total prohibition is to allow us to stand up a program and, and try to get um, that area on more stable ground, not necessarily an in indefinite prohibition, however. So you know, the ordinance does leave open the opportunity down the road uh, to review the current, um, the current conditions, um, the effectiveness of the program as a whole, and evaluate whether or not um, some level of ending could be brought back to area um, once we have the, the um, this new program fully resourced. Um, so as, as I read the amendment, um, it would be directing staff to um, allow for and develop some level of vending along Beach Street. The concern also, as we're rolling out uh, these new regulations, was one of, um, on its face, a, creating an appearance of a double standard, allowing for vending in certain areas, but not others, um, allowing some individuals that have gone through the program uh, to vend, uh, but for those that may be coming into, into the area for the first time that are not familiar with the program, uh, that can lead to, uh, that can lead to some, con some con So um, what's being proposed is really aimed at um, a reset uh, as we get the program in place, 
allowing for reconsideration down the road. So anything outside of that would require some additional resources and could potentially delay uh, implementing what's, what's being proposed. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, 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 key manager, Matt Tupper, can I just clarify what you just said? Please do. It was a little long-winded, so I know. happy to clarify. Um, the motion, as stated, is clear. The amendment is direct parks and staff to draft the resolution that um, established play zones on Peach Street. There's no timeline of resolution, and it's not tied to the motion. Is that what I'm hearing? I think on its face, that's correct. Um, if I am if I am paraphrasing what the recommendation would be, or or the proposed amendment, Councilmember Cummings, it would be to develop a, a pending program along the street. But it's simply, there is no time frame established with that. Um, so that clarification would be helpful. Uh, but if there was an expectation that that be brought forward in a timely manner, I think that could have an effect on the team that is also being tasked with moving forward with implementation of the ordinance as a whole. The implementation, which item two as well, they will be tasked with. Okay. Thank you for. Um, let's see. Did you have a follow up question, Council Member Collintari Johnson? Or Council Member Cummings and oh. Council Member Collintari Johnson? Yeah, the direction here is really to provide, you know, to move forward with limited spending in the beach area. Now, whether that, you know, based on what staff is saying, it sounds like wouldn't be able to happen in the summer. So if there's work that can be done on this practice, August work on developing <clears throat> current program, my preference personally would be that we allow for this to happen in the summer. However, it's pretty clear that um, there's like from council on that. Um, so I mean, I'm happy to move forward with this motion. This going in, in this direction and it can vote it down. But, you know, in the spirit of trying to build consensus, this is something that we can have our staff working on, um, understanding it's going to take time and understanding that, um, you know, we're trying to mitigate the fact currently that, you know, we can direct, provide this direction, have this back to us since we don't mean July, August, uh, because we, we have <clears throat> we have pretty impacted council meetings and maybe staff needs to move forward and that's fine for the area related. Um, I just think that as we heard from the person who called in, you know, there are families that depend on vending, street vending for their livelihood and the area is an area where we work to create programs and provide enforcement, but it's an area where people can make a pretty decent amount of money to sustain their families given the level of tourism. And then the other direction would be, you know, I think that's pretty clear that based on what we've heard, there's a lot of concern from downtown vendors that, um, you know, not clear what the, space, the size spaces are. Um, there's some desire possibly to have the space size, size of the space increase. Um, there's issues around the medallions. So being able to get an update on that from staff, I think would be helpful so that and how the implementation is rolling out, how we can address the other concerns. So that is the intent. Um, happy to build in that um, into number one uh, and bring an item back for council direction at the first meeting in August. If that's if having that timeline.
Uh, Mayor Bruner, I did want to clarify that I, I mentioned a, to a total prohibition on Long Beach. In fact, the restrictions are only during the summer. There is spending allowed on Long Beach uh, during the off-peak season. I just wanted to make that clear. Yes, April, April through September, correct? That's correct. It's April April through to October. October is the when the prohibition is. Is that October thirty first? Correct. Okay. Council Member Calentari Johnson and then Council Member Myers. Um, what what I heard earlier from staff is that the intent is to reset and. Um, that this is an iterative process that we are going to pass this and create a comprehensive, thoughtful framework. So I, I heard that from staff and I think that, that I think that's what the intent of this amendment is, but I'm not sure um, if that's what staff has said we are going to do, then, then why this is necessary. Um, again, I'm concerned about any kind of a delay of moving forward with this ordinance, given the safety and health impacts that we heard about, seen on videos, that gotten comments on. Um, so that's where I'm at. Thank you. Council Member Myers. My understanding is there's amendment, there's a motion to amend with these two items. Um, and I guess I, I just feel like hard to read everything that came in the businesses not recognize that this that this is an extreme situation that is happening now. Um, you know, I mean, one whole um, business owner who actually sold their they sold their property directly. Because, um, this is our major tourism area in the city of Santa Cruz. Last week, we had a major blowout with violence against kids. Um, I mean, we have to, this is about, we have to sort of buckle down and figure this out. And this, the ordinance as it is now crafted, it gives us the time to do that. We can, at the same time, implement, hopefully restore a much more, um, you know, visitor oriented as well as resident oriented area down without giving our staff, you know, an ordinance that they can work under with restriction. And then also can't, it, it can't do all of that and also do what we've been doing in the past. Basically what I think I'm kind of proposing, last two years have been a disaster. Um, I spent, as mayor last year, I spent at least four or five meetings with upwards of different businesses, as well as Supervisor Coonerty and Senator Laird's staff. Mm -hmm. It was not going all last year, not at all. Um, and it wasn't just because of enforcement. There was a lot of other issues. So I, I think it's just, you know, I think what's for us, is a doable ordinance, it's workable, it provides the ability and sort of the ability of our staff, both police, code enforcement, city managers, um, as well as the local business owners, a pathway to sort of get things that reset, have a more productive summer than the last two. Um, I also know a lot of families who work at the park, they were terrified to have their down there. Most of them were driving their kids box go work there had been so many fights so I feel like we're sort of ignoring the elephant in the room, which that basically that our major one of our major was in and so um I'm gonna I won't be able to support this amendment I just want to just really publicly want to acknowledge the business owners who are down in that area how much they are asking how destabilizing our main driver areas. And I also want to acknowledge the people who 
you know, are trying to vent, it's become very unsafe. So we need just time in the if it's right, the area is stabilized, the antithetical product can build from there. Without stabilization this summer and moving ahead, potentially all the way through the season, is, um, just not the problem. When people start selling selling their businesses, that's a sign of lost practice. So um, I'm not going to be able to support those. <laughs> Council Member Watkins. Okay. Watkins. No problem. No, they, um, no, I appreciate the conversation and I also appreciate the intention of trying to really come up with something and as a solution here and knowing that it's really complicated and challenging. And I also know a lot of work has been um, done to get us to this place and the conversation the last um, or the first reading of the ordinance was really around getting something in place and then continuing to improve upon that policy and learn and, and make it iterative as, as I think a good approach to most things is really. Um, and so also Mayor, in sort of the spirit of what you brought up originally at the very beginning of the meeting and knowing now that we're over two hours behind schedule, um, you know, I'm just, I'm respectfully happy to just call the question to take the vote on the amendment and then- I'll Second that. And then vote on the motion. Okay, so calling the question concludes all discussion of this item, and we move. So, uh, Just to, to be clear, this is a vote on the motion to call the question. Yeah. So a uh, vote. Call the question. Do a roll call vote. Member Tari Johnson. Aye. 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 No. Brown. No. Meyer. I were voting on the original motion. We're voting on whether to call the question. Aye. Watch Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. Mayor. Aye. Okay, so now we uh, will take a roll call vote on the motion. Votes on the amendment. Clerk. Yeah, I'm so Tony right now are voting. Step. Correct. Yep. I back in my minutes. I haven't gotten to that part yet. Okay. Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Sir? No. Tony? I, and I'll just say for the record that these um, amendments would not prevent us moving forward with the current ordinance. A lot of the impacts that we've been facing pertains to state law. Amendments are really meant to try to provide some legal coverage in the city. Vote in favor, aye. Brown? Aye. Is Mayor Watkins? No. No. Okay. Um, but the main motion is now on the floor. Now we have the main motion, the original motion on the floor. And uh, Lee Clerk, may we have a roll call vote? Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. 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 
voting no, and I just want to say for the record that I understand the tax that we're seeing in the area, and you know, really, my previous motion was trying to figure out a way forward for us to provide direction, move this forward, and also um, and to come up with a way to mitigate some of this impact. So um, my hope is that we will be able to um, figure out a way forward with each vending in the future, and that also we're going to be working sure that vendors specific and in other parts of the city will have sufficient space to be able to conduct business. Um, so see how things turn out. But at, the, at this moment, I believe that we're putting ourselves in a, a legally liable position by outright prohibiting vending in the area. Given that we were able to create a program previously, we just didn't have it. So I'll be voting no, and I'm really hoping. I'll be voting no, and for the record, I agree with Councilmember Cummings that nothing about a uh, proposal that made uh, was intended to delay this. I, I just absolutely agree and, quite frankly, am um, disturbed by uh, Councilmember Meyer's intention that uh, this is intended to allow for uh, continued mess uh, each area. The idea here was sure that people who are playing by the rules, people like uh, you just heard from, um, are not doubly punished, one, um, by experience of the Wild West atmosphere and now being told just not to be able to bend at all, but it's for your own good. I just don't think that's the appropriate way to handle this. Um, the, uh, the proposal uh, direct staff find ways to, to work on that reset at this alongside um, the implementation of an ordinance to me uh, seems totally reasonable and uh, more likely to pass leave muster and um, so I'm, I just want to make that clear I'd like to put it on the record questions are getting called the question is getting cut off um, I'd like to that Mayor? Aye. Vice Mayor Watson? Aye. Hi, and I'd like to uh, say thank you to all the staff and community members that have uh, worked to input the, uh, all of the information we have so far to get and um, I'm happy to hear uh, earlier from uh, uh, Elizabeth Smith that implementation team will be taking all of the considerations and concerns um, into their work and making it the most equitable process and safe process going forward. Okay, so we had the motion passed with five yes to no. At this time, we are ready to move on to Item number 25 has been postponed to and continued to the April 26th meeting, as well as item 26 has been continued to our meeting. And so we are now at a are ready for item 27 on our agenda. Item 27 is a public hearing for green building program closed for members of the public for streaming this. If this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The 
order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council, and then we will take public comment and reach I would like to invite Vivian Ewan, principal manager, to the list. Welcome, Thank you. Vivian. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Great. Uh, my name is Vivian Nguyen, and I am the Principal Management Analyst for the Planning and Development Department. With me today, I also have Lee Butler, the Director, as well as John Gervasani, the Building Official. I'm pleased to be presenting the Green Building Program increase today. Staff is recommending a fee to support the current program and to allow an amendment to Chapter 24.15 of the Green Building Regulations that would authorize the that by resolution. The amendments would allow the program to be cost recovery as well as fiscally sustainable. Now, in October 2005, City Council established the Green Building Education Fee, or GPF, to support the Green Building Program. B was codified 0025 of the project valuation with a cap of $1,000. The Green Building Program promotes, promotes environmental sustainability, including incentives for waste reduction, energy efficiency, and um, water conservation. Now, this is a brief high-level overview of the Green Building Program, which applies to most new construction and some remodels. There are a range of exceptions that I won't go into, um, but there are various green building measures that are assigned to meet values and applicants must achieve a set number of points based on measures that they select. Now, residential and non-residential are considered separately. Now, the Green Building Program has not been in the fee has not been increased since 2005, even though employee costs have continued to increase and the program components have changed. Most notably in 2017, the change was that we had a part-time building specialist go from part-time to now full-time. There are a couple other adjustments needed for the fiscal year 23 proposed budget, including increasing baseline percentage of the building and safety staff to support the Green Building. We also need to take a look at other staff who support the program and adding them, such as the staff to support the building and inspection. And the current budget doesn't consider this. Now, in addition, the budget also needs to adjust for supply costs by 3 to 5% per year from fiscal year 23 to 27 to account for general price adjustment. Now, taking a look at fiscal year 21 as our baseline budget, the program costs about $300. For the fiscal year 23 budget proposed, our projected cost would be about $620,000. Now, the accounting for the past few fiscal years for fiscal year 2017, 19, 22, did not meet annual program expenses. 2017, Fiscal year 2017 was when we hired a full time building specialist. And as you can see, we've been operating at an overall deficit since fiscal year 2017, with the exception of. Now, here is just a few examples of current proposed fee that we wanted just to show you. A hypothetical 650 accessory dwelling unit would pay about a $158 fee. And now, to more accurately capture the cost for that, they would be paying $1,430. For a typical single family home, um, that's about an $880 fee that they would now be paying $3,520 to, again, more accurately capture the cost of reviewing. For a typical 10 unit building, that would be a total fee of $3,578 or $358 per unit. And at the proposed fee change, that would be a total of 14,310 or 1,000. And the fee would be capped at 50,000 based on our analysis of 
time and costs associated with review and inspection. Now for next steps, you have the first reading today. Then assuming you pass this for publication today, the second reading would be April 26th. The fee would be effective 60 days later. You would likely be considering future changes such as building a location to adjust the fee accordingly as a program changes to ensure cost recovery in the recommendation is from your agenda report here for your reference. Then staff will be available. Thank you, Vivian, for that presentation. Um, I will now, uh, we have a recommendation from staff, so I will bring it to council members. Uh, Council Brown. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your work on this. I'm always a big fan of full cost recovery for our services. And so I really appreciate uh, bringing this to us. Uh, I just had a question about the cap um, because it looked like there was there was removal of the cap, have a cap. There Cap and then, but it's it's now been determined that cap. And so I just would love to hear a little bit of the behind that. On the face of it, it makes me wonder um, would this you know provide that would this potentially subsidize large projects? Yes, is what I'm I'm wondering as a result of that. Um, and I only ask that because it is a significant increase for smaller. Uh, projects for individual property owners, perhaps who want to, um, you know, build an ADU or those kinds. Of, you know, th it's a significant increase, and um, grand scheme of things, it's a lot. But I know that I have a lot of people really struggle to try to provide additional housing on the properties they have, small scale. Um, and so, I guess I'm just wondering, um, like, I wouldn't want to see a program that ended up subsidizing larger projects. Um, by mom and pop developers. So, just wondering about the thanks. Thanks, Councilmember Brown. Um, I think any of us here, uh, John or Vivian or myself, could answer that. But I'll I'll take the first stab and uh, offer either of them an opportunity to add on. Um, Lee Butler, I'm Director of Planning and Community Development, and I appreciate that concern. Um, a couple things that I would say to that. First off, um, that was an inadvertent um, uh, uh, miss uh, of keeping the $50,000 cap. And actually, if you go to the, um, so we did add it back in to make sure that we were here and the resolution had not included it. We had, we had inadvertently left that cap out. Um, if you go back to the um, analysis of um, the different revenues, each of those include the $50,000 cap. And um, that's because as we started looking at how much time we spend um, from a um, staffing plan review perspective, as well as from an inspection perspective, uh, perspective there is an economy of scale. You know, the, um, the systems, the building systems that are being installed, um, both from a plan review perspective the amount of time we're spending and the um, inspections um, that there's an economy of scale on that well. And so we really couldn't justify um, having more than $50,000 per project on that um, as we started looking at it. So I'll, I'll see if Vivian or John wanted to add anything, but I do apologize. We meant to include that $50,000 cap and I appreciate Bonnie, city clerk and her team in, in providing that update when we recognize near well if if i might i think and the reason that they stuck with the fifty thousand dollar cap well first of all i like to say uh, you know hello to the honorable mayor and the council members probably about the first time i've spoke to you since i've been in this um but i i think the reason we also stuck with that fifty thousand dollar cap was that, so there would be an equal place for everybody that they would stop paying. And um, 
<clears throat> this also benefited the medium-sized project. Uh, apartment houses, not necessarily the larger projects that were starting to be going up down Pacific, front uh, with a large use. Uh, but the, the medium-sized project, like 10, 20, 25 apartments, building or um, seeing that it was actually those smaller projects really weren't a fair share when we figure uh, the amount of time that spending on each one of them. So that's kind of where we thought that we could be collecting a little, make, making up definitely. Thank you. That, that's helpful. I, I, I so just to, to make sure I'm clear, the, and I, I recognize the economies of scale and not a one to one, depending on how many or what. Um, I get that. So, but in your so in your experience then, and the kind of information you have, you're not answering that uh, larger project. Costing more than thousand dollars by the green. Bill. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Um, and, and also, if you think about it, uh, Councilman Brown, the volume, the larger volume, what we deal with is those smaller projects. Um, and when you when you look like right now, we've probably got two, maybe three of those major projects, of which. Uh, Pack South should be going quick. Uh, that that makes two of those. But when you look at the total number of them, as I said, smaller projects, the homeowners use that kind of thing. Those take up the majority of time. And while they're smaller projects compared to those large projects, would think that the um, the amount of time you spend on those uh, would be commensurate to what you spend on the larger projects. That's not true. You spend a lot of time on these smaller projects, educating the homeowners, giving them direction, uh, helping them through the imagery of the web that this thing weaves. A lot of them just don't understand how the program is set up. So we do spend a lot of one on one time with these. More, more so than the larger. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I, I just was hope, hoping to, to hear what I heard, that it doesn't cost for that much more for the larger projects. And we're, so that, that was just, right. but it sounds like based on your, that's not a. Right, and we're, we're only trying to recoup the costs you know, that uh, our services are Thank Appreciate you, Council it. Member Brown. Any other council members have questions from staff regarding this item? Okay. I'm happy to bring it out to public comment. If we're interested in commenting on green building program proposed increase, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand in the webinar controls on your phone. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement and you will have three minutes. <laughs> okay, going out to the I have a hand raised. The name is I am watching. Uh, thank you. In the past, the justification for building codes, plan checking, and inspections was the health and safety of the occupants of structures. Then regulations morphed into areas of energy efficiency that arguably are still sufficiently justified by economic benefits to the occupants, but emerging were community benefits of conserving energy. Then some new green building regulations went beyond that and don't really provide as much benefit to the occupants, but much more so to the community 
and it has already begun that green building codes related to climate change have relatively zero benefit to occupants with almost all benefit, if there is any, flowing to the community or the world. What hasn't changed is the supposed equitability of pays for what benefit, which you still say is 100% always to fall in the developer. As I explained, some of that 400% proposed compliance increase should more rightly be borne by general public taxes, not developers. I say you have had this hidden growing public tax versus the equitability of this green eco-compliance trend going backwards since inception in 2005. Otherwise, the enforcement of green regulations isn't different from any other in the ever-growing list of planning or building code regulations and compliance verifications. And this need for an extra developer fee structure was never 100% justified, although maybe a discount for exempt projects worked for me. It's sort of a lipstick on a pig contrivance, masking insatiable governments, go warrioring administrative growth without having to go to the public to raise taxes. So I'm guessing you're not going to get. I don't think you have an ethical clue here. Uh, I am not surprised with wild inflation on top of a city systemic overspending trend that accountants are tapping you on the shoulder with the idea of uh, attaching more salaries to massively increased fees, dazzling you with the many tables of how much more money you can tap by varying fee excesses upwards, creating vastly more income, as if somehow the actual work done in exchange for this fee would automatically be fair and equitable at any higher approved fee you may fancy or that somehow the work done is totally different than the jobs fee workers are normally paid with tax dollars for community benefit to do. I note the principal management analyst presenter is cutting themselves in for a chunk of this new green building fee hike scheme that she is proposing. Mic drop. You may also want to consider that making housing more expensive also runs bottom line directly counter to lowering housing costs. The current list of salaries paid on this scheme seems enough of a stretch of the imagination to me. A no vote doesn't mean there won't be green building. A no means you're not doing an end around public taxation approval or holding a project for cash just because you can when community benefit green regulations of your doing are but a small part of project approval benefiting others besides the current payers. And I say fairness questions exist about who benefits and then who should pay are issues that did not exist in the past. My thinking is this is just the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, do we have any other uh, members of the public who are interested in public comment item? If not, I will bring it back. Oh, there's no more hands raised. So. Bring it back to Council, uh, Council Member Golder. Hi. Um, so for this, I just want to acknowledge that the cost to build here in Santa Cruz is really, really expensive. And having almost completed a, a remodel myself, um, I think around the nation, it's around $100 to $200 per square foot to build. Ours is costing over $400 a square foot to build. And if you take into consideration the cost, like to purchase land or something, you know, cost could be around $700 a square foot. So I think with every additional fee, it directly impacts um, the cost of housing, whether we like it or not. Like, and so for that reason, I'm actually going to vote no, even though I principle that I think, you know, it's a good practice to do green building, but I just can't support additional for this cause and just why thank you uh let's see vice mayor watch i understand councilmember golder's you know uh, impacts of fees so i, I totally I, I totally understand that um and i am in support of this uh proposal so i'm happy to use the recommendation as written in the agenda report uh, great, thank you, Council Member Brown. We have a first uh, by Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by Council Member Brown. And further discussion, Council Member Brown, did you have any further discussion? 
okay. and I don't see any other um, council members with further discussion, then we will move to a roll call. Uh, council members, member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Bert Holder? No. Coming? Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? What? Aye. And Mayor Aye. That motion passes. Yes votes and one against. Council member. I'd like to thank the mayor and council members. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice to meet you. Thank you uh, to Vivian Nguyen and Vivian as well. Thank you, Honorable Karen. Okay, going back to the agenda. We have item 28 has been continued to the May 10th city council meeting and item number 29 has been continued to the April 26th council meeting. So before we um, uh, begin item 30, I would like to um, take a quick break. Um, Six o'clock is uh, world communications, or is it thirty? Let me double check. Six o'clock. Okay, so um, a quick uh, break until world o'clock. Opportunity food and bio break. We'll see you at six. Can council members turn on their cameras? Are you ready to begin? I am, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Now I can say good evening. Welcome to our 6 p.m. part of our April 12, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Uh, this is the time now for oral communication for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you would like to comment during oral communication. Now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communication are an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please raise your hand either by pressing star nine on your phone Selecting a raise hand in the webinar. We'll have three minutes. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to dialogue for a public, but when we are able, we will address questions after the world. Okay, going out to our attendees, I see a few hands raised. And my first name, uh, Serge Pagno. Welcome. Hello? Uh, okay, I don't know what happened, but I can come back to you. The next hand raised for oral 
Nikita is I am watching you. Okay, thank you. After examining the climate action plans, considerate uh, public participation review of climate action proposals, here's my review. The massive high scoring of support for every single proposal clues me that the only people who fill out such responses are climate action activists. One of the profile pictures of a respondent was actually that of Greta Thunberg. It's not a random survey of public thought. As the proposals apparently written by a person who doesn't know that 1-32-2022 isn't a real date, I see some very troubling authoritarian woke thinking and have four main objections. The first is simply the proposals largely advocate a very coercive punitive measures and not constructive low cost incentivizing ones, require large employers to subsidize alternative modes of transportation, require large building owners to install 20% EV charging stations, banning or charging extra for single occupancy driving and parking, remove natural grass infrastructure, and mandates requiring electrification of existing residential properties are but some examples of vague but extremely coercive authoritarian measures and questionable legal authority. This uh, cap exclamation of legally defensible actually means how extremist can we get away with? Secondly, the large number of proposals referencing only so-called frontline communities when climate change is a global issue this ignorance of purpose and hijacking. Third, my general impression is the government wants a lot more of the public money and a lot bigger, more intrusive government. Fourth, and yes, the survey proposal's input is not alone in this, it is rife with hijacking, though whatever real legitimacy the sustainability, the sustainability issue has is much less legitimate unrelated issues, for instance, the garbage woke well term known as equity. We've discussed before how equity is based on the falsehood that a human's potential is some known certainty and this unmeasurable, unknowable life outcome should be assured by any means necessary using race or gender quotas or whatever, whatever meaning central planning authoritarianism like communism. To make it simpler, equity is about taking people down, not building people up. It's the ugly face of jealousy, discrimination, and the ruin of individual rights. I thought this should be about climate change. Never mind until the rest of the world similarly commits, there is zero chance anything Santa Cruz does will have any measurable effect on climate. None. Zero. It can have the effect of destroying our energy infrastructure and transportation before true carbon zero replacement energy exists. Uh, American principles will be destroyed, produce unreliable, insufficient energy, and energy rash instead of growth. If this is stage three of climate action planning, it's time to go back to stage one. I would mention not everyone, or even 40%. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Nikita, you're next. At this time, we are taking public input on oral communication. Oral communications are items not agenda. Next up, I have the name Jennifer Joffe. Um, I'm specifically um, understand I'm a rarity, but by my.
our budget. Shortly after, ability to subsidize. I'm here to request. Symbiotic. So I is possibility. Thank you. Oral communication. Uh, our next hand up is Kyle Davenport. Hi, City Council. Um, this is not City Council to anybody who is listening right now. Any who is listening? Um, I have been in Austin. Uh, every human being has been in Austin. And there is something about saying it out loud in beings that has a very beneficial effect. Um, I believe it engages the frontal cortex, which is one of the most advanced parts of our brains. Um, I have been dishonest. Every human being has been dishonest. There's something about saying that out loud as well. Also, if I look back on my life, times I've been in denial about any small thing, even the laundry, um, my laundry in particular. <laughs> and I can conclude that I'm probably still in denial right now if I have been in denial in the past. And it is my belief that every human is in denial. And there's something about admitting that out loud as well. So, Here to ask anyone, anyone at all, say these things out loud to anybody. See what it does. It has had a beneficial effect on me personally because I have been in denial. Um, I also have some words of love like this before in my life. Um, I'd ask you to not even listen to me right now. I uh, don't even hear what I'm saying. In fact, don't even hear anything right now if you can't. Don't hear my words. Inside of you is a platform. And a platform is like a deck. Under every deck, every child inside knows there's a secret place to hide. It's safe uh, where you can be alone without worry. Turn your hidden pain or sorrows into joy. Turn your hidden sorrows into joy. Turn your hidden sorrows into joy. Turn our hidden sorrows into joy. Turn our bad memories into good memories. 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 Turn our bad memories into beauty. Thank you. Our next. Uh member of the public. Oh, Serge Cognell, you're back. Your hand raised. Okay, our next 
Go ahead. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I apologize for um I had my uh, AirPods on. I was messing with it. Um. Good evening. Um. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the secretary of the Mental Health Advisory, and I'd like to invite to our next, which is next Thursday, April 21st. Uh, I'd like to throw a shout out, to Alan Terry Johnson, for coming to our last presentation. It was on the roadmap to the ideal crisis system. On April 21st, next Thursday, we'll be having presentations for the upcoming 98 system, which is federally required online July 16th this year. On July 16th, the National Suicide Hotline, which is sort of a long, complicated number, 800-273-255, is switching uh, to the three-digit, or will be accepting calls on the 988 line. It'll also be calls for any behavioral health crisis. Easier number to remember, and the broader is that most likely raise the number of calls by as much as 30% are um, the same as some other states that have already started the system. Um, in Santa Cruz, the uh, Family Services Agency is the um, nonprofit that manages our suicide hotline. They're hiring up to 10 more people because of expected calls. How this is going to also affect law enforcement, domestic violence, and all the other dominoes in our system is still unclear. Uh, so next Thursday, we're having some of the director of the our local hotline, also uh, somebody from behavioral health, presentations on how we're getting ready for that system. And I invite the city council and anybody else who's listening um, to uh, attend. Um, I'll send you a flyer once I have one. And will the mental health advisory in Santa Cruz County and uh, the agenda will be up. And stay safe. Thank you. Our next member of the public is David Hart Public Transit. Uh, hello, can you uh, hear me all right? Yes. Hi, uh, this is uh, David Van Brink, and uh, there was one or two tough acts to follow there, and my comment is uh, rather more mundane. Um, just wanted to thank you all for uh, all you do for our city. It's all important and moves us forward. In particular, though, I want to thank you for your work on our local bike infrastructure over the last several years. It, it was actually seeing those uh, green uh, bike lanes on Laurel Street quite, quite a few years back that made me realize that, oh, you know, actually people you know, think about this and make it happen. Um, and I want to express special enthusiasm uh, for the upcoming trail segment 7B. We're all on pins and needles for how the bidding is going to turn out, and fingers crossed it's going to hopefully happen soonish. So, again, thank you all. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak during oral communications, which is any item that is not on agenda? We have um, more caller, caller ending in 4844. Go ahead and unmute. Um, this is Robert Norris again. I guess I'm concerned, uh, having heard the city manager's report, that there is no new information on expanded shelter and storage services, such as was promised by council and supposedly preconditioned to any enforcement of the renewed camping ban, CSSO ordinance, which the city manager, Matt Huffaker, said was in fact going to be done. Uh, when he spoke, I guess, three weeks ago at the previous council meeting. That's part of the staff report as well. So how can you have enforcement you don't really have storage and shelter? Now, what's been happening has been massive sweep throughout the city in violation of the Martin versus Boise ruling with the claim that the bench land is a justified campground. And it certainly is uh, an emergency place that people are using. There's no question. I'm glad they have something. But it's also been announced by that same city manager, whom uh, you apparently approved the appointment, that there's going to be a complete removal of people, uh, hundreds of people in the bench land in July of this year. That's, uh, that's what he announced next, I guess, this morning. Now, are you actually claiming with a straight 
space to be able to have storage shelter facilities by that time when you uh, evict those people? And are you claiming that you are now enforcing the camping ban in order to shovel everybody into the bench lands, then to evict them to nowhere in July of the summer? May I pose this question? Because it seems pretty obvious if you are to take it with a straight face what the city manager is saying. I don't really believe what the city manager is saying, but I must presume that you are taking him seriously because you take a lot of direction. He has a lot of power. So if somebody can ask a few questions after this oral communication as to what the actual status of the shelter service situation is, and what the real intentions are in July, and the real process of shelter and storage at that time, it would be very reassuring not to have to wait till May to get another, uh, we'll be working on this very hard kind of report. And it might help the people who are in the bench lands and those supports as well, as well as the neighbors who are concerned about this. And I thank everybody for listening. Thank you for your oral communication. Our next uh, name is Reggie Meisler. Uh, that was my, sorry, here I asked. Okay, we'll try again. Hello? Hi there. Hi, I just want to echo what Robert Morse, uh, the previous caller, just said. I think it's, um, very uh, disturbing and irresponsible, but you know, also just status quo that um, have a definite end date for the bench lands, but no definite um, provision of services that uh, people will be redirected to. Uh, it's unclear why the bench lands needs to close me at that time. It has something to do with environmental reasons or something like that or the you know the sort of something with the river but whatever the case i mean it seems like a plan should be formulated to sort of redirect people before a definite end date is designed i mean this is the same problem that came up with ross camp it's the same problem that was attempted by city manager during the winter when city council was out of session in 2020 when they tried to just shut down by executive order San Lorenzo Park and activists had to come and stop that from happening because it was illegal and it was, you know, in many ways could be seen as almost a kind of genocide given the uh, conditions of COVID at that time. Um, and so I think for me, um, I would just like to see something different than what we saw with the previous city manager, Martin Bernal. Uh, I don't want uh, this new city manager, Matt Huffaker, to just be a repeat of that kind of just horrible abuse of power and the complete lack of care for our unhoused community. Um, and I and I don't. It doesn't you know, give me much confidence, and I'll speak on this later, that the public gathering ordinance is happening because, um, you know, it feels like that's kind of being planned to hurt food, not bombs, and to maybe uh, wash resistance to a bench lands closure. Um, so, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I hope for more, but I guess we'll see what happens. Thank you. Our next uh, hand up is Alicia Poole. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. So I just wanted to take a moment to say that I would hope that I'm to close the bench plan. Um, you know, to echo the previous callers would include a good plan for relocation for those individuals. Uh, it's grown quite large. Um, 
And the hope is that you could, you know, have adequate alternative indoor shelter if possible uh, for those individuals. And I want to, um, again, say that several years now, the death toll in the unhoused population has risen. And so you have an opportunity to do something about that um, as you have previous years. And, you know, just to talk about what has helped me, um, I'm no longer homeless anymore. And that's because of an emergency housing voucher and services. And, you know, it's not helpful to spend time fighting against you know, harmful ordinances and things that would criminalize. You know, I've paid thousands of dollars in tickets just while I was unfortunately forced to live in my RV with my family. That was unhelpful. Um, you know, having litigation to protect others against harmful ordinances and to, you know, protest to try to fight for human rights. It's just not helpful. Um, what's helpful is really pay attention to people's needs and to address those. And so I just, I really want to talk about that. And again, just, you know, the ball is in your court. You have a lot of power. You are our leaders. And so you can really allocate what needs to happen in the correct way. You can save lives here. And, you know, although I'm housed now, it's very unfortunate that I've lost some really good friends along the way. And I can't even invite them to a house party. Yeah, you know, it's very sad. So, you know, we can we can stop this. We can all work together, and we can stop trauma and pain and suffering and and what we need to be done for our entire. So, thank you. Thank you for your for input for oral oral communication. We have another caller. Phone number ending 1197. Hello, Gabby. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, I still have a caller. Uh, oh. But on a different. I like. That uh, that I had asked about and and was told now we're in the middle of the and that. Don't have a mask mandate. It's about virus. So my request, I already have very democratic call in. Don't have access that like that a lot of would like. Our health, they don't post the people, not. And as well, a lot of attend have course there, but a lot of other people there when had a lot of health. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, member of the public is named Joy S. Welcome. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I also want to echo the sentiments of Robert Norris, Reggie Meisler, and especially Alicia Cole. Um, as well as Abby's points about access for people who don't have housing or technology. Um, 
I would like to add that um, people are being pushed to the bench lens or have been pushed to the bench lens continually for months from different areas around the city. And of course, there are health and safety concerns at various locations. Um, but simply pushing people into the bench lens without having alternatives, you know, Alicia brought up that we need alternative spaces before the bench lens closes. We need alternative spaces now. You know, I visited bench lens Sunday morning. Um, normally, I would go on Sunday mornings to Camp Paradise or Hell's Trail. Um, and, you know, people do as the best they can, but it, it's really, I mean, to say that it's not an ideal situation to have everybody who's been trying to take care of themselves at alternative sites to sort of self-manage themselves in smaller groups of people with people that they know and trust and um, care for and share resources with, to have all of them, or most of them, pushed into the bench lens um, is, I, yes, not helpful. And that's a huge understatement. It's dangerous for a lot of people. And it's, you know, not healthy for most people. Then the other people who just refuse to go to the bench lens have, I think, taken themselves to more hidden spaces. So if what you're trying to do is act, like get people access to services, to case managers, to the camp stewards who can help them get their documents again and again and again, um, you know, they're more hidden to Poganip or up Highway 9, less accessible for public health and safety issues, less accessible for services. So I would say, you know, regardless of CSSO and, you know, enforcement of those issues um, or the services of storage, um, you know, people need alternatives now, not just some shitty alternative, <laughs> you know? They need real alternatives, okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Looks like that concludes our oral communication. I'm not seeing any, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if hands are going up for oral communications. But I will check the first caller ending in 174. Oral communications are items not on the agenda. Go ahead and unmute. Yes, thank you. I actually calling in for oral communication. Is that all right? Go yes. Ahead. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gillian Greenside, and you know, this, I, I'm going to speak on a different issue, but uh, just to say that here's one good reason to have quickly as possible in person meeting of the council. Uh, I thought I was in line. Uh, first up, put in your eight digit, you know, digit meeting ID and all that. Did the, the star nine, but then I did pound nine. I said star nine, so I wouldn't have gotten to speak because, and I'm familiar with Zoom. I'm familiar with this. It's not like I'm a newbie, but uh, it's easy to make mistakes. So um, as soon as you can, back in just what I am calling in about. That I very surprised managed to say that bench lands exposed. I noted earlier before that it was stated that the armory have what a 79 bed said and I could understand that if there was no comment about bench exposure where there's over 200 people there now without having adequate space seems um best staff lot of people. I know there's problems at bench because I've been there with the best. So I see the issue. A lot of them are a lack of resources that he's giving in, the lack of authority. 
stuff up work part time and there's not enough of them. Um, and the first issue impact on the riverbank. Uh, but will you have an alternative, especially as we're going, going into winter, going to flood, I could see a rationale. But we're going into summer. And of course, there's issues about uh, numbers being crammed. However, I still cannot understand, and I think it won't be an explanation, why the plan shows that without simultaneously saying, and here's the alternative to accommodate the equivalent number. Of so I hope here um, at some point an explanation uh, of why this is happening and uh, why a plan was common. The last uh, caller I will take for oral communications is Julie Shaw. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, welcome. I'm here to uh, bring something to everyone's attention that there is a website called Fines and Justice Center org, and I'm just going to go ahead and read the About Us page until I'm hear the beep that I'm no longer allowed to speak. So every year, fines and fees devastate the lives of millions of Americans. Our justice system is supposed to operate with integrity, providing equal justice for all. Yet in far too many places in the United States, court fines and fees have put exuberant price tag on justice exorbitant. Thank you. Across the country, courts impose fines as a punishment for minor traffic and municipal code violations misdemeanors and felonies. Courts then tax people with fees and surcharges and costs used to fund the justice system and other government services. Those who cannot immediately pay these costs face additional fees, license suspensions, loss of voting rights, arrest and jail. Stuck in a cycle of punishment and poverty, people can lose their job, their homes and even their children. We've created a two-tier system of justice where poor people and particularly communities of color are disproportionately punished. The mission of Fines and Fees Justice Center, also abbreviated as FFJC, says the Fines and Fees Justice Center is catalyzing a movement to eliminate the fines and fees that distort justice. Our goal is to create a justice system that individuals fairly ensures public and community prosperity and is funded equitably. We work together with affected communities and justice system stakeholders to eliminate fees in the justice system, to ensure that fines are exposed and enforced and end abusive collection practices. Again, if anybody wants to learn more, they're welcome to go to finesandfeesjusticecenter.org. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I will now close oral communication and we will turn to our agenda. And we are currently on agenda item number 30. Before we start that, can I just comment on one of the, am I allowed to say something about one of the oral communication? Yes, and um, I did also want to, um, before um, we, we start with number 30, um, there were several callers who um, uh, brought up the in-person meetings, and those will be um, April 26th. So the goal was in-person meetings in April, and our April 26th will be in person as well as uh, so um, uh, members of the public have the option of a Zoom or in person for the day. Um, and we will be receiving an update on um, bench lens along with the next homelessness sponsor. Uh, um, 
feel free to reference the city website, cityofsantacruz.com slash homelessness for updates that are getting posted there along the way as well, or to contact any of us. Uh, Council Member Golder? Yeah, I just wanted to comment briefly on um, my colleague and friend Jennifer that called in about her ADU. And I know I mentioned this to, I don't know if I'm, who I mentioned it to, but I'm not on the revenue committee, but I would like to throw it out there that this might be something we should look into revisiting. Um, because of some of these unintended consequences, she's not the only person that's approached me about this. I know two of two other city employees with ADUs with similar situations. And, um, you know, just just revisiting the short-term rental um, ordinance in totality in, in, in addition um, to the ADU aspect of it. You know, I think I've seen houses on Westcliff just sitting vacant. And so I understand there's, you know, a move to try and get a vacant home tax. Um, but I think if those houses were able to be rented out you know, as short-term rentals, we would see greater revenue. And it's not like somebody that has a vacation house on Westcliff is going to rent it out um, for long-term, you know, residential use, likely it's their vacation home. The other thing um, in that regard is I would like if we, if the revenue committee or whoever's at it, look at doing what the county does and collecting that TOT tax off the top on these websites rather than having everybody that has a short-term rent bit once a month because I, I, many of you know that I've, I've Airbnb my house for years and um, it's not only time consuming, um, there's lots of ways that I'm sure we're not getting all of the money that we're, uh, like, that we're seeing. so we'll, that's not good there, but I think she brought up a valid point that it might evaluate. Thank you, Council Member Okay, moving on to item 30 on our agenda today. This is public gathering and expression event ordinance amendment for members of the public for streaming this meeting. If this is an item you'd like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item from staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to council presentation. Okay, and our staff presenting, I'd like to invite uh, Deputy City Attorney Cassie Bronson, as well as uh, Deputy City Mary Kelsey. Hi, good evening. I'm um, very happy, happy to be here with you, and I'm going to have maybe five slides on the PowerPoint, so I'm going to share a screen. Look okay? All right. Um, move around these guys. Okay. Hello, good evening. My name is Cassie Bronson from the City Attorney's Office, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And let's dive into talking about the public gathering and expression event ordinance. So just a brief intro, uh, what is a public gathering and expression event? It's an event or activity primarily intended for the communication of ideas. These are activities that courts have determined are entitled to a high degree of amendment. And, you know, obviously some of the examples are marches, rallies, little demonstrations. So uh, we are asking you to update the ordinance and why, what's the rationale and what are the goals? Well, first, we really wanted to just apply the ordinance. Uh, with the existing language, it was difficult to determine when a did. So I'm a big believer that clarity and language is and so we really just wanted to make that a priority with the state. Second, uh, required legal update. Uh, this is a topic where updates will be required from time to time as case law develops. So the goal here is to bring the ordinance in line. 
So what are the specifics of the proposed update? Well, first, um, the default is basically that a permit is not required for uh, public gathering and expression events. But a permit will be required if specific criteria, very clearly delineated criteria are met. So does your event interfere with traffic? Does it restrict access? Uh, does it use a number of structures on public property? Are there repeat consecutive events at the same location? Do you have more than 75 participants? Are more toileted uh, those sorts of We also added an uh, important exception required by the court, exemption for uh, sorry, an exception for spontaneous events. So this is what's required by the court. We made it clear that if um, you know something comes up, news the news event, a political event that comes up, you don't need a permit event at City Hall or talk address contemporary events. Uh, we also clarified that violations of the chapter can be enjoined in court. Uh, we don't really interpret that as a change in the law, but just a clarification. So uh, we received uh, some thought, very thoughtful public comment, and I thought I'd just take a moment to address it here, as I'm sure that council members are interested in the response. So uh, this is a letter from uh, Mr. Galbloom of the LU. Um, so he noted uh, section 10.6503OG, and there was a request that violations not be identified as a public. Um, the response from uh, this office that, you know, so desired council, council could use to strike that language, uh, declaring violations of the chapter to be a public nuisance. With that said, uh, the city's definition of public nuisance already including that is a violation of the code. So, you know, we didn't really interpret that as law. Uh, so, uh, section 4.01010, section 16, already provides that, um, that violations Code are you know, a public, uh, uh, under the um, there uh, ten point six five zero four zero B. There was a request to not delete a sentence about fundraising at public gathering events. And I just kind of wanted to give some information. Um, ten point six five zero four zero B is sort of the definition of public gathering and expression, and the Parks and Rec director, uh, he asked that we really simplify this definition. Um, again, his office is the one that administers these, so obviously a lot of the, what they're saying. Um, uh, because he thought that the perception, uh, there was a bunch of language about nonprofit. There was a perception that as long as the event is nonprofit in nature, then the permit would be processed as a public gathering and expression event. Um, but in fact, there are many events in the city that are not for profit, uh, but would be more properly characterized as a major event, um, which is dealt with under a different topic. So, for example, a nonprofit reporting event. Um, but, you know, if it's so desired, the council could leave in language about uh, fundraising and donations, full secondary objectives. So I don't think leaving it in or out really means. Um, and the next uh, point that was brought up by public comment is a 105050A. And uh, there was a question about what is the rationale of the section, which requires a permit uh, held, at consecutive, held on consecutive days at. So, uh, you know, currently repeat events are being held in the park. Without any sort of a permit, and you know that has been an issue that has created that, um, which hasn't access resources that are intended for use by all people, rather than, you know, one person or one organization uh, chooses to have repeat at the exact same. So, uh, you know, one goal of the ordinance was to clarify that a permit would be required uh, due to the impact. You know, I think that this is a reasonable time, place, restriction. Uh, it's not closing down opportunities, and it's again, folks can actually hold repeat events that they would just get up. So, and the last comment that was brought up uh, by um, Mr. Galbloom was section ten point six five oh five oh a three 
B and H. Uh, he noted that there needs to be an and or at the end. And I agree. Thank you. That's a clerical error. I really appreciate um, the so for those edits put in should. Okay. I made it very short, but I realized that uh, very uh, heavy city council meeting today. So that's all for Thank you for those clarifications and presentation. I will up uh, questions from council members at this time. Okay. Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation, Cassie. Um, you mentioned the, um, the people wanted to have repeat events, that they would need to get a permit. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. Um, what's the cost? How frequent, you know, because, um, I think there's some concern here, um, coming from the community about being able to have these. I, it seemed like you know, someone would have to go get a permit every single time they wanted to have an event and. So it wasn't clear that there's an option for an event permit. And so I'm just wondering if you can kind of speak to what that looks like and how much that is and how one would go about getting that permit. Uh, that's a good question. Um, no, I think Kelly on the line, but that would be dealt with. In, and um, <laughs> do you have any comments? Yep. Here we go. Am I off mute? All right. Got a vacuum fire up in the background here. Um, yeah, so to answer that question quickly, um, so no fee associated uh, with public gathering and expression permit. Uh, the purpose really uh, on that permit, um, again, if they're, Cassie, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's two consecutive days or more, but we have proposed the ordinance. The idea there is, again, related to those criteria that Cassie mentioned. Um, if that is impacting um, a park, general park use, um, impact neighbors over multiple days, um, that would be one of the criteria that we would ask uh, require a permit, just so that we know and we have a sense of um, you know, how long might this activity uh, occur. Um, and just have a better sense as we, again, plan in a, in a park. If we've got a Little League, for example, scheduled in a park, well, there's a of uh, expression activity going on. Forgive me, I've got a lot of noise in the background here in my office. Um, th that's really the purpose. I, I hope I'm making that clear. But um, again, it's two or more days, but no, that it's more about having a timeline and expectation of the, the presence of that activity. I would also, uh, Cassie, um, I also have our administrative supervisor on the call, Troy Head and Jones. Who's our permit officer? So I'd welcome him to as well. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm logging in from home. Hi, welcome. Hi, this is uh, Jones, Minnesota Supervisor. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Uh, so to answer Council Member Cummings' question about um, charges for permits. The application itself is free, um, so we won't charge for a permit. However, there may, may be some temporary fees as a result of impacts, so for example, trash or refuse, things that we can't get around, or if there are um, requests for police escort for raids or marches. Um, those fees may be assessed, but they're not assessed by our department. It depends on how the application itself is reviewed by other departments. Um, in terms of consecutive days or, or serial events, we can certainly put them. Um, it's important that you know, these spaces are occupied or can be occupied by other community groups or organizations. And so we want to offer, as best we can, an equitable, equitable approach to use of these spaces. Um, we get repeat requests, for example, for the town clock or for Sister City Circle. We will make sure that those spaces are accessible by the public or also by other community organizations that wish to express their, their messages as well. 
hope that answers the question, uh, Council Member Cummings. That helps a lot. And then I just, I guess I have a brief follow up. Is there any um, limit in terms of the number of days that a serial event can take place under one of the permits? Uh, there's no particular limit currently um, with the draft ordinance or what, what's being proposed. Um, we do request that, um, you know, different parties do consider um, leaving available dates for other competing interests or other interests that may be um, on, not on the calendar yet. Um, but the, I believe this does still um, allow for the director to promulgate <coughs> some rules under the conditions of a, a approval or conditions of use. Very much. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, so, as a fault, uh, that was a question I had, and having that answered, staff applying. Um, I have a couple of other questions related. Um, I think it's 10.6550 and kind of the conditions under which it would be required. Um, so I'm, and some of these are, I, I recognize that they are in response to particular aired by some of them, and that they are concerns that general uh, may arise in the context of public gatherings uh, ongoing or shorter. Um, so I guess I'm I'm wondering about how the staff kind of how determination will be made about whether or not certain list how it would be determined that they are being violated or that they would potentially be violated. I mean, it seems a little um, kind of speculative, um, which is understandable as well. And no judgment there. I mean, it is trying to anticipate different scenarios. So I, I get that. Um, but for example, um, things like, um, Let's see, I'm trying to find the ones that I was in particular wanted to call out. And so one of them is, I guess it's new F, it was, um, will require additional gray toilet and sanitary facilities. I mean, how is that that uh, an event would require that? That it's been a little ambiguous. And given that the city itself is not required to provide uh, restrooms and <laughs> sanitary facilities, um, even within its own operation, in some cases um, uh, for the public. You know, I just, I guess, I just wonder how how that that interpreted and implemented. Um, and so that's one. And we don't have page numbers on these, but I think it's on page four of the draft ordinance. Um, so that's one, and then um, a question about you know, what percentage of a given public space is being utilized for the purpose. You know, I mean that also seems like it's up to significant interpretation. Um, and I'm just thinking about particular examples, but I'll won't raise them right now. Sake of trying to get those basic questions answered and and not make it about the. So those are, are so, two that I wonder about. Yeah, let me just, I'll, I'll take a shot at that and then um, Cassie or Tony Elliott may want to weigh in, but we've gone through a considerable effort in this drafting process to make the criteria as objective as reasonably possible so that it's not a staff sort of gut reaction or judgment as to whether or not these conditions exist. They in general are observable um, and measure the dimensions of area used versus the dimensions of usable area of a park. Uh, I suspect that um, Council Member Brown, you, you uh, focused on 
Item F, which is will require additional temporary toilet and sanitary facilities. Um, <clears throat> my sense is that in most instances, the need for a permit will rise mostly for recurring events so that we have some experience with event um, and the manner in which it is conducted before we, before the staff makes a, a, determine, uh, a determination based on objective uh, observations that these conditions are are applicable. So, um, so because I, I think one of our major concerns in working on this ordinance was to eliminate the sort of subjectivity that could create problems under the First Amendment analysis that we need to that we need to undertake in order to ensure that this is um, legally defensible. Thank you for that, and and I appreciate the um, intention. You know, not to say that this isn't perhaps based compared to what we've had on the books in the past, make creating the potential for more objective decision making. Um, it just seems with things like whether or not you need a bath. Um, you know, if, if that's really going to be an objective decision, then it would be helpful to hear what those criteria would be. Um, is it a certain number of people? Is it somebody reporting that they observe somebody, you know, <laughs> using, uh, you know, you know, going, you know, not having facilities and still taking care of business? I mean, what are, like, there's, there's a lot of questions there, and I don't want to get into weeds on that here. But just to say that there's, um, you know, without it being clear what those, what, what would be considered, you know, what, what goes into the consideration, of, it just doesn't feel objective yet, I guess. Okay. I, I agree that there, that it's, that it's challenging to um, drill down at, at the, at the um, level of, Making an ordinance of general applicability, it's it's uh, difficult to drill down to the level of detail that would be required to implement the ordinance, and so um, so there will be have there will have to be some some regulations uh, and standards that are uh, identified and implemented at the staff level in order to ensure that that we are uh, approaching these items objectively and and based on measurable criteria. And it would be helpful if that could also be available <clears throat> generally to the council and the public. It would, um, it would, it would certainly need to be made available to the public, and would be obviously. Helpful. Thank you, Lumber Brown. Are there um, other council questions or? I move on to public comment. Okay. We get out to public comment at this time, and we did have one group that uh, was approved for extra time. Us, Robert Norris. That number, I believe, is 4844. Um, I'm here, ready to speak. You're Great. all ready to at least allow me about this. Um, you know, I'm wondering where this is coming from. For Cassie, and I guess that was Tony. Be Tony. Um, there was a letter from Cassie demanding that not bombs apply for permits or be immediately forced away from its uh, place at the town clock about a month and a half ago. And now bombs spoke and said, look, I don't know where you are. We don't apply for permits. We've already discussed this whole thing. If you have any problems with anything doing, let us specifically that something else. Um, and so it looks like this is a specific attempt, at least in part, to go after bombs. It also, of course, impacts a lot of other things like the DIY parade held on New Year's Eve. It, it impacts any kind of demonstrations, let's say, that were held that uh, went to the houses of 
city council members uh, about two years ago when they were holding closed meetings that were not accessible to the public. COVID, they refused to go into the civic auditorium and where they public that they could be held accountable. So instead, people went to their house, made uh, loud noises. Now they weren't they weren't violating the law, though perhaps some would say they were. In which case, they could have been charged under existing laws. That's the real issue. What is the need for this kind of a thing, other than to give essentially to throw a roadblock in and make people nervous about going to protest at all? Uh, it, this, these so-called reasonable considerations do not sound so reasonable to me, and they attack traditional kind of protest. I mean, you can be face criminal charges if you join an unpermitted protest, and you didn't even know it was unpermitted. I guess no. I think you have to. Somebody tells you it's unpermitted, and then you continue to be there. You might say the First Amendment is my permit. Well, in Santa Cruz, that's no longer the case under this ordinance. You better have a permit. Now, if there's a real claim about a real problem, often the people who are doing the protest, whether it's the Resource Center for Nonviolence or other groups, help to alleviate the difficulty. But the notion of giving the very people who you're often protesting against, to wit, the city manager, the city council, the city attorney, uh, some agencies of the city that are being abusive, that you should give them the power to deny you or accept you a, a permit and, and you have to go to them to get it, is really pretty preposterous. And it's sort of like going to King George III for a permit to protest against the British government in 1775. It's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. So it's also true, of course, that if you try to change the route of your protest, that's a crime, according to this. You can be penalized and fined for doing this kind of thing. This sets up all kinds of tripwires, which are pretty darn nasty. And I remember these these ordinances. I mean, there's a, there was, of course, a similar ordinance that I opposed. I guess its predecessor ordinance. I also thought was bad for similar reasons. But it's we have to look at what the real reasons for this are. I think that I think if Cassie wants to hold food not bombs to account for problems, let her talk about bombs directly and say what her concerns are. Not vague and and broad concerns about oh, there's neighbors about trash and when, in fact, the area is quite clean, when it's cleaned up every day. Um, we have a situation where the city wants to ignore or criminalize alternate services like Brent Adams, Whitbridge Service, cold shoulder them. Uh, his community-friendly campground experience is hijacked, sidelined, and monetized, and he's denied grants. Who now bomb similarly has to seek all its money. It, it does, you know, it does willingly and joyfully seek, seek its funding from the community rather than from government. Because it doesn't want to be held accountable to government. But the city is not interested, as we saw with the Benchlands discussion during oral communication. They don't care what's going on in the Benchlands as far as people getting sick, people having inadequate services. That in fact, instead, what's happening is they want more ordinance to, to enforce against the visible presence of homeless people, the visible reality of protests that make them uncomfortable. And to limit protests that are spontaneous, and there's an exception for spontaneous protests, to the town clock or city hall is outrageous. Suppose some merchant is engaging in racist activity and people want to hold a mass protest there. Well, I think they damn well should. You know, if they want to, if there's exclusion against homeless people and people want to go to that store in front of it and make and pick it there, and they damn well should. So therefore, these are some of the concerns I have, and I hope others will raise other concerns. I'm glad, I'm glad Peter Geldblum brought some of these issues up, and thank you, I guess, to the attorneys for trying to respond for the first time in my knowledge to an actual uh, individual member of the public, albeit the president of the ACLU locally, and his Is the concerns. buzzer ring? Is that the buzzer? Thank you. Yes. Okay. I'm good. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, okay, the next member of the public for public comment on this item is Reggie Meisler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so funny how, like, vague Deputy City Attorney Cassie Bronson is being about the reason why this ordinance is being developed. I, like, I don't understand why she's being vague, because obviously, like, you guys just get whatever you want. Like, 
is is there really like a big concern about messaging here? I don't know. But I just thought that that was a little uh, cute, I guess, because um, I mean, anyone who's been paying attention knows that Bronson has been kind of making it her mission to stop Food Not Bombs from beating the house. As Robert Norris mentioned, you can read in the Sentinel, you know, from February, Bronson worked to force Food Not Bombs to get a special uh, charitable cooking permit, as well as, ding, 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 a public gathering permit, the very permit we are discussing here today. And they were get it because they understand, like Robert Norris does, that uh, not only would permit having to follow them make it effectively impossible for Food Not Bombs to keep people daily, um, it is against the whole notion of sort of community organizing to meet their own need. Um, and so it's, this is just such a, like, silly, silly situation. I mean, it's, let's just, like, remove the veil. We know what's going on. Like, come on. And this is a particularly problematic ordinance, not just not bombs or sort of like anarchist style direct action, but also just for like labor, right? Which are definitely like happening more and more often. If I want to do a labor strike, it's it's and it needs to be you know impactful. It's gonna affect traffic. It's gonna affect you know um, walkways and things like that because that's what lines do, right? And so I find it interesting that. People could say here that they support like Starbucks unionization effort, but then would do something like this, which would make labor strikes require a permit to have a picket line, but then give that permit requesting ability to the city manager, who, let's face it, I mean, probably has the boss in his, right? Like, city manager isn't like uh, getting lobbied by workers, he's getting lobbied by capitalists who the workers are trying to strike again. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, what more can be said, really? Okay, next member of the public is I am watching you. Yes, thanks. Uh, when this public gathering ordinance came before the council last time, it is my remembrance, I solely spoke pretty clearly about how I literally violated and the only acknowledgement was some vague assurances, oh, we don't do that, securing wink not approval from at least one council member, the rest somewhat silently, I assume, unconcerned on the subject. I'm glad to see upon review at least some of the excess restrictions on are being removed, and I applaud the effort by the city attorney's office moving this ordinance in that direction. But I'm not fond of section 4, 420 being put here. That laundry list of so many untrained, unqualified public employees that can issue citations, but that is a different ordinance. No, the one with the seemingly endless list of so and so's and their designees authorized to issue citations from the books during a time of pandemic emergency are now routinely inserted here. While I don't have an objection to making a clear designation preference of the clock tower in the city hall courtyard that may be used for spontaneous speech events, the wording seems to indicate to me those are the only places spontaneous free speech is permitted. The limitation uh, to 48 hours following news, et cetera, seems overly restricted. And if permits for food, not bombs were issued to seemingly own the clock tower use for it, they are just there forever anyway. Would you really be designated free speech allowed sites when uh, making them are actually they're unavailable? Uh, perhaps I misunderstand. If so, oop. Disclaimer, I find food dot bombs an awful homeless grandstander to me. However, public places are public places, and there are a lot of those, many of great size accommodating large crowds. Free speech is free speech, and people also have the right to assemble especially involving or address of grievances against, for instance, the government. So I'm not sure this correction goes far enough, and situations can still exist where the people, as I said last time, don't need no stinking permits for free speech, but I like the increase to 75 people gathering size, and overall, this is an improvement in what is a rare event for me. I agree, you should vote yes.
Thank you. The next member of the public, Alicia Cool. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I definitely think that this kind of, you know, is too close to, you know, breaching, you know, the right to free speech and the right to assembly. I, you know, I would say that I know that you're advised by Kathy Bronson, and but although she's an attorney, always right. Uh, we've witnessed that previously in the past. Um, I do think that this is a direct attack against Food Not Bombs. I'm wondering, you know, what the future looks like and Food Not Bombs doesn't participate, you know, because they have a, I guess, um, you know, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. It's a tool to feed people. It's a priority. They are prioritizing the need to feed the people in our community over the fact that you said that it's wrong or have passed sort of ordinance against that. Um, you know, some of those people that eat there, are, that's, that's they get a meal. And when people's needs are met, it, the safety of our community is met. And what are people going to do when they can't get that meal? Uh, meal service around town has drastically decreased. Uh, many services have fallen. We've, we've lost shelter space. We've lost meal services. And so, you know, Do Not Bombs has been helping the community for years now. And for the city to not recognize that and assist them, rather than constantly try to find a way to move them around, um, is just, is always baffling. Um, and the reason that they meet every day in one place is because people know that that's the space to get services. When you move them away, it's hard for people to locate services and they don't get their needs met. And so this is something that if you care about health and safety, you will really address what I'm saying um, and really consider the thing and not just go by the fact that the attorney wants to get rid of you know, visible homelessness and doesn't want this gathering. Um, and I will also say that I've witnessed Food Not Bombs being very clean. They clean up some of these reasons for justifying this ordinance make no sense at all. So, you know, please really listen to what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Our next phone number ends in 1197. Hi, this is Kathy Samuel. A lot of folks are very wondering. COVID.
Thank you. Our next caller is uh, the letter R. Ahead and unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I just want to echo, you know, what mostly everybody has said so far, but especially something that Alicia said, um, that when people's needs are met, our city is safer. Um, so why does the city keep trying to make it a criminal offense for people to meet their needs? Um, whether that's gathering to get free food or living in a car. That's it. Okay. Uh, that like it includes public comment on this item. And uh, we're taking, I'll bring it back to council before taking further comments or questions from council members. I will ask to move the recommended action. And if that is made, discussion. is perfectly acceptable to vote no on a motion before making a separate motion class friendly amendments are in uh, as with council member questions after a council member has provided comments all other members will have an opportunity before i recognize a council thank you for working through this agenda today and um, bring it over. Uh, Council Member Myers and then Member Cummings. You're muted. Yeah, um, appreciate all the um, balancing act. Places fighting right now. Clarifications that have been made to the ordinance language or is uh, needed. Johnson mentioned a little bit over. I am. Recommendation is recommendation. Okay. <laughs> we have a uh, motion by Council Member Myers. Second by Council Member Holder, was that? Is that what I Okay, and now we can have discussion on that motion. Uh, Council Member Cummings. I think Council Member Brown's morning. I was, I dropped my hand for a second accidentally, so but way yeah go ahead council member coming okay thank you <clears throat> mayor and i just want to thank those members of the public for um calling in and raising the concerns that they had um, i think some valid points came up that um I'd like to see if we can get some clarification on um i'll just say that you know i'm having a difficult time with this item um I do think that there's been some reasonable changes brought forward by the staff. Um, it sounds like you know, there's a number of barriers that aren't put in, for example, um, you know, the fact that from free, there's um, no timeline really associated with them. Um, <clears throat> I would like to get some information on, sounds like one of the big concerns from the members of the public is how this will impact not bombs. I know that they have been operating Primarily on a private lot, and for most of the well, most of the pandemic, and up till most recently, um, before they left the lot on Pacific Clock Tower. <clears throat> so I'm just um, curious about what are some of the, you know, what the, the current permit 
requirements are and what not bombs would be or what what's been this effort with working with not bombs because i think the concern is that they're operating on public property like forward the way to cycle so i'm just kind of wondering what has been going on with the city and bombs and what the process is go ahead um a letter was sent to bombs a while ago asking Get a permit under uh, ten five as the um, they did not get a permit um, and you know we took a close look at point six five and you know we you know there are, there are some updates that we need to make to this uh, chapter and uh, so that's that's sort of uh, where we're at as as far as how it's going to impact not bombs I can't say that I I think. Um, you know, there is a section 10.65210, which is permit condition, and um, it is basically as when necessary to protect the safety of persons or property or to provide adequate path control or to provide reasonable public access to or use of sidewalks or beaches or other public areas. You know, the permit office may condition the issuance on um, a reasonable time, place, environment. So, I mean, that's kind of what I would expect would happen is that they would apply for the a permit and the city would issue a permit and the city would impose reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions uh, to be able to uh, better balance, um, you know, as uh, Councilor Myers indicated, you know, the varying needs uh, on our property. So, you know, we have set very, very heavily used property and there are so many comp competing needs. And so um, th that's really sort of the idea behind the positions to, to allow this to balance. Cassie, yeah, and then um, I did have, I did want to see if we could follow up on um, some of the other points that were brought up. So one of the members of the public kind of mentioned, you know, labor strike. Um, I, I was thinking back to the Occupy movement when that occurred years ago, a couple um you know it could occur again and then people may just occupy clock tower or some other part of the city and then <clears throat> also thinking about like for example last year the, the i can't remember if it was last year 2020 but when the offeranda was at the clock tower that was kind of out there you know, almost an entire year um maintained by members of the public so i'm just kind of wondering you know when certain things like that her, how does this permit or like you know what what are we sorry, I'm having a hard time articulating this I guess what are some of the issues that might arise a passionate group of citizens that are you know standing for multiple days protesting for multiple days at a certain site and um, you know having this move forward in this way I guess like what are some of the, the impacts that we might foresee or how we'll um, navigate this ordinance because I think a lot of people will, will feel like their rights are being violated. They're just trying, um, whether it's the offerenda in mourning for a year, what have you. But I'm just really trying to get at you know, how can we make sure that this is um, going to allow for protests for multiple days on end, necessary, um, not create another friction um, place. Yeah, I mean, I just, I would sort of emphasize, maybe I didn't emphasize this enough. enough. Um, I believe that this ordinance is opening up restrictions, to be quite honest, um, as compared to what the previous ordinance said. Um, you know, we have an, an increase in terms of number of people that would reach the threshold to be from 50 to 75. We decreased the number of days that you would need to, before the permit to be able to issue uh, the um, and we created this very clear spontaneous events exception. And then this is all intended to sort of, you know, make it less restrictive and you know, more compliant with what, how we think the court would address it. So I just want to sort of put that out there. Um, but, you know, to address your concern, I mean, you know, this is sort of similar to the prior comment. You know, if there are going to be events that go on for a number of days and not by a city base, um, you know, I think the appropriate reaction is a letter first. 
hey, would you please get a permit? Can we please work this out? And, you know, and then if, if that doesn't work, I think that there are you know, uh, remedies listed in the, the um, ordinance, including, you know, potentially going to court to try to resolve. Thanks. I just wanted to, yeah, make sure that it was clear that the city is you know, really trying to take reasonable measures to work with groups that are, you know, protesting or whether it's feeding homeless people for free or whether it's a protest that's going to, you know, be prolonged. The city's really trying to work with folks on these issues. Um, so thanks for those comments. And, um, yeah, I think I'll hold the rest of my question. Okay, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Holder. Thank you. Um, so I, since Food Not Bombs and their particular experience has now been uh, placed on the table, I'm I'm gonna um, I, I want to say about that and ask a question. Um, I'm I guess I'll, I'm I I'll say I live a block away from Clock Tower. I walk by yeah. it almost every day. Um, during the not bombs hours, uh, sometimes after. And what I see and what I have experienced is stark contrast to what I would say are very limited complaints that have been delivered to the city about the operation, um, how that entails access to the block tower. It's on most days, it's empty. Um, there are not, there do not be, um, competing groups want to use that space. Um, and so I think there is some of that, the communications that we've had, and I'm, I'm going to say they've been relatively limited. Um, now, you know, I've heard from other, some of you that, you know, it's been terrible and you know, we have to do something. And I just haven't heard that in the community. I haven't seen that with my own eyes. Um, and in fact, I've received, um, and I, many of these, I didn't, haven't, I didn't go back and look if every council member received every, I received, um, but um, mostly in support of what they did. And so I'm concerned about uh, writing uh, an ordinance that um, you know is arguably less restrictive, and I appreciate the thought that's gone into this, and you know, trying to find that balance. Um, you know, I, I guess I I just wonder, you know, what what the what the goal is <laughs> with respect to food not bombs, because so what would change if food not bombs, you know, asked for and received a permit, what would be different than what's happening now? Um, it's, it's kind of an open question. I'd love to hear if there, if if uh, ask here if others have thoughts on what that might be. I'd like to hear that. Um, you know, I just wanted to put that out on the table as part of the context of the conversation. Um, you know, I do have about language written in that does target a one that is um, arguably, um, you know, uh, created some challenges, um, and that you know, that people that people have raised concerns, but um, that by and large, not resulted in that. Yeah. Um, perhaps for a few people, they feel very disturbed, um, but I have not widespread. About that. So again, I I guess I'd like to hear um, a little bit about that. Um, also, ask if um, kind of what the basis was today. Um, today, you, know, you would have to, if you're going to days have to trust the. Um, and then, um, well, I'll ask that, and I have. I <coughs> 
seems like it's a, it's an attempt to, uh, it's like a, a solution looking for a problem. My perspective. And I know that's not a perspective that's shared by all of my colleagues, um, but the data that I have suggests that not as big of a problem as just okay. So I will try to address question. Um, so I think, you know, I sort of addressed earlier, um, I don't want to get too into the specifics of the bomb situation because, I mean, this is an ordinance of general applicability and you know, it really is intended to address a variety of, although I know that this has not been, so this is what we're all interested in. Um, you know, again, we have the 5210, which sort of governs what types of permit conditions issued. And I would anticipate that we would use that section to try to come up with a reasonable permit. Unfortunately, I mean, I can't tell you exactly what those are at the moment. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to um, sort of Think of them off the top of my head on a, an open city council meeting, um, but you know, happy to stand about this. Council. Um, and what was your other? Do you have another question? Um, well, so another question that, yeah, most of that was comment and kind of contact with my question. Um, another question was the rationale for today. Oh, sure. You know, I mean. The two day that was sort of intended to get at you know, repeat events, organizations that are using the same exact for over. I mean, the council could certainly change that. We could uh, set it to something like three days or or something similar. Um, but that it was really just uh, address the repeat. Okay, and then quickly, last question um, because I, I know you did. Uh, Cassie. You suggested that you had, and I, I appreciate that good faith effort, uh, try that agreement around it. So I guess I'm wondering, um, it was that, I'm just trying to understand the difference, the current circumstances or the, the moment in time when you made that request, the, how that would be different ordinance. Um, we don't require permits now, but the idea was that you were asked voluntarily that no no a permit was always required okay so, um, so, so but that we looked at the chapter that was um requiring the permit we thought you know this work um so that's really a permit is required yeah okay so a permit is required and why do we need um this ordinance is an amendment to the uh chapter that requires the permit uh because been looking at that chapter, thought you know, this could be a lot more clear just for public usage and consumption. I really strongly believe that all of our ordinance very clear. And also just to make sure that it is compliant with the latest precedent. Thanks. Director Elliott, do you have anything to add? I, I think Cassie covered it really well. I think the only other this is that 1065 and 1064 have a lot of similarities between our special event permits and a public gathering expression. So part of the clarification uh, on this from the perspective of Parks and Rec is to really delineate between a special event, so say like a big concert, for example, uh, versus expression. This is some of those definitional changes um, those clarifications um, and a bit of that simplification really that Cassie alluded to um, and really just trying to clarify this, that distinction between 1064 and 1065. An example of that is historically, you know, Girl Scouts selling Girl uh, Scout cookies uh, in, a, in a park um, is argued, is that a special event? Is that commercial activity or is that freedom of expression? And so some of these definition changes um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about the town clock in this, but this really gets into a lot of nuance between what is a special event, freedom of expression, and really trying to clarify that uh, from the perspective of and fairness from our, our permitting staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. 
Uh, okay, so then we have uh, Council Member Golder. Thank you. Um, I don't want to dwell on not bombs, but I just have to say I have had the opposite experience of Council Member Brown in <clears> that <throat> even before food not bombs, the town clock, um, I get daily emails, phone calls, text messages of people having experienced complaints, whatever. That isn't what I was going to say. What I what I was going to say is I feel like um, another objective of bringing these changes to the ordinance would be also, um, you know, we had the, was, was it the maniac ride out that we talked about, we were talking about it during our public safety thing as that causing some significant impacts to the city. And so my hope and that, and I wasn't even going to not bombs when reading this, is that we would be addressing some of the um, nuisances and dangerous activity that happened in that event. And so my question is, would these changes also address the issues that we had with, you know, the, the people getting injured and the traffic and the other things that happened during that event as well? So, um, so you know, this is a gathering and expression event. You know, I'm, I apologize, I'm not actually right out all the way about it. Um, so, so. I don't know if that would be a public gathering and expression event, potentially. Um, you know, really what this is, is encouraging people to have their larger events or repeat events to get permits so that the city can plan for these events appropriately. And Just to speak to that briefly, that Maniac ride out brought in about 5,000 people from all over the place to a ride out through town. So I think in that case, uh, that would require a permit. I would think about that as more of a special event permit, actually, over an entire park. Um, but again, the, the current language, 1064 and 1065, leaves a, a little lack of clarity, I think, and it could potentially be argued right out. Uh, is freedom of expression potentially? But I, uh, again, this is what we're trying to trying to clarify. I think that one very clearly was a, a special event needing uh, traffic control and uh, you know, crash and restroom so forth. That many. Absolutely. So that's my hope is that so that's <laughs> where I was going with this. Is I felt like this, this these changes would address that from happening if it was to happen again this year, or I forget what that happened. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I will just start myself. Uh, uh, Director Elliot, remind uh, me and the public. How many different kinds of permits there are um, to parks and recreation department? I think there's like five or six different types of event permits. It's a great question, and I'll lean on our administrative supervisor, Jane Hedden Jones, here on the call. I think what we referenced in the packet. Uh, we've got public major and public minor events, uh, and then these public gathering and expression. Um, uh, permits um, as well, but I'll lean on Trey here uh, for more detail. Of course, uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor, Director Elliott. Um, yes, we do have several different event permits, um, public major events, public minor events. We also uh, issue film, video, and recording permits, um, public gathering expression permits, um, neighborhood block party permits, and street closure permits. Okay. And so these changes are specific to the public gathering and expression event. That is correct. So the ordinance changes are specific to that permit. And um, a lot of my questions were answered at a time, but um, there were some interesting points brought up um, in that also I went to, my mind went to some of the larger um, events like the bike ride out, um, you know, um, that some some folks could consider to be a public gathering and expression event. So I think the definitions of the types of events needed clarity and and um, seeing those um, that clarity in in these amendments helpful um, in differentiating. Some of the different 
right? Uh, those different permits. Um, and so um, it's interesting to consider um, you know, the perceptions of some of the members of our public that called in um, as well in terms of um, immediately thinking about examples such as food not bombs at the clock tower. And um, so I mean, it sounds like um, that would be what type of permit they fall under. Yeah, I think that's right. Is, is uh, freedom of expression. Um, and um, so uh, this would, um, the changes in this, you know, there were concerns brought up um, and impact to their action clock. And so if I think of, of them as an example with changes, um, um, they would need to get a permit for this permit, public gathering or special event, and they would only be allowed to opt two days within what did. The, the two day trigger is what requires it. And it wouldn't necessarily um, prohibit them from operating more than two days uh, consecutively in one particular location, although it would allow conditions to be imposed address specific concerns and one of those conditions might be uh, to alternate locations and uh, um, and to um, and I think city staff would be would be assisting in identifying alternative locations where they could operate part time part of, part of the week as well as continuing to operate uh, at the tower yeah thank you I was uh, it's it certainly would not uh, restrict food not bombs ability to provide food service on a daily basis uh, but reasonable condition uh, attached to um, definitely uh, many members of the public have called multiple times held multiple times um, as well as those that comment tonight. And I think that everyone's in agreement that the service, although this isn't a, an item about food, not bombs, but, um, you know, their service is appreciated. Um, anyone uh, eating uh, those that are hungry or off food, that is appreciated. However, um, some of the uh, consequence around that, uh, which I see this ordinance guidelines accountability in terms of damage to the area, um, the, the walkways, um, garbage left um, during, uh, you know, plates and, and food along the way. Uh, um, Trying to think off the top of my head, context. So um, I see that permit here, uh, addition to what would have, what they would have now, changes. Either way, it's accountability for um, impact the, the area. Oh, I see. Is that correct? And um, I appreciate the other examples. Um, certainly, by our clock, but of our other shared public space, um, no matter what public gathering expression event. So, thank you for making those clarifications and answering some of the questions prior. And um, we do have a motion. Everyone has had a chance to speak, I believe. Um, let's see. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken yet that would like it? 
Okay, Councilmember Cummings, I see you have your hand up. Thank you, Mayor. I, I had a couple more questions, possible friendly amendment to make based on kind of some, some what I've heard. Um, I guess for me, one of the things that this ordinance, um, and I want to thank Councilmember Golder for picking up the ride out because that wasn't something that I was thinking about, that I think definitely needs to be addressed. And I just want to say that, like, I feel that this ordinance really heavily focusing on beaches, parks, and open spaces and not in that ride out event. And so I don't know if something needs to be back specifically deal with that kind of gathering um because that did have significant negative impact on the community and um definitely need to figure out how we can you know keep that from happening in the future but you know really a lot of what i see in terms of some of the new languages um you know for example g h and i all focus on you know um for example g is will occupy areas that are marked by as by reservation only in a city park beach or open space the next one you know will occupy or negatively impact sense of habitat city park or open space and um i know it mentions like sidewalks alleys other right way but you know, getting to that impacts that we saw from that event i think it'd be good if we had something come forward specifically to address those kinds of events um because that was in throughout the entire city blocking traffic there were all sorts of impacts it would also be great to hear from the city attorney if there's been any kind of follow up with the organizer in terms of um, charges or you know whether that's going to court. Um, and that doesn't have to happen. Putting that out there's a comment. Um, but the one is well, the one thing I do have an issue with um, is really around item number under ten six five zero five zero A two, and as that relates to um, under three F. So, you know, really saying that, um, you know, these permits um, required if it lasts more, if, some, if the event lasts more than an hour in duration. Um, and then later on, we have this language on will require additional temporary toilet facilities. And it seems like if there's something that's happening, whether it's multiple days in a row, but it's only like two hours a day. Um, that really doesn't seem like it would require us or the organizers to have to get a uh, bathroom, you know, and have hand washing and and, and um, toilet facilities. So I'm just kind of curious about because that seems like obviously with not bombs of feeding people you're there for more than an hour, likelihood of somebody needing to the bathroom to be high. But if you have something like the offerenda or there's a protest that's occurring multiple days in a row, multiple hours a day. It doesn't seem like you would necessarily need to have, to have the organizers, um, you know, purchase a, a porta potty and hand washing facilities. Which that also I will point out takes time. I haven't had that, um, for work related events. So I'm just wondering if someone can speak to that because I'd be comfortable revert that <laughs> language to A instead of will for F. Yeah, I think there's a, if I could just, I think there's a misunderstanding in the ordinance that I hope I can explain to you really quickly. So a permit is triggered if beyond public property, uh, so that's A1, it's going to last more than one hour and it meets at least one of the criteria under subdivision. So on public property, more than one hour and there's for some reason additional toilet facilities are needed, then you need to get a permit. Not necessarily saying that if you're there for an have that helpful. You're welcome. Um, yeah, that's those are all my questions. I guess the last one would be, um, what's I got two last ones, two last questions. What's the turnaround? What would be the turnaround time on the permit? I guess because if somebody, for example. There's a multiple day protest or something that's going to go, say, for 14 days. After two days, they would need to get a permit. But then, what would be the turnaround time on when people would actually receive that permit? It might lead into the time that they're site. I, I can take a shot at that. The, the uh, ordinance requires the application to be submitted 
uh, at least three business days before the event. So if, um, you know, by default, then uh, the maximum turnaround would be three business days from the date that the application is. I guess I'm wondering, as a friendly amendment, then if we can increase the um, in the, um, I guess it's one of the following criteria. Um, is conducted on a regularly scheduled basis at a single location more than four consecutive days per week. And it seems like there's other provisions that would kick in the permit, but I think that in particular, the reason why um, is largely due to if this is going to be something that, and maybe staff can comment on this, but if it's going to be a reoccurring protest, for example, like the operanda, you know, being able to give that time for people to apply for the permit if it's going to be a longer multi day event, um, and then have that turnaround so they can get the permit. I think that's the rationale behind trying to just provide a little bit more time for when it would kick in under that item. Council member coming. Um, are you um, asking on 3D about two, four days versus two consecutive days? Yes. So, give me section. Yeah, it's um, 1065.050 public gathering expression event. Um, under A, yeah. Can you just say it one more time in the section? It's on the screen, and it's, yeah, there it is. Do you have a section number? I think that I guess I'll ask staff my understanding, but um, you brought up the offender a couple times. It was sort of a that was sort of an act. Being there, I'm so I guess I guess what I'm trying to do my ears of uh, our parks just parks are heavy. So I think just trying to make sure that this is our I guess I would look to maybe half. Somebody, you know, more than a. Yeah, thank you, council members. Um, yeah, I think as Tony Condotti mentioned a little bit ago, I think the goal here is just objectivity. And so, yeah. I guess from my perspective, whether it's two days or four days, I don't necessarily have uh, a lot of heartburn with that. Um, I think the the key is just in having those objective criteria here in the language so that we've got uh, a threshold we, so that we're really clear on what that is and when that is. So that's just my my initial um, perspective on that, but I'll, I'll look to Cassie or the city manager if they've got different Suggestion of Paul and my 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 perspective. Um, what's going to be reasonable? I think it was reasonable. Three would be reasonable. Four would be reasonable as well. So I think it's good. 
I would agree with that. I, I think as Councilmember Wire has mentioned, this is about striking a balance and what passes that reasonability test. This is one of other metric, not the only metric that we would be determining when a permit would be triggered. So I don't know that I have any major reservations either. It's really just a policy question. That length of time over time is the second amendable. Um, I guess my last, um, I guess my last comment, I, I can't remember what the question was, but um, I, I just hope that you know. Moving forward, the staff to work with do not bombs. I know um, it's challenging and difficult sometimes to um, working with do not bombs, but I think it has been pointed out that they did do good service the pandemic. Um, they do good service feeding for homeless. I guess yeah. Now I'm remembered. I'm reminded. My last question. Um, you know, if a group currently is not willing to fill out a, a file for a permit and pass this, still not willing file for a permit, I guess, like, what's the consequences? Is there any change? I take that, Tony. <laughs> I? Um, I, I mean, I think there, there is a change to the section 030 regarding violations in addition to citations for infraction, misdemeanor violations. Um, there, there could be uh, civil action brought for uh, court injunction. All right, well, I just hope that, you know, we can, regardless of who it is, that we're able to really, uh, you know, work with the community, um, try to figure out ways that we can allow people to express themselves, um, exercise their First Amendment right, and it seems like this is really trying to provide more flexibility, but also accountability for all parties involved. So um, I think it'll be really important that we monitor how this plays out, because Seem like it's restricting people's ability to exercise. We'll definitely need to visit it, but also understanding that we need to make sure that public space is accessible for to uh, less. So those are all my questions and comments. Um, I'll be supporting this. Thank you, Council Member Cumming. Council Member Wire, Discussion on this item. We have a first by Council Member Myers and a second by Council Boulder. The friendly amendment by uh, Council Member Cumming. And so at the time, oh, did I just see more hands go up? Council Member Myers? Mayor, I just wanted to let you know um, <clears throat> that I've got text tonight or saying that great because I audio is breaking up. I don't know what that I just wanna like Bonnie, maybe. Is it? I've gotten. So, community TV um, or Zoom, or is that the same thing? We don't have to solve it now, but I thought maybe during, if we took a break after the vote. Okay. Uh, City Clerk Bonnie Bush. Thank you. Yeah, we have had. Um, I've gotten a well, and what we've gathered on base the um, live show that is on our website. Two other options: television line that way, or to join the audio. No delay, and here if they go. 
So members of the public can go directly to Zoom or through community TV online. Right, the links are either are on the front or a Thank you. Council Member Brown, before we go to a vote. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I want to responsive uh, question about the limited days. I do think that could provide you know, a relief for uh, folks who tend to engage in kind of activities. I mean, maybe it's a weekend or a long weekend, you know, to kind of not have to this whole process that I do think that it's a reasonable amount of time and my colleagues that not going to be able to support ordinance and I before but I wanted to say before I vote no that I really understand um, the rationale for board in this direction I support most of what is proposed um, I I want to work, and I I appreciate the the role that the staff played, and I know it's a lot of work to try to find a way forward, and it's also a lot of work and conditions on the ground um, when we have public gatherings. So I I don't want to discount that, and I don't want my no vote just that I'm not about those matters. Um, I just have uh, kind of outstanding questions about. My, who's going to be affected and the potential of disproportionate impact on low income marginalized people. And, um, but I'll look forward to hearing reports on how things are going and want to be part of the process for iterative process to try to make. So I, I just want to vote no without letting you all know that. Thank you. Okay, please start. Are you ready for a roll? Members, heard. Aye. 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 Brown. No. Myers. Aye. What? Aye. Aye. That motion passes six. In favor, one no vote. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Is there any way we can uh, get a, a message on our screen, like a screen share that directs folks to Zoom directly or community online? So they can see the. the work. Can we take a, a five minute, three three to five minute, just that happen. Eight oh seven. If we return at eight ten, would that be enough time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
if council members can turn on their camera. Is city clerk ready? Thank you. Okay, hopefully this will help. And again, just as a reminder for those who weren't uh, able to get the news to tune in this morning, um, our April 26th meeting, the regular council meeting will be in person. We do have a, a April 9th special meeting that will, uh, um, but starting April 6th, as well as members of the public have the opportunity either way. Uh, Council Member Brown. It's just a quick question. Uh, I got a message from somebody who said that they were not able to hear you, Mayor, providing information, and also I think Bonnie um, Bush providing the information about an alternative way to sign in. So if that that would be yeah, helpful. and that's why I asked for a share screen message to be put up. Okay, so it'll it'll go up. Is Thanks. it up now? Probably not. I just take it on our website. Okay. Um, so also for those that can hear me, hopefully um, we will get a screen up that will give direction to join us via the direct Zoom link or via the Channel TV online link. So the on base link is currently the link that is having sound difficult. Um, so uh, hopefully those will be able to join us. That's why we took that to give people an opportunity to get the information for joining us and access those correct. Zoom link or correct channel five online. Just hear words. Better. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Return to the agenda. And that brings us to our, uh, you don't need to We are at our um, item number 31, public hearing. Item number 31 is council review of the Planning Commission's approval of the Coastal and Design Permit to authorize the development associated with the amended municipal code to the parking of oversized vehicles and to implement wide safe parking programs for unhoused residents living in oversized vehicles Resolution acknowledging environmental determination and approving of the coastal permit and design permit based on the findings listed in the draft resolution and the conditions of approval attached. So, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, joining us, the Zoom link. Or community channel 25, 
The order will be a presentation followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. Uh, in addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item. There were 551 emails that were sent to city council at cityofsanacruz.com on this item. So if, if you're interested on comment on this item, um, we'll, we will get to you shortly with us. So let's see, the first, I think um, I will, before I hand it over to council member Holder, I just wanted to we also have my Perry staff here. Um, I just really wanted to keep us focused. It's been a long agenda. I tried some new techniques um, and, and keeping our time efficient today um, and knowing that we had a very full agenda and our agendas have been full and um, several items have continued to their agendas time and um, length of time that it so um, for this item I'm um, hoping that tonight we can focus on the fact that this is a review of the permit that was issued by the Planning Commission, not a review of the Riverside Vehicle Ordinance. Uh, that ordinance um, has been approved and is in place, although not yet enforced. So certain uh, direction that was conditions were given are in place. So um, I just really want to ensure that uh, members of the public and um, all of the council members understand that this is a review of permits that were issued by planning, not of well. So council member Golder. Thank you. Um, so I did go ahead. I wanted to go ahead and start by saying that um, after the planning commission added conditions to the oversized vehicle ordinance, I communications from various members of the community who really felt blindsided and you know upset with that. And so that's why it's before us tonight. Um, I just want to give a little background for those of you that might not be aware, um, having served for the better part of 2013 on the public safety task force, this was something that came out of a recommendation from then, from, from back then, and there's been other ordinances throughout the years, been some recommendations attached that, for, that led us to this process of recent thousands of emails um, in when we were drafting the oversized vehicle ordinance and I really felt like the planning commission kind of circumvented those years of work and really the democratic process that went into creating the ordinance as it was written and um, again it was created by many people with the uh, public health and safety of the whole community in mind. And I just, I don't really have much more to say other than that's why it's here is, that's why, you know, took the liberty of calling it back up to us. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, member Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you for inviting me to speak because um, we worked together on this item. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the permit program is about solutions, about helping folks through a pathway to housing. It's the first time in the history of our city 
that the city council is committing to safe parking options. Um, we have faith-based communities and organizations that have been doing this hard work, and now we are committing to supporting these efforts and adding resources. Um, and of course, as Council Member Golder just mentioned, this didn't happen overnight. It happened over the course of years and a lot of process. Um, and it wasn't until recently through some the leadership that we were able to get it over the finish line. In this short amount of time that this passed, um, and again, as you mentioned, Mayor Bruner, the ordinance itself hasn't been enforced, but we've moved forward with the safe parking programming options. We've stood up tier one, which has three spaces associated to it, and we've started two, currently have six spaces, and um, we have not yet done tier three because the, these appeals have hampered the implementation of tier three. And just as a reminder, tier three is um, the more robust safe parking program that's connected with um, a community organization that would provide wraparound case management services. Um, so I'm hoping that we can move forward so that we can help those who the help the most. Um, and I believe tier three will be our way of getting there. Um, the conditions that were placed by the Planning Commission will affect um, implementation of the framework and it will hamper the framework. Um, I do also want to just uh, state for community members that there are spaces available right now within Tier 1 and Tier 2. These spaces are not filled up. So if there are folks who need and want a safe parking place, um, please connect with our homeless response team as there are safe spaces available. And, and just to wrap up my comments here, this is a tool to ensure that people can sleep safely in our community and that that doesn't impact the health and safety hazards of others around us. This is a tool for us to move forward with health and wellness for everyone involved. We've seen some headway in a very short amount of time and I know it took a lot of effort um, by staff to get tier one and tier two going. So I'm hoping that we can move and progress and get tier three up and running so we can help more community members. Thank you. Mike Ferry, do you have any to add? Um, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna mess around here and try to share a screen with <clears throat> Am I sharing the screen? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, you ruined about three of my slides, so I'll be able to go through a little quicker now. Uh, Y'all know why we're here. It is for um, coastal and a design permit. Project number is CP2107. <clears throat> Title 10, as was uh, stated earlier, that was approved in the fall to implement any of those parts of the ordinance in the coastal zone, you need a coastal permit and a design. So why do you need a coastal permit since Title 10 is already done? Well, the Coastal Commission considers development of the coastal zone just the placement those signs from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m., that sign by itself would require uh, the safe parking lots if they're located in some sections of the zoning or, or some sections of the Postal Commission, those would also require a coastal. Any public project that's located in the coastal zone requires a design. That's in our zoning ordinance. And then outside of the coastal permit, there could be um, locations that are chosen uh, that would require a design by itself. So what we've tried to do is craft the coastal permit, the design to implement the safe parking policy, not specific sites. So by approving this design permit and coastal permit, we'll be able to disperse these sites throughout the coastal outside of the So the quick history is that uh, those two permits went to the uh, zoning administrator who approved them. 
That approval was appealed by Santa Cruz Cares and the ACLU. <clears throat> it went to our planning commission, and as was mentioned, after a very long hearing, we were sort of surprised with a large number of revisions and additional conditions of approval. Councilmember Golder uh, called the item up for review because of those. And tonight, this is a de novo hearing where you have to look at the design permit and the coastal new. So that's why the recommendation is for your approval. So when the Title 10 changes happen, you also um, passed a motion to implement the safe parking program. It's the three tiers that have already been described by council. And this was so in February, the city is operating three safe parking locations, uh, nine vehicles that can park as part of uh, tier one and two. What we're hoping is that these will be like pilot programs. And as problems come up, we'll be able to modify some of the program requirements. Two of these locations today have additional off-street expansion capacity. Um, the current overall thinking of staff is that we're going to keep these numerous locations, but with a small number of units, perhaps six per unit, or six units per location. So this was part of the, the coastal permitting, the reasons our conditions Approval are kind of general is that we're not talking about a specific location. Work closely with Coastal Commission staff just to make sure that they would go along with these kinds of. Usually, they see a project, actual physical project. So they have gone through with us these generalities. Basically, they're going to be off-street location, public with private lots. The hours are generally going to be eight and eight a.m. Sanitation will be provided at all of no cost to the participants in the safe park. And uh, the tier three facilities that could in, include 24 seven basis, the city is now evaluating two proposals for a tier three facility. Uh, one of the conditions that was added was an operations management plan for the program. And that'll be just by staff, minimum middle procedures for informing law of a nightly availability of safe parking spaces. So if somebody's in the program, they've got a permit, there isn't a safe parking spot that's available to them, they'll be directed to park out on the street somewhere. PD would be notified of, of the vehicle and the location, and they won't be ticketed. Uh, there's a code of conduct participation agreement as part of the management plan. And I attach those to the staff report. Hopefully you saw those. Some members of the community suggested some ideas that they would initiate. One was a voucher program for oversized vehicles, uh, waste dumping. Another was financial support subsidies towards vehicle repair and registration. The city's also looking at possible waste dumping measures. So our recommendation um, is that you approve these permits, postal permit, the design permit, and approve them with the recommended conditions that are attached to the resolution. Those conditions are, they reflect the seven pages of analysis in the staff report that talks about the planning commission recommendations. So it's our recommendation is for you to look at that part of the resolution. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, if you have questions, it looked like we had a whole battery of people ready to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so um, at this time, there will be questions from council members. And not seeing any questions at this time. 
Uh, Council Member Myers. Muted. Hi. Um, I had a question. Um, been a number of steps. So, member. Um, does staff have any to seem to language in the staff report all the various in reports that there would seem to be some responses to the planning commission chain stated blah 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 so i'm just curious was there a meeting they're meeting with most staff at timeline uh, there was. We met with Coast Commission staff. We had them uh, review our original proposed conditions of approval, and they had some additions, including that last condition. <clears throat> they were very specific about what they wanted to see in the condition. So condition number four was basically something that they wanted to see. Now, we, we just chatted with them because this was such a weird coastal permit because it was proving a program and not a specific site. So we wanted to be sure that we delineated as much of how this program would operate in the coastal zone. And that's why the conditions are kind of framed the way that they are. Yeah. Yeah, I got the sense that it's, it's just important I think, public to know they were the very thick um, or that they're definitely deep. I just wanted to thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, and Council Members take it out to public comment. And let me go back. Also, have a request for extended time from like, um, well, we had seven groups. Um, and so uh, the first group that uh, we have, one is not listed on the agenda, but um, they did respond for uh, deadline on 10 5. Um, and that is in a together. So I will go ahead and begin. We had um, first group at Santa Cruz Neighbors, West Side Neighbors, Santa Cruz Cares, Santa Cruz United, Huff, ACLU, and a together. Those will be the group that will have five minutes. And um, I see hands raised. So if you are interested in commenting on this item, now is the time to raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to minute. And um, I would like uh, to ask the members of the public to speak to the merits of the permit uh, and, um, and input that. So I will go with the first hand raised. Please let me know if you are one of the groups. Casey Falls. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, thanks for taking my comment tonight. I um, I actually really appreciated the amendments that the Planning Commission made. I feel like they um, took what is, you know, essentially a fairly mean-spirited ordinance and made it a little bit nicer. I'm, Maybe I'm just taking a little bit personally as somebody who has lived in an oversized vehicle for the last years and 10 months. Um, 
I, you know, I, I've been living in an RV and I've, it's been really helpful to me at a time when rents are high to actually be able to stay in the city of, to actually save some money. And I'm, I'm literally in the process of moving as we to a house that I was able to buy because I uh, was able to save money by, by not rent living in the city. I feel like I was pretty fortunate in that I have middle class privilege and um, and therefore have middle class friends and somebody who had backyard who gave me a place to park my RV. I I I don't know what I would have done if it weren't for him. Um, friends in this town like literally are half my thing. And I just don't understand how you expect working people to be able to live here and work here. I. I teach public high school. Like I, I teach right in this. It would be nice to like afford where I live, and and I and I or afford where I work. And I a lot of people, you know, they're living in their vehicles because they're struggling like I am, or or they're struggling worse than I am. And and the OVO, like as a general rule, just makes them when they're. And I think that the amendments made by the help make it a little bit less mean-spirited and ugly and nasty, and I appreciate those amendments, and I support them, and I, I would like those. Thank you. Thank you, Coleman. Uh, the next phone number ends in 711. Oh, hi, good evening. Is this, can you hear me, uh, Mayor? Yes. Are you one of the group, or are you just? Yeah, Santa Cruz United. Okay, great. You will have um, extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Mayor Brunner and uh, the council members, Peter Cook, speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz United. Um, just so we we all remember, Santa Cruz United was spearheaded, uh, spearheaded the recall effort, and really the catalyst of this effort was Drew Glover's proposal turn Delaware into an RV park. Um, so people talk about uh, criminalizing homeless. People, so I, I hate rhetorical questions, but um, are we criminalizing uh, tenants for having sign a lease, pay rent, and abide by their rules and the city's rules? I mean, are we criminalizing homeowners by having to pay a mortgage, tax, and insurance, signing up with the county? Um, are we are we criminalizing businesses for having to get a business license, pay rent to their landlord, and sign a lease, and follow all of these different complicated rules and regulations? I mean, are, are we criminalizing tourists coming to our community for having to put money in the parking meter? And really, the answer is no. The answer is no. That everyone else that's in our community, visiting our community, living in our community, working in our community, is following rules reasonable rules set down by the city council in the state. And so, as United, we're not asking council to criminalize homeless and poverty, but we are asking that everyone that lives in our community is going to be accountable and follow basic rules and regulations. And right now what we have is double standard on standard where certain people are allowed to come into our community and not follow any of the regulations and ignore what you know, some of the basic uh, things the city has set down and and somehow it's loud. Tonight, we're already, uh, um, Council Member Calentari Johnson has told us there is available parking space in Tier 1 and Tier 2 tonight where people could go, follow the rules, free, and be accountable and, and have a safe space to park and, and, and spend the night. But people are not willing to do that. So it's very frustrating for all of us that are abiding by all the rules set down that there's certain members of the community that are just allowed to flaunt the rules and continually take advantage of our community. So I really want to thank the council for passing the original um, oversized vehicle ordinance. You know, a lot of thought and work uh, went into the ordinance passed originally. And I want to thank specifically Renee Golder, Councilmember Golder, for a seen planning commission rather perverse changes to oversized vehicle ordinance. So um, tonight you have um, five, seven people 
have yet again sent you emails asking you to pass the original ordinance you worked so hard to approve. And you have four people that have said no to that. So ratio-wise, you got 36 to 1, more than 36 to 1, people ask you as counsel to please pass the original ordinance you worked so hard for. And this small, small vocal minority trying to cause problems, asking us to get double standards for certain people breaking the rules. I think it's totally unfair. Um, Planning Commission, because you asked us to talk about their um, their changes to the ordinance, um, they're asking that uh, people that have come into our community are allowed to have free gas, free vehicular repair, not be uh, required to move if cost quote, emotional distress. So we already know what happens is you're opening up our entire community to anybody, anywhere that's got a vehicle that's not working great, needs free gas, or wants a place to sleep, come and sleep and take advantage of our community yet again with no with no accountability whatsoever. And that's totally unfair. There's a huge list of people that are here playing by the rules, living with accountability in our community, and and trying to con- contribute to our to our community. And there's a few people that are taking advantage of our community. And so I, I really ask you, you need to pass the original oversized vehicle ordinance we worked so hard for. This has a lot of important provisions in it already to make sure that we're not criminalizing homelessness or people that are poor and people and, you know, that are poor. But at the same time, you know, we have to have a responsibility for everybody. Everyone has to have fair and equitable accountability for who's here and that they are following the rules that you set down. And when you have any commission basically just expecting you and currently taking your ordinances and turning them on your head, I would ask maybe get rid of your planning commission as well. So thank you very much, Council. I appreciate your effort. Thank you for your public input. Our next uh, hand raise is phone number ending in 95. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Lynn Renshaw with Santa Cruz Together. Can I proceed? Yes, you have extra time. Thank you. So I'm Lynn Renshaw with SantaCruzTogether.com. Our mission is to encourage participation in local governance in order to improve the direction of the city. I'd like to comment on the outrage and hope here. Between the first reading, second reading, and last weekend, the council received over 1,600 emails from residents in support of common sense rules for parking RVs. Since Thursday, there were 533 in favor of enforcing, enforcing the RV ordinance passed in November and only 15 opposed. For those that didn't read 566 pages of public input, like I did, there are two themes of the letter, hope and outrage. There is outrage that the city let this problem become so bad, negatively impacting children, families, elderly, and local businesses on the west side particularly. There is outrage that our environment is getting trashed and that our water and ocean is being polluted. There is outrage when we are all subjected to increased public health risks caused by unsanitary living. There is outrage from those neighborhoods who are unsafe. The problems are obvious. 
visible and denying them is actually outrageous. There is also outrage that the planning commission tried to circumvent the rules for public transparency and notice and make the council and the ordinance unenforceable. But also in the 500 plus council letters sent, there's an outpouring of hope. People have hope that the council will hear them, understand their concerns, and act. Otherwise, why bother sending an email? There is hope that the process of public input to the city is reliable and that it works. There is hope that this particular city council is taking action and address problems. And it really is hope that we can clean up the city and make it more beautiful. 24 other coastal cities have rules for RV parks like this. They have not legal challenges. These 24 other coast cities have park rules the Coastal Commission approved. Don't let the Planning Commission undermine your work. Here are the vast majority of residents. They're outpouring of hope to make things better. Approve the Coastal and design permit. Thank you for serving on city council. It's time consuming, it's a lot. Our community appreciates you. Thank you for your input. Our next hand raise is Reggie Meiser. Hey there. Hi there. Hi, I'm. Uh, okay. Um, I think there's a really important thing to note here, um, which is that OBO is not a safe parking bill. I mean, despite what some people are trying to make us believe, it's a 3,000 word document that describes a vehicle permit program, which Kandadi and former police chief Mills were very clear was developed with the intention to enhance the city's ability to prosecute folks living in vehicles. None of the safe parking program details Mike Berry has described are codified in the OVO. There's only one subsection of OVO which talks about established parking, and it merely allows to operate and support safe parking. City staff note that uh, these pre-existing establishment, uh, sorry, city staff noted uh, pre-existing uh, safe parking sites in the OVO drafting meeting back in September before OVO was a thing. Um, and so that's just the reality. This is not about safe parking. I don't know why everyone is talking about safe parking and no one is talking about like 99% of this bill, which is actually a uh, vehicle parking permit, which is draconian and obviously intended to criminalize the gun house. Like none of this is safe parking. And none of the nice things that the city manager has come up with are written into law anywhere. Um, so he can just define them and then undefine them whenever he wants. So let's be super clear. Just because a bigoted vocal minority is able to send in a bunch of emails doesn't mean we let them codify bigotry into law. And if you insist on trying to pass it today, we're going to bring this to a more mature legislative body to deliver a truly just Thank you. Our next uh, member of the public is Serge Cagno. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Serge. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak on this issue. As someone who lives in a vehicle, works in the city, volunteers on committees for both the city and the county, issuing this permit does not let me see a late spend time with friends during late hours or stay overnight with a friend because those activities may require me to park on the street. 
As a member of the Mental Health Advisory Board, what concerns me with the permit is how the ordinance may affect those with mental health diagnoses, therefore recognized disabilities. If they are unable to function in a shelter or safe parking program due to anxiety, pulse control, outbursts, or other mental health symptoms, what happens to them? Are they then not allowed in our city and subject to citation of their homelessness and mental health diagnosis each and every night? A person may be able to take care of their basic needs, therefore not eligible for conservatorship, but not able to uphold the good neighbor policy within a program. What has not been mentioned in the discussions of the CSSO and the OVO are the hundreds of people who have been banned from our homeless services. With staff that have limited training, limited funding to pay for more experienced staff, with a common bias against challenging behavior, we have not just a homeless problem in Santa Cruz, but a homeless service programmatic design problem in Santa Cruz. To have a low barrier program, but not a zero barrier program, as the safe parking program is intended, as stated in the staff report. Safety for all participants is a significant challenge. As we can see from the bench lens, zero barrier programs are unsafe. This can also be true for low barrier programs. A female participant at the 1220 River Safe Sleep Managed Encampment, which I have worked with at other shelters previously, recently related to me a story where she was threatened by another participant who then fired a pistol in the air. It is still at the 1220 program, though as she understands it, only needed to turn in the pistol. I encourage you to follow up with the city manager's office to clarify the details. My question is, how are we ensuring the, to, that we are protecting the safety and dignity of our participants in our safe sleep, safe parking programs from dangerous criminal behavior, yet also the rights of those with mental health challenges who often find themselves kicked out of our programs? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. Next, we have phone number ending in 4844. Yeah, this is Robert again of House Homeless United. A couple of corrections. Uh, Lynn Renshaw is correct in saying that 25 coastal cities have not faced appeals and have kept their anti homeless anti-RV laws, but that's because those cities did not get their laws appealed. Now, I appealed to Santa Cruz in 2016. To my surprise, the Coastal Commission voted 11 to 1 to say, no, we will not accept this law. There is no storage facilities, and there still are no real storage facilities for the number of vehicles that are estimated to be around Santa Cruz, not to mention visitors. And secondly, there is no proof the city manager at that time could not show, and the city manager still cannot show, a real crime problem with RVs or people in their vehicles. Even though that is the bigotry and prejudice you will hear coming out of this, a lot of folks that are talking here tonight, and of course, Alan. Also, the fact that the Coastal Staff Commission locally conferred with staff to come up with this, there were questions asked, isn't that very interesting? Coastal staff previously in 2016 here approved the city's law, but the Coastal Commission said, no, they're wrong, it's a bad law, it requires a full examination, and the city has been afraid to bring it up. Now they're bringing it up, of course, with these alleged safe parking provisions, which in fact are completely inadequate. Now, I'm just going to read what I actually wrote to the zoning administrator when I, when I, when I spoke or I wrote about this. Uh, and there are all kinds of specific reasons that the design permit is inappropriate. And I, I included these. The ordinance eliminates nighttime queuing for anyone in an oversized vehicle without sufficient for parking areas generally that are adequate. It does not provide facilities for dealing with toxic runoff or any evidence oversized vehicles are more likely than other are raising problems. Number three, its existing criminal ordinance create adequate penalty safeguards to address toxic runoff. Were the city seriously interested in existing RVs problem, it have created helpful facilities long ago. Four, these are all the various concerns finding a design. 
to maintain public access to coast along the coastline, no. Clearly, the law nearly, not merely limits, but bans vehicular access post midnight five for oversized vehicles, unless they're owned by or connected to a resident or paid for by a hotel, and then only for a limited period. There is no safe parking for the majority of those who live in their vehicles in Santa Cruz even in the midst of the pandemic. And I will tell you, six safe, if they actually exist and are used, the only one, only one I've heard of that's actually used in the department, are completely inadequate for the number of vehicles. And aspirations having safe talk about tiers one, two, and three does not equal action. And when the Coastal Commission gets going to look, are there safe interactions there? Where are the crime stats showing that these homeless folks in their RVs trying to bring up a family are criminals? And you just want to move them out so you can have a better view in front of your house. Well, they're going to say no again. You'll waste everyone's time and money for this appeal. And this is the problem, of course, is going to be that now we're going to be faced with police in the city continuing to harass people in RVs regardless. Because it's been illegal to harass people in the RV zone. It's been illegal in the coastal zone. It's been illegal to uh, give people tickets on, on the base things, signs that have not coastal commission approval. And the city's signs have not. In most cases, the city does care, local coastal commission doesn't care, but it's still illegal and can be appealed. It's up to us. Those of us who care about basic justice for people who are poor have no choice but to live in their vehicles, to take action on this for ourselves. The kind of vigilante action that the police have organized with Deborah Elf, her volunteer para police, I don't want to call them Gestapo, but that's often how it feels when they're banging on your Joe Haby is banging on your vehicle at night. That is how it feels for some folks, particularly single women who are living in their vehicles. We need to do something ourselves to organize support folks who are facing this kind of homeless get out. I got more, but I'll leave. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Good evening, Council. Um, uh, speaking on behalf of myself this evening, um, uh, you no, know, the politics in this town are such that you know you feel like you need to show progress, um, maybe to your base of constituents, and move forward with this ordinance. Um, I understand that, um, but I I think, and I I've said this before that that um, you know the approach of spending police resources on um, dealing with a problem that's not, that's caused by you know, housing shortages and lack of shelter spaces is misguided. Um, I think the, uh, the safe parking programs are a good idea and um, I'd like to see the Coastal Commission approve that aspect of the parking, the, the the program, but the ordinance itself, the ban in especially in the coastal zone of oversized vehicles, um, I think brings uh, uh, not only civil rights issues but also access to coastal resources. Um, so for those reasons, I I am asking you not to move forward. I I realize, you know. Uh, have to move on with the meeting this evening and that you'll do what you're going to do, but, but I just need to say that. So have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Uh, next, have Alicia Poole. Hi, thank you. Yes, welcome. Thank you. So I speak on this um, both as myself, as someone who recently lived in an RV, and as the president of the Santa Cruz Homeless Union. So I'm concerned where all of this is going. Um, although 30 spaces for RVs is really great, this ordinance criminalizes all others. Um, unfortunately, as soon as you start enforcement, there's going to be costly litigation. Um, there have been challenges 
similar ordinances in other states. Um, and unfortunately, the cost of all that litigation could really be used on providing real services. And so it's always fortunate when that money is not used on helping the unhoused folks and marginalized folks, but it's on fighting for their rights. Um, I also want to talk about your safe parking program. The part of the reason why I don't see it being super effective is that right now people can park for three days at a time. And with gas prices being so expensive, um, your parking program is high barrier. It requires people to move every single day. And not seeing are the reasons that thirds brought up are going to be difficult for people to live there, but that is also a main reason. You know, we're talking about people who have very little money in general. And so moving every night is going to be an issue. Um, and also the capacity of your program is also an issue. We know that we have way more than 30 people living in our experiencing homelessness right now. Um, I can say for myself personally, that the only thing that helped out of homelessness here in Santa Cruz was a housing voucher and a willing landlord, not an ordinance and not the $700 of tickets that I've had, um, excuse me, pay while I've lived. Um, I also want to say that like my RV, I did not experience all the, you know, exaggerated issues that are being said, you know, people dumping sewage, um, you know, drug related. Um, I think all of those are highly, highly exaggerated. Um, I've experienced minor issues while living on the Santa Cruz in that category. In fact, the harassment um, and fear that I had from people attacking me because they hate homeless people, um, banging on my RV because they wanted us to move, even though we weren't even bothering it while being parked in their neighborhood. Um, things like that, you know. Um, Far more are our issue, I think. Um, and I think that when we're looking at this, you know, we need to really prioritize and weigh what's important for people's needs or, you know, exact Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller was for extra time, uh, John Doe, ACLU. Hello, my name is John Doe. I'm an attorney with the ACLU of Northern California. Um, I'm here to highlight the comment that we submitted asking the city to reject the associated permit as proposed by staff for um, the OSP ordinance, which effectively prohibits folks from residing there also the city. Um, we previously demanded that the ordinance be rescinded and appealed the associated coastal permit to the planning. Now, after the planning commission modified the, those permit conditions to try to mitigate some of the ordinances, um, more negative impacts on unhoused people, city staff now proposed stripping some of those protections. Staff proposal also uh, essentially allows for enforcement of the ordinance so long as there is but one single safe parking location. The city's aspirational full three-tier um, three safe parking program, which isn't codified anywhere, is yet to be fully operational. And all those plans are have barriers to entry, limit the duration of stays, and require participants to move daily, which can be cost prohibitive and even more taxing now that there are now new limits on where an OSP can park, even during the day. Um, and of course, as others have highlighted, there are no for sufficient number of safe park um, alternatives for all the house folks that um, we know exist. So basically, the staff proposal will further drive out house folks out of the city and subject, subject others to fines, arrest, because there are some misdemeanor pr provisions in there, um, harassment, and um, increase the likelihood that their homes will be towed. Um, moreover, it's pretty impractical for uh, and concerning for the city to make registering um, for a program a prerequisite to avoid enforcement um, when the city hasn't committed to make efficient um, uh, spaces available. Without that commitment, there's no incentive for folks to register for a parking program, and it's just unrealistic to expect that they would. That all being said, punishing people because they failed to register would be still pretty punitive and counterproductive. 
Um, so although we generally support providing services like accessible safe parking, not so when it's tied to criminalizing poverty or coercion. The city can set up these safe parking spots and services without these enforcement mechanisms. Now, the city contends that the ordinance, the associated permit, is all about increasing postal access. But for whom and at whose expense? Staff proposal makes clear the city's aim is to privilege those who can afford to live in fixed housing over those who can't, a population that's disproportionately black, people of color, people of disability. Staff proposal remains unlawful, still cruel, to be rejected. I'd further direct the city council to our prior appeal, which further outlines the legal deficiency in the city's policy on oversized vehicles. And in closing, um, for the sake of transparency, at, uh, we'd encourage the city to identify that authority unilaterally the permit conditions now, and how often it has taken such steps. Thank you for your comments. Uh, phone number ending in 0745. Unmute. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and City Council for reviewing this design and zone permit for the oversized vehicle. You're muted. Hi right there, you went back on mute. You unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and City Council for reviewing this design and zone permit for the oversized vehicle ordinance. My name is Deborah Elson and I've been working in neighborhoods for over 21 years. In May of 2013, a public safety task force was formed for the community to come together and understand safety concerns. Seven months later, after bi-monthly meetings in November, the task force came up with a prioritized set of recommendations. Councilwoman um, Golder was on that task force, and I attended every meeting to be involved for the neighborhood. The oversized vehicle issue was on that list of recommendations, and two years later, there was a proposed permit ordinance from the city council. It was pushed back at the Coastal Commission level in 2015 and tabled at that time. From 2015 to where we are today, we have a much worse and overburdening problem with the oversized vehicles and what they have created. Here we are this evening, years later, with a much better program, supported ordinance, and this is the third time that the council has met on this item since September. Um, when it was a new ordinance brought forth by the community. You now have accumulated over 1,500 emails from the community in support to move this ordinance forward. To address one of the opposition's comments regarding criminalization, what is in the accusation is the question of personal responsibility. People are responsible for their actions or inactions, their choice. Their actions or lack of personal responsibility don't take place in a vacuum. The main violations on these vehicles is um, the 72 hour parking in one spot, which is in our municipal code and is in most all of the 58 counties in the state of California. The other violations are vehicle code violations in the state of California, which are all, which all citizens are subject to tickets if violated. It's your responsibility to follow the laws that are written for particular reasons. There are at least 28 coastal cities that already have a permit for oversized vehicle ordinance. Since 2015, there have been 11 other cities in that the Coastal Commission has granted a permit program. And ours, this program that you are bringing forward to support this ordinance is so much more robust than any of them all put together. This ordinance is a program supported with services, basic needs, safe parking areas, and a chance to uplift people in need. Please move this forward with the original design and zone permit for the oversized vehicle ordinance. And thank you very much for all your time and dedication. Thank you for your comment. 
our next uh, let's see, our next hand raise is Santa Cruz. You also were for extra. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi there. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Broner. Um, my name is Sabina Holber, and I'm calling as a representative of Santa Cruz Cares tonight. We would like to ensure that the public is aware that despite the popular narrative provided by city staff and the moderates on the city council, the oversized vehicle ordinance does not actually produce safe parking sites. In the approximately 3,000 word document, only about 60 words or 2% of the document is devoted to the supposed establishment of safe parking sites. 10.40.120M simply states that the city may operate, sponsor, or authorize safe parking programs. But this is something the city was already allowed to do and something they themselves admit they were already doing. In the first OVO drafting meeting on September 21st, 2021, city staff stated that the city currently has approximately 15 known safe parking spaces managed by the Association of Faith Communities, AFC, including approximately 13 on religious assembly sites and two on city-owned properties. AFC also has an additional 21 spaces outside of the city limit. The city also allows businesses to host safe parking spaces. If OVO is repealed in its entirety, we can still move forward with investments in safe parking voted on separately via the Homeless Response Action Plan. From this, it's clear to see that the OVO is not about balancing services with punishment, it's just about punishment, and specifically punishment against the poorest residents of our community. Though city council may argue that a coastal design permit is necessary to ensure safe parking programs are allowed to exist in the coastal zone, this argument has no bearing in reality as staff and council have made it abundantly clear that they don't want parking sites in the city limit, much less in the coastal zone. We must also note that, although the conditions of permits issued by the Planning Commission did a more earnest job trying to combat the harm that this criminalizing ordinance will cause, even with these conditions, OVO would still lead to an increase in ticketing, towing, and thus unsheltered homelessness in our community. Even taken with the best of intentions, tying the provision of services to criminalizing measures is not created. It is a long failed policy tactic. Experts are in broad agreement that criminalization of homeless people does nothing to actually combat homelessness and, in fact, makes it worse. Repeatedly ticketing and towing people's homes only leaves them on the street. We saw this take place last December when the city towed an RV of a family, including a child, and the only option given to them was to move to the Benchlands, which was experiencing flooding at that time. Former Chief of Police Andy Mills and City Attorney Tony Condotti admitted in plain language at previous council meetings that this ordinance was designed to create a more efficient way for the city to be able to prosecute people living in their oversized vehicles. Council Member Renee Golder's admission in her appeal letter stating that she is concerned that the addition of the evidence-based guidelines and services for safe parking programs would have a, quote, impact on the ordinance in accomplishing its purpose, end quote, further underscores that the primary goal is not to help people, but to penalize and try to banish them from our city. If the so-called moderate follows, if the so-called moderate follows staff recommendations and remove the humane conditions granted by the planning commission permit, it will be clearer than ever that every time council members said, action is compassion or perfect is the enemy of the good, we must act now, they were completely disingenuous. We ask that you reject OVO as bad policy and move forward with actually helping people, including providing safe parking and services without this direct threat of criminalization. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next uh, member of the public has a phone number ending in 0249. Good evening, Mayor Bruner and City Council. This is Carol Paul Hamas. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Westside Neighbors. Westside Neighbors is a large neighborhood organization established in 2019 in response to one city council proposal to allow overnight RV park on Delaware Avenue. The Lower West Side has been significantly negatively 
impacted for years by issues related to people camping in their vehicles, particularly on Swanton, Delaware, Fair, Schaefer, Mission, Grand Butte, Ingalls, Swift, McPherson, and Garfield Park, as well as the side West Cliff Drive. Neighborhoods and businesses have been impacted daily by dumping, gray water and black water discharge, fires, garbage, environmental degradation, criminal behavior, including drug dealing, theft, guns, weapons, domestic violence, all well documented by previous city staff reports. We would like to express our appreciation for the significant work that the city staff and the ad hoc committee council members have done to create the oversized vehicle ordinance to develop a safe parking program. However, the Planning Commission's March 3rd changes to the conditions of approval for the OVO undermined those months of work when one member of the Planning Commission made drastic changes to the conditions of approval without public comment allowed that basically made the ordinance unenforceable. Enforcement is essential to ensure that those living in their vehicles out of necessity can move to a sanctioned place where they receive needed services and support and that those on vacation or camping by choice in our neighborhoods are told that this is not permitted. At the same time, enforcement will mitigate the negative impact on the environment, city neighborhoods and businesses that unsanctioned state. Community support is critical to ensure that financial support for homelessness services happens. Activists demand services like free gas, free mechanics delivered anywhere. They want people to be able to park wherever and whenever and for however long they want to without any rules at all, with no registration, with no accountability. But the community will not support services with no accountability. Community support will only be established if neighborhood and environmental protections are upheld alongside services that are provided on city and county property. The county must be an active participant. Removing the county from the equation is a huge mistake. There are those who state that enforcing any rules is criminalization, but all that anyone needs to do to avoid a ticket, follow the rules that everyone else in this stuff. Don't park under no overnight parking sign. Move every 72 hours. We all have to follow rules. City residents and business owners are tired of the current double standards. Overnight RV parking impacts are also created by vacationing visitors who are taking advantage of the situation as the Lower West Side is advertised on many free, many camping apps as a free overnight parking zone. Neighborhood city streets should not be used as unregulated free RV camping. People on vacation need to use state and private recreational overnight parking in residential areas need to stop. West Side neighbors supports the expanded safe sleeping program is outlined in the OVO and currently being under development by the city and county with county involvement. Significant previous public input and current comment has been received and counted. Substantial enough in volume to feel confident that the OVO is the direction most people in the city want to see. For this meeting alone, over 500 emails were received and well over 90% were in favor of passing the original ordinance with the original conditions of approval. The residents and businesses of the Lower West Side have been waiting since 2013 for an ordinance to pass. In that time, 24 other coastal communities have passed our ordinances that have been approved by the coastal that are still in force. The time is long overdue to move forward by both enforcing reasonable regulations and creating safe spaces and services for people living in their vehicles. Please reject the Planning Commission changes. Please support the extensive work done by city staff we ask you to, to pass the original conditions of approval and the OPO. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next member of the public is phone number ending in 1705. Hi there. Hi, hear me? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I want to thank council, especially the ad hoc committee, staff, citizens who work so hard on WO and putting so much thought into it. I know it's been a difficult slog. Thank you. And you can clearly see where the community stands on this. Um, but I want to 
spend a minute talking about process. Uh, census the approval that were modified at this is really a sex talk. I know that sounds really dark, but we don't elect any commission. We elect council members as our, our city legislature. And you guys voted five to implement this. And what, what planning commission did, they're an advisory body. They do not have the authority to undermine decisions that council made. Even if they don't like them, that's not their role. And, you know, the commission hearings aren't usually that well attended. Maybe they thought they could buy, but I know different he was the one who made those amendments. He's a very person. He knew what he was. This wasn't just some like random thing where he thought he could, like make the make the ordinance a little better. It was a deliberate attempt to undermine the authority of this body. Uh, me, that is more serious than the substance of this. So I certainly support um, the OVO and the that staff is. Um, brought forward, but I, I really think council needs to look at what happened at the planning commission, why it happened, take correct action, which could include removing the commission. This isn't just this isn't some mistake. This was a deliberate attempt to undermine both the authority of the council and then also you know the voters because they don't like that they have the authority laterally change an ordinance that council passed, which is the effect. I know that maybe not that's not technically what happened, but that was the effect because the conditions are so onerous that they would render Jovio completely um, unenforceable. As even one OVO opponent, Kevin Chris, said in his letter to me. So I would turn what if the U attorney said on its head, where he asked what authority you as council have to Unilateral that was language changed the conditions. No, that's backwards. What authority did the planning commission have? And I, I would like to make that part of your discussion. That's a very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your input. Our next uh, hand raised is Rachel Chavez. Hi, welcome. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, it's interesting to see how Colin Terry Johnson and Golder, who have been quite dedicated to the phrases, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, and action is compassion, um, how they have spun adding best practices for safe parking sites and increased services as tampering the implementation of services. Um, you all have been expert at gaslighting and deflection. Anytime people have asked you to slow down and engage in critical thought and research about the policies you enact, yet now you want to stop and think through the unintended consequences of a policy. Uh, once more services that are actually in line with evidence-based programs were added to the conditions of enforcement. At least be honest with yourselves that this is not about com compassion. Admit, as Andy Mills and Tony Condotti already did in a September council meeting, that this ordinance was created specifically to make it easier for the city to prosecute and cop the ticket so and move along people who live in their oversized vehicles. Despite how you've tried to convince us that parking tickets are not a big deal, we know that they lead to increase in fines, toes, imprisonment, and unsheltered homelessness, the textbook definition of criminalization. If you all would read any actual research about homelessness policy, you would know that tying service criminalization is antithetical to an effective, let alone compassionate, response to homelessness. Um, lastly, Golder mentioned that she was part of the safety task force that worked on OVO in 2013. I wanted to remind everybody that that task force, um, their main rec recommendation or their number one recommendation and how also tied into their creation of OVO was centered around a concept called crime prevention through environmental design. Um, this is a theory that is known to be racist, it has long been debunked, um, just like the also racist and debunked broken windows theory that crime prevention through environmental design was something to think about when you guys are voting. That's all. Thank you, Rachel. Our next uh, 
hand raised is phone number ending in 7572. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is, hi, my name is Lacey I've actually, I, I've never called in to the before, but as a resident of Delaware Avenue, I felt um, compelled to do so tonight, just listening to the comments section of tonight's meeting. Um, I just want to address the, what seems to be a bit of hypocrisy between um, the, the people sort of against the OVO versus for. So Serge Congo, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Cogno, um, and Sabina Holker both uh, address parking without direct threat, Sabina Holker's words, um, and Serge told a, a, a relate a story of a woman confronted by a man carrying a firearm um, and wondered if that was really a safe park. And so I guess I'm wondering why they are under the assumption that these safe parking spaces should not be patrolled or that houseless community members shouldn't be prosecuted if they are in fact criminals. I think that, that the city has shown that they are for safe parking without a direct threat and provided safe spaces. But then, you know, I think that they also, on the flip side of that, have an issue with the criminalization of houseless members of that, that people who live here. But when they are criminals, there needs to be some trust. And so, you know, recently my daughter, who is fifth grade was riding her bike home to Bayview Elementary and a houseless person stopped her, grabbed her bike and forced her off um, and, and brought, you know, robbed her from her bike. And she was found in the bench, which is not super surprising to anyone. So I think that there are certain who do need help. And I think that this takes away from the ability of focus their energy on helping the houseless people who, you know, are will then go on to buy a house, who though will go on um, rather than simply living in 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 the space where they think that they can take advantage of the community that they're in. Um, that's all. Thank you. Uh, the next caller is the name I am watching you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know everything, so I can only tell you what I have observed. There are RVs that have been here seemingly forever, four to five years even, and talking to these people, they have no intention of doing anything different ever. No plan, none. They're adamantly unapologetic about it. I would add a bit of practical mentoring here that everyone can benefit from. If you want your life to resemble what you want it to be, assuming you have done the work to consider what you want it to be, you have to do something every day, every day, with responsibility, with discipline, to work, actually work, to make it more so that way, assuming you have considered that plan on what you want your life to be. After some amount of time with any luck, yes, luck is better since you don't control everything, your life will resemble what you want it to be. But I would say many of the RV homeless and other homeless don't understand or agree with this quite solid mentoring. Perhaps they never had such, they have no life plans, they have no goals, but are they okay with living off society, off charity, not playing by the rules, blaming others, self-medicating, panhandling, or stealing off others, having dreams of entitlements and rights that don't exist, and I have news for them. Their life will probably not turn out to be what it could have been had they followed my simple mentoring advice. Yes, pass the original ordinance for the betterment of the many with life plans and distance to all others follow my mentoring advice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next hand raised, Zira Phillips. 
Hi there. Yes. Lovely, thank you. Um, speaking for myself tonight, you've received a lot of written and oral comments from the community with concerns of environmental damage, public safety, and a general concern of complaining by the groups. First, I want to say that these concerns are absolutely valid. But I think it's also important to point out that all of those specific concerns relate to things that are already illegal without issuing new laws or new ordinances. The city could enforce the laws associated with each of them. For instance, with respect to RVs leaking or dumping sewage, we have California Health and Safety Code 1887.4. And there's lots of laws around all of the other um, issues that have been brought forward. But since we're discussing the details of OVO's implementation and design permit, the conditions of approval adopted by the Planning Commission are a reasonable compromise that would move the OVO toward the success of its stated goals. Without them, the OVO would serve more as a criminal criminalization ordinance for those relying on large vehicles for their only secure shelter and does not serve as a mitigation or support ordinance. To my understanding, the conditions of approval put forward by the Planning Commission are based on common best practices for ordinance of this type in other cities in which these programs actually work. If the OVO is to move forward, it should only do so with these sorts of research conditions and best practices they contain. Without them, the OVO fundamentally makes it harder for folks to survive in their vehicles, a burden that would encourage them to leave the city or have their vehicles towed, putting more houseless neighbors out onto the streets or parks of Santa Cruz without safe or controllable shelter. Overall, it would be more equitable solution, provide the safe parking program as a resource, provide the services discussed, and also enforce existing laws without criminalizing those who are abiding by all of the current laws, but who rely on their large vehicles for shelter, or who may want to access the post during the night hours, the way folks in regular sized vehicles can also access them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Looks like that concludes our comment item. The, um, so I will bring it back to council and um, based on the previous uh, methods of uh, time management, uh, I would like to ask council member who presented this item to council um, to have a motion made and explain the motion and recommend it. I do. Thank you, um, Mayor. You know, I, I don't remember which uh, of the callers brought this up, but it something somebody said rang to me and it was uh, that all members of Santa Cruz are, you know, all residents of Santa Cruz are treated the same. And it's interesting because it was today when I was at jury duty when I'm, I was on the jury and the judge ordered us to take everyone's testimony the same, no matter if they're wearing a uniform or what they were, what they looked like, right? It was before they called the witnesses to testify. And I, and I think it absolutely applies here too, because I heard more than one person say they felt like there was, uh, you know, kind of two tiers of justice um, in some ways in Santa Cruz. And so with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the recommendation for the resolution of the city council um, of Santa Cruz, acknowledging the environmental nation and approve the coastal design permit based findings listed in the draft resolutions and the Okay, so we have motion uh, by Council Member Holder for the recommended staff um, conditions of their, uh, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I'll second. And for 
uh, deliberation, discussion on the motion that's for us. Um, uh, Council Member Brown. Mayor, and thank you to members of the community who called in and spoke up. Um, I um, I understand the concern expressed by about the impact of size vehicles in neighborhoods. Uh, you know, the range of, of problems that can come along with that. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't want to discount those. However, uh, I I believe, and I've said this before, and I'm going to keep it short, case that um, have laws on the book that that address those problems. Um, dumping of environmental uh, waste. Example. Um, what we don't have is a place for to dump their waste. Not, we don't seem to be making much progress on that. Um, and the the very idea of it something that might be a condition uh, for approval seems anathema. Uh, some of the members spoke up today, and some of my colleagues. Um, it's disappointing. Uh, the conditions of approval that the planning put together um, was not undemocratic. These are appointed members of, uh, you know, an advisory body, just like all of the others. Just when when you don't like what their recommendations are, that doesn't um, that they don't serve to have a position, to make recommendations, liberate as per their own policy. Um, so, you know, I offer with commissioners doesn't make me believe that they don't serve serve on those commissions. Um, and so I just that I, I just had to make a comment about that. But I want to talk about the conditions of approval. Um, the planning commission, you know, I believe um, incorporated best practices to guide of a program that this council has said it wants to act. Um, and to ensure that it doesn't conflict with existing law and policy like the Coastal Act, um, the general plan, and I would argue health policy as well, um, based on my interest in health policy. Um, and they looked at uh, several uh, lengthy studies conducted uh, by the State of California's Homeless Emergency Program, for example, University uh, of Southern California School of Public Policy, looked at many, many safe parking programs and have developed a set of best practices. And those were the basis for um, for a council that uh, suggests want data-driven, evidence-based uh, materials on which decisions. This is about as good as it gets. Data existing analysis coming from um, uh, multi-stakeholder process, and two of them that I'm aware of. Um, so, you know, localities across California are um, trying to improve their responses to homelessness, and I would, I, I still believe that we are one of those. Um, and there are models that we can look to, and we're not looking at them. And so these conditions of approval were intended to cause us nothing in the in those conditions prevent um, this ordinance from uh, being implemented, um, and nothing in this ordinance necessary to achieve the goals that we have for ameliorating, mitigating the impact of oversized vehicles. That services that through programming can do enforcement. Um, so, safe park programs are, according to the studies that I'm looking at, and I, I think they're coming from trustworthy sources based on looking at actual programs in California, that they're relatively inexpensive, easily scalable, um, and they can often leverage. But uh, we have thus far 
um, kind of dipped a toe in the water around that sounds like maybe have nine spaces and somebody could, I, I would like to know, I'm going to my comments, but I would like to know where those are. I can't call if that's ever been, uh, that in provided to us, but um, I've heard from my colleagues that they exist. Um, so <clears throat> these safe parking programs have some pretty elements of best practice that I think are really important. One, low barrier to parking. San Diego is a good model. Um, they're doing it. They only have two requirements. Work as a partner with case managers and be, not be a registered sex offender. Those are, are pretty clear conditions. We could impose like that if we were actually doing a safe parking but that is not what the oversized vehicle ordinance is. Um, including harm reduction models for those with mental health substance programs. Um, so they can maintain access to those programs and maintain the safety and health of within that program and um, surrounding areas. Access to additional services. Um, I mean, the safe parking that we have, I don't even know. Um, there's nothing, there's no conditions about what might be provided. So it's hard to understand how the challenges with sanitation, uh, waste management, um, some of the other things will address a parking program without knowing, without those, I don't see them. Um, and these services can be funded through a variety of means and the AFC has, good, you know, has stepped up and said they're willing to be a partner. Last I heard in my conversation, multiple representatives of AFC, um, they they don't feel that they have been um, fully included in the conversation, and so, um, you know, it, I think that's a bigger barrier to a safe parking program. <laughs> Not talking to people who um, could could potentially provide management of such a program um, for a relatively low cost. That's like a bigger barrier than creating a that we have a program. Council has said we're doing this. Have a safe parking program. The community is saying um, that you know trying to create a safe parking program and some conditions around it is preventing us from doing this ordinance, which they claim is a safe parking program. So I'm just feeling like there's you know, there's there's something you know missing there. There's just a, like a you know, a, a, a a leap in the logic that and I and I just don't understand. Um, how that um, could be the conclusion. I'm not going to ask you to explain that because I've asked before. I'm not really or I've just responses suggesting that I just want, I don't want, um, that is not the case at all. I totally support recommendations of the Planning Commission. And um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to uh, motion on the floor. Um, I believe the planning did what the council asked. Um, if if what you were asking on the on the face of it is actually what you were asking, um, I'm not so sure at this. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, I'm going to go ahead to uh, Council Member Commentary John. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who called in tonight and who wrote letters and who's been engaged over the months and years on this issue. Um, this isn't a black and white. This is a very challenging issue and this is one piece of it. Um, I have to say I don't appreciate the tone and accusations that uh, what we're trying to do is ingenuous and that we don't actually want to be standing up a safe parking program and that we only want to penalize. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have spent many evenings and many hours talking to community members and meeting with members of AFC and having monthly meetings to develop a framework, um, not in a vacuum, as the plan some planning commissioners did, um, but in a process that does take in best practices. Um, so I'm not sure who my colleagues are talking to, but we have the meeting with service providers, including members of AFC. 
to build this framework. Uh, the staff agenda report outlines the impacts of planning commission essentially making it impossible or very difficult to implement the framework. Um, I wanna move forward with solutions. I wanna get things done. We have spaces available. Let's get folks into those spaces and, and like help people out. I mean, it, in a very short amount of time, we have stood up first tier and a pilot of the second tier. So let's take advantage of that. Like if we're really about helping folks out, then let's not put in all these conditions that make it very difficult, nearly impossible for us to implement something that we've been working on. Um, I'm gonna keep doing the work. This is an issue that's very important to me. I've worked on this issue for decades from many different angles. So, you know, people can make assumptions or make accusations. I'm gonna keep doing the work. Thank you, Council Member Cohen Hillary Johnson. Vice Mayor Watson. Thank you, Mayor. And um, yeah, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> I've been working with you on this issue and a lot of issues for many decades as well. And I'm here to do the work with you alongside you and alongside our community. And I appreciate your comment. Um, I guess I kind of go back to my public policy training. And one of the things that we were trained to do when I was studying public policy is to really analyze the policies, the, analyze the problem, think about the policy solutions, and then um, dive into what pragmatic and potentially achievable, right? And so um, one policy solution is to do nothing. And that's, I think, the true, uh, to do nothing or to over condition something is a policy option. And that's what we've had in place. And that's been the policy option we've um, by default done. And I, I don't blame why it's hard and it's, and it's tricky and we don't fully know everything. So we do the best we can with the information that we have within the circumstances that we're existing in. And the other policy option is to do something moderate that will move the needle, given the resources and circumstances and political readiness, community readiness, and all the different assessments and feasibility criteria you would assess it under. And then the third policy option is to do something more extreme. And there is circumstances where more extreme can actually be applied but they're very rare in general, and that you don't have endless money, endless space, endless options. And often at that point, it's sort of at the same decision point of nothing or extreme. And so for me, I feel like we are in government and we're working in public policy, which we are all, all are, then we're doing the best we can to move within the guardrails in which we are existing, right? And that is, I think, where we've landed in this policy and so as much as I know that it's imperfect and that we are limited in our resources and that easy to point fingers or to overgeneralize a person or a council in a certain way, at the end of the day, we're doing the best we can within the realm in which we have available to us. And we're trying to move the needle as best we can to support good policy for those who are most vulnerable in our community and our community at large. And so I, I just, I say that because I think sometimes get, and I, I do too, right? I'm not saying we universally, I think we all do as everybody. Um, we get caught up in these really oversimplification and generalizations around people and policies when I think at the end of the day, truly every single one of us is doing the best we can to try to do and move good policy that's gonna be solutions oriented and will likely be imperfect and hopefully iterative and we're going to learn and we're going to grow. Um, so I say that all to one just sort of reiterate my my votes prior in that I want to see us move forward. I want to see us try something. I want to see us learn and I want to see us continue to try something. I I and and, and so I'll, I'll end my comments there. I do have comments later in regards to the meeting. I think 
I think it's been disrespectful to be quite honest to you, Mayor, and what you proposed to us, which is to essentially ask that we, um, one, ask our questions in advance, and two, respect each other's voices. And I want to see us move forward in that way. And I am committed to those meeting, this, the meetings like this, but to not have any break or any dinner break and to now hours delayed, I think is really not only a disservice to what we're trying to do here as a council and policy, but also to the community in which we hold that we're trying to adhere to these different timelines. So I, 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 I know that you, you really presented at the very beginning of our meeting a, an attempt to try to um, just support uh, equity of voice here and to try to support our ability to move policy. And so I don't know how best to support you, but I don't feel like that's what actually really ensued. And so I, I just, I make that statement in that that's my observation in which our meeting occurred this evening. And um, I hope we can continue to do our best to really be able to have all of the agenda items being able to move forward because now we've had multiple items that have been delayed, delayed, delayed. And frankly, we're not able to do our full city business as a result. So, um, you know, I, and that's our job. So, I mean, I'll, I'll leave my comments there. I'm supportive of the motion and happy to move forward. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watson. Council member coming. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I do want to start by reiterating that someone brought up that the city has located in the city. There have been safe sleeping, safe parking sites many years. This isn't the first time we've had safe sleeping in the city. Um, the city is now taking on the responsibility of running these programs. Um, it sounds like, although from what it also sounds like from these conversations that we've had, we're actually going to be working with service providers, so it doesn't seem like there's anything new aside from uh, potentially the city fronting some money for the program. But we have had safe sleep um, for RVs and cars in the city of Santa Cruz for many years. And so I want to recognize um, AFC and the people who have provided sites, the city for providing some of those sites, and the city staff who work on these safe parking programs for the many years listed. There haven't been many, um, but we have, but you know, the notion that we just have our first three parking spots, not true. Um, I've opposed the uh, OVO originally, and you know, primarily because it imposes overreach and restrictions. Well, I should say, not only does it impact homelessness, but it imposes overreach restrictions and regulations as a result of a problem specific area of our I completely understand and I'm sympathetic that there are impacts on the Lower West Side. I've worked at the Marine Lab from 2015 to 2020, uh, was parking over there every single day, so I'm acutely aware of the RV issues on the West Side, which is why, as policymakers, it's important that we're focusing on the problem and the, Im the specific, specific problems and the impacts in the areas where they're occurring, not Analyzing the presence of just having a vehicle over 20 feet throughout the entire city. One of the major issues I've had with the ordinance is not just that it generalizes and criminalizes all people living in RVs, but it criminalizes anyone who owns an RV or a vehicle over 20 feet, even when they don't impact residents. One of the callers pointed out that you know, when there are illegal behaviors, that we should be um, forcing those illegal behaviors. I completely agree. Um, but what this does is that for just simply owning a vehicle of a certain size, you are now considered a criminal. And I want to point out a couple of examples. Um, I lived in the beach flats. My neighbors had an RV, and they would park it on the street. No one had a problem with it. But now that's illegal. I was also contacted by a family on the east side that doesn't have a driveway. And as a result of this ordinance, it's now illegal them to park their vehicles that they use for their businesses on the streets because the vehicles are over. We as a community need to identify problems with civic solutions to those problems rather than creating broad sweep regulations that unintended consequences. What we're likely going to see when this is ordinance is the OVO has been passed, adopted by the council. So um, 
I don't think we need to really go into that any further, but I want to focus on um, conditions of letter of course today. Um, I want to point out that the reason why this went to the planning commission was because people have a right to appeal. Uh, this is part of our democratic process, whether some of us agree with it or not. Uh, the ability to appeal, to appeal is also how this before us today. One of the council members wanted to appeal uh, the decision of the, the planning commission to the city council. So, you know, I just want to highlight the part of our democracy and appealing a decision by an elected body or an elected body when possible is not an undemocratic process. The intent of the conditions of approval as stated in the public hearing was to ensure the most effective safe parking program possible. And conditions of approval incorporated best management practices to guide the implementation of the program to ensure it does not conflict with existing law and policies of the Coastal Act, General Plan, and health law policy. Councilmember Brown mentioned there are numerous studies that discuss best practices. I'm not going to repeat the points she mentioned, but the Planning Commission did what the council asked, or actually what the appellants asked. It issued the requirement, the required permits to implement a safe and a, an effective safe parking program that our council voted. The conditions of approval provide best management practices for the program to ensure effectiveness and alignment with laws and policies, the role of the Planning this was a public process that was the result of an appeal, postal permit, design permit to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission did its job to try to hear the concerns of the appellant, provide conditions of approval to address the concerns brought forward by the community. So I want to thank the members of the Planning Commission for attempting to address some of the legal issues that came up and the input that they provided on uh, conditions of approval. Um, I support the recommendations brought forward by the Planning Commission, but given that there are concerns related to being appealed again to the Coastal Commission and uh, concerns about us being sued, I'm going to make an amendment motion on the floor to see if we can um, move forward in a way that might reduce the probability of this appealed yet again lawsuit. So um, I sent a number of points to the staff, to Bonnie. Um, these are related to uh, conditions of approval. I think the last bullet point um, touches on the uh, ordinance as well, but bullets the amendment would be um, safe parking sites will not be cited in map high impact areas with the coastal zone. I added the priority for locating safe parking spaces within the city of Santa Cruz. One of the major concerns is that if people are forced out in areas that are far away from resources, uh, that it can make it difficult for um, it went from safe sleeping sites and have access to some of those services. Two, there will be no cost to participants in the safe parking program. Added access to the safe parking program uh, shall not be unreasonably restricted. However, the city may institute mandatory signups in the tracking program. Participants shall agree to a reasonable code of conduct. Then the third item is that related to emergency parking, that emergency parking may be allowed. 48 consecutive hours, an oversized vehicle is left standing on the roadside because of mechanical breakdown, the driver's physical capacity. This just being that, you know, if somebody gets into a difficult situation, that we will try to work with them, try to um, help them either with their vehicle moving again or if they're in their personally in a dire street that won't just tow their vehicle to try to figure out a way to get them the I will leave my, the rest of my comments there for now. See if there might be desire to move forward. Okay, so thank you, Council Member Cumming. Uh, have an amendment to motion. And um, the two hands raised as well. Okay, so Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I just want to clarify that I did not state 
have programs. Um, I stated that that it's the first time in the history of our city that the city council is committing to this. I acknowledge that we've had faith-based people AFC doing this hard work in our community. And it's the first time that our city council is committing to supporting these efforts, infrastructure and research. Um, the previous council majority was not able to move any solutions forward on this issue. That's fact. I'm interested in moving forward with solutions and um, I'm interested in the vote on the original. Okay, uh, council member Brown. So I was going to, for the sake of expedience, uh, recommend or ask Council Member Cummings if you'd like to make that amendment as a non-friendly amendment, so I will second. That's and I will amendment. then call the question, for the sake of expedience, there's no need to continue this. Um, let's just take a vote. Okay. So uh, we can vote on calling the question unless, you no, know, because I, I, just, I, I just don't think there's any percentage in continuing the debate. Um, who is saying the that, that most accurate motion. statement here? That'd be a second to the non friendly amendment and a motion to call the question as well. So I'll second that. Let's take the vote. Okay, so second. Maybe we don't need to, but I just want to move us along here. So Council Member Brown called the question, and Vice Mayor Walker seconds that. So let's take a roll call vote on uh, whether to call the question. For Cohen Tory Aye. 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 Brown. Aye. Myers. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Aye. That, that motion to call the question passes unanimously. So now we have a amendment to the motion uh, that Council Member Cummings added, uh, seconded by Council Member Brown. And uh, there are a roll call vote for that. Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Sir? No. Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Vice Mayor Watkins? No. No. That motion passes five in favor to down. Failed. Wait. Sorry, motion failed. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, five against, two in favor. And now we have the original motion on the floor. That was a motion uh, by Council Member Holder, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. And we'll roll call vote on that motion. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming? No, and for the record, um, you know, until we're going to be able to make, the, until we find consensus on some of these controversial issues, then we're going to just continue to find ourselves, things get appealed, legal battles. So I um, want the community to understand that they're going to be dragged out for much longer than they anticipated. Brown? No. Aye. 
Mayor Washington? Aye. Aye. That motion passes five in favor, two against. Okay. Uh, let me go back to the agenda. I believe that concludes uh, our meeting for today. We will be back here next week, next Tuesday, April 19th, for a special meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, meeting is now adjourned.